Founding Brothers, Disc 7. What could Jefferson's extreme reaction possibly mean? After all, from our modern perspective, Washington's executive leadership throughout the debate over Jay's treaty was nothing less than we would expect from a strong president, whose authority to shape foreign policy is taken for granted. We also know the course he was attempting to steer, a middle passage between England and France that required tacking back and forth to preserve American neutrality and avoid war, turned out to be the correct policy. But in this instance, hindsight doesn't make us clairvoyant so much as blind to the ghosts and goblins that floated above the political landscape in the 1790s. What we might describe as admirably strong executive leadership struck Jefferson and his Republican followers as the arbitrary maneuverings of a monarch. And what appears in retrospect like a prudent and far-sighted vision of the national interest looked to Jefferson like a betrayal of the American Revolution. For Jefferson also had a national vision and a firm conviction about where American history was headed, or at least where it ought to be headed. The future he felt in his bones told him that the true spirit of 76, most eloquently expressed in the language he had drafted for the Declaration of Independence, was a radical break with the past and with all previous versions of political authority. Like Voltaire, Jefferson longed for the day when the last king would be strangled with the entrails of the last priest. The political landscape he saw in his mind's eye was littered with the dead bodies of despots and corrupt courtiers. A horizon swept clean of all institutions capable of coercing American citizens from pursuing their happiness as they saw fit. Thomas Paine's The Rights of Man, 1791, captured the essence of his vision more fully than any other book of the age, depicting as it did a radical transformation of society once the last vestiges of feudalism were destroyed, and the emergence of a utopian world in which the essential discipline of government was internalized within the citizenry. The only legitimate form of government in the end was self-government. Shortly after his return to the United States in 1790, Jefferson began to harbor the foreboding sense that the American Revolution, as he understood it, had been captured by alien forces. As we have seen, the chief villain and core counter-revolutionary character in the Jeffersonian drama was Alexander Hamilton. And the most worrisome feature on the political landscape was Hamilton's financial scheme with its presumption of a consolidated federal government possessing many of the powers over the states that Parliament had exercised over the colonies. Under Hamilton's diabolical leadership, the United States seemed to be recreating the very political and economic institutions. The National Bank became the most visible symbol of the accumulating corruption that the revolution had been designed to destroy. Jefferson developed a full-blooded conspiracy theory, in which bankers, speculators, federal office holders, and a small but powerful congregation of closet Tories permanently alienated from the agrarian majority, they all live in cities, he wrote, had captured the meaning of the revolution and were now proceeding to strangle it to death behind the closed doors of investment houses and within the faraway corridors of the Federalist government in New York and Philadelphia. Exactly where Washington fit in this horrific picture is difficult to determine. After all, he presumably knew something about the meaning and purpose of the revolution, having done more than any man to assure its success. As Jefferson's critics were quick to observe, the man ensconced at Monticello had never fired a shot in anger throughout the war. Initially, Jefferson simply refused to assign Washington any culpability for the Federalist conspiracy somehow suggesting that the person at the very center of the government was wholly oblivious to the schemes swirling around him. At some unspoken level of understanding, Jefferson recognized that Washington was the American untouchable, and that any effort to include him in the indictment immediately placed his entire case against the Federalists on the permanent defensive. Jefferson's posture toward Washington shifted perceptibly in 1794. 
The catalyst for the change was the Whiskey Rebellion, a popular insurgency in four counties of western Pennsylvania protesting an excise tax on whiskey. Washington viewed the uprising as a direct threat to the authority of the federal government and called out the militia, a massive 13,000-man army, to squelch the uprising. Jefferson regarded the entire affair as a shameful repetition of the Shays' Rebellion fiasco nearly a decade earlier, in which a healthy and essentially harmless expression of popular discontent by American farmers, so he thought, had prompted an excessive and unnecessary military response. While his first instinct was to blame Hamilton for the whole sorry mess, Washington's speech justifying the action could not be so easily dismissed. Jefferson denounced Washington's speech as shreds of stuff from Aesop's fables and Tom Thumb. In Jefferson's new version of the Federalist conspiracy, Washington was an unknowing and somewhat pathetic accomplice, like an overaged captain in his cabin who was sound asleep while a rogue of a pilot, presumably Hamilton, has run them into an enemy's port. Washington was certainly the grand old man of the American Revolution, but his grandeur had now been eclipsed by his age, providing the Hamiltonians with the sanction of a name which has done too much good not to be sufficient to cover harm also. Washington simply did not have control of the government and was inadvertently lending credibility to the treacheries being hatched all around him. Washington, in effect, was senile. While hardly true, this explanation had the demonstrable advantage of permitting Jefferson's vision of a Federalist conspiracy to congeal in a plausible pattern that formed around Washington without touching him directly. Jefferson was also careful never to utter any of his criticisms of Washington in public. But in his private correspondence with trusted Republicans, he developed the image of an old soldier past his prime, reading speeches he did not write and could not comprehend, lingering precariously in the misty edges of incompetence, a hollow hulk of his former greatness. The most famous letter in this mode, famous because it eventually found its way into the newspapers against Jefferson's will, was prompted by the passage of Jay's treaty. "'It would give you a fever,' Jefferson wrote to his Italian friend, Philip Mazzei, "'were I to name to you the apostates who have gone over to these heresies, men who were Samson's in the field and Solomon's in the council, but who have had their heads shorn by the harlot of England.'" Since there was only one person who could possibly merit the mantle of America's Samson and Solomon, Jefferson's customary sense of discretion allowed him to make his point without mentioning the name. But everybody knew. One final and all-important piece of the Jeffersonian vision transcended the troubling particularities of domestic politics altogether. As Jefferson saw it, the American Revolution had been merely the opening shot in a global struggle against tyranny that was destined to sweep over the world. This ball of liberty, I believe most piously, he predicted, is now so well in motion that it will roll around the globe. Whereas Washington regarded the national interest as a discrete product of political and economic circumstances shaping the policies of each nation-state at a specific moment in history, Jefferson envisioned a much larger global pattern of ideological conflict, in which all nations were aligned for or against the principles that America had announced to the world in 1776. The same moralistic dichotomy that Jefferson saw inside the United States between discernible heroes and villains, he also projected into the international arena. For Jefferson, all specific decisions about American foreign policy occurred within the context of this overarching, indeed almost cosmic, pattern. Therefore, while Jefferson could talk with genuine conviction about American neutrality and the need to remain free of European entanglements, thereby sounding much like Washington, his version of American neutrality was decidedly different. He did not view the clash between England and France for supremacy in Europe as a distant struggle far removed from America's long-term national interest. Instead, he saw the French Revolution as the European continuation of the spirit of 76. He acknowledged that the random violence and careening course of the French Revolution were lamentable developments, 
but he insisted they were merely a passing chapter in the larger story of triumphant global revolution. I am convinced they, the French, will triumph completely, he wrote in 1794, and the consequent disgrace of the invading tyrants is destined in the order of events to kindle the wrath of the people of Europe against those who have dared to embroil them in such wickedness, and to bring at length kings, nobles, and priests to the scaffolds which they have been so long deluging with blood. In one moment of revolutionary euphoria, he dismissed all critics of mass executions in France as blind to the historic issues at stake. The liberty of the whole earth was depending on the issue of that contest, he observed in 1793. And was ever such a prize won with so little blood? My own affections have been deeply wounded by some of the martyrs to this cause, but rather than it should have failed, I would rather have seen half the earth desolated. Were there but an Adam and Eve left in every country and left free, it would be better than it is now. If France was the revolutionary hero in this international drama, England was the counter-revolutionary villain. Jefferson's highly moralistic language castigating George III and the English government in the Declaration of Independence was not just propaganda, at least for Jefferson. It reflected his genuine conviction that England was an inherently corrupt society, the bastion of monarchical power, aristocratic privilege, and courtly intrigue. Since Washington had spent eight years sending American soldiers to their death in battle against Great Britain, one might expect that he harbored even more hostile opinions toward his former adversary. But he did not. Jefferson's Anglophobia was more virulent in part because it was more theoretical, a moral conclusion that followed naturally from the moralistic categories he carried around in his head. If he wanted to stigmatize a political opponent, the worst name he could call him was Angloman. For Jefferson, France represented the brightest future prospects. England represented the dead hand of the past. At the nub of his opposition to Jay's treaty, then, was his utter certainty that it threw the weight of the United States onto the wrong side of history. The Anglo men have in the end got their treaty through, he observed from his mountaintop in 1796, and so far have triumphed over the cause of republicanism. But their victory, painful as it was to witness, had also exposed their vulnerability. For it was now quite obvious that nothing can support them but the colossus of the president's merits with the people, and the moment he retires, that his successor, if a monocrat, will be overborne by the republican sense. In the meantime, patience. Just a few weeks before he wrote these words, Jefferson had felt the urge to assure Washington that contrary to the gossip circulating in the corridors and byways of Philadelphia, he was not responsible for the various rumors describing the president as a quasi-senile frontman for the Federalist conspiracy against the vast majority of the American people. The historical record makes it perfectly clear, to be sure, that Jefferson was orchestrating the campaign of vilification, which had its chief base of operations in Virginia and its headquarters at Monticello. But Jefferson was the kind of man who could have passed a lie detector test confirming his integrity, believing, as he did, that the supreme significance of his larger cause rendered conventional distinctions between truth and falsehood superfluous. Washington's response was designed to let Jefferson know that his professed innocence itself sounded like the defensive comments of a guilty man, and that Washington already knew a good deal more than Jefferson realized about who was whispering what behind his back. If I had entertained any suspicions before, wrote Washington, the assurances you have given me of the contrary would have removed them. But the truth is I harbored none. Translation? Your protests confirm my suspicions. Then Washington parted the curtain covering his soul just enough to show Jefferson a glimpse of what he truly felt. As you have mentioned the subject yourself, it would not be frank, candid, or friendly to conceal that your conduct has been represented as derogatory from the opinion I had conceived you entertained to me. Translation, I am onto your game. 
That to your particular friends and connections you have described, and they have described me as a person under a dangerous influence. Translation, my sources are impeccable. My answer has invariably been that I had never discovered anything in the conduct of Mr. Jefferson to raise suspicions in my mind of his insincerity. Translation, I have not done unto others what they have been doing unto me. Washington concluded with an impassioned defense of his support for Jay's treaty. I was using my utmost exertions to establish a national character of our own, independent as far as our obligations and justice would permit of every nation of the earth. But somehow he had been accused of being the enemy of one nation, France, and subject to the influence of another, England, and to prove it, that every act of my administration should be tortured, and the most insidious misrepresentations of them be made, by giving one side only of a subject, and that, too, in such exaggerated and indecent terms as could scarcely be applied to a Nero, a notorious defaulter, or even to a common pickpocket. But enough of this. I have already gone farther in the expression of my feelings than I intended. Translation Even this mere glimpse into my soul is more than you deserve, my former friend. For the next year, Jefferson attempted to sustain at least the veneer of a friendship with Washington by writing him letters in the Virginia gentleman mode, avoiding politics and foreign policy altogether, focusing instead on his crop rotation scheme at Monticello, the vagaries of the weather, his vetch and wheat crop, and a rather potent metaphor, the best way to spread manure. Washington responded in kind. That is, until the newspapers printed Jefferson's old letter to Philip Matsey, the one about America's degenerate Samson and Solomon. Then all communication from Mount Vernon to Monticello ceased forever. Beyond the purely personal dimensions of their estrangement, beyond Washington's sense of betrayal and Jefferson's artful minuet with duplicity, this episode provides an invaluable clue to the larger and more impersonal political concerns that were on Washington's mind when he sat down to compose the farewell address. They went far past the loss of Jefferson's friendship, important though it was, because Jefferson's behavior was symptomatic of more than a betrayal of trust. It accurately reflected a fundamental division within the revolutionary generation over the meaning of the revolution and the different versions of America's abiding national interest that followed naturally from that disagreement. The words that were used at the time, or the words employed by historians later to capture the essence of the argument, are mere labels. Federalists versus Republicans. Pro-English versus pro-French versions of American neutrality. Underlying the debate that surfaced in full-blown fashion over Jay's treaty lurked a classic confrontation between those who wished America's revolutionary energies to be harnessed to the larger purposes of nation-building and those who interpreted that very process as a betrayal of the revolution itself. From Washington's perspective, the republic established by the Constitution created a government of laws that must be obeyed once the duly elected representatives had reached a decision. That was why he had acted so decisively to put down the Whiskey Rebellion, and why he expected compliance with Jay's treaty once its terms were approved by the Congress. From Jefferson's perspective, on the other hand, all laws and treaties that reigned in the liberating impulses of the Revolution were illegitimate. That was why he regarded the suppression of the Whiskey Rebellion as reprehensible. Were not these Pennsylvania farmers protesting taxes to which they did not consent? As for Jay's treaty, who in his right mind would countenance the acceptance of neo-colonial status within the hated British Empire? Not obeying, but rather violating such unjust laws and treaties was the obligation of every citizen. Was this not the higher law that Americans should follow, arm in arm again with their trusted French brethren? In this formulation, political behavior that was, strictly speaking, traitorous and treasonable, was in fact the only course that enjoyed the sanction of America's most hallowed revolutionary principles. 
Perhaps the most extreme example of this Republican mentality in action was James Monroe, a zealous Jefferson protege currently serving as the minister to France. Though not in Jefferson's league as a thinker or political strategist, Monroe more than made up for these deficiencies by embracing the core articles of the Republican faith with near total abandon. He assured his French hosts that Jay's treaty would never be approved by the Congress, that the vast majority of the American people were eager to join France in war with England, that the U.S. government stood ready to advance France a $5 million loan to subsidize its military expenses, and that when none of these wild predictions materialized, the French government should patiently but firmly disregard all messages from the American president, since he obviously spoke for the aristocratic Anglo-men and would soon be hurled from office by the people. In the meantime, the French should feel perfectly free to retaliate against American ships on the high seas. When they began to do so in the spring of 1796, and the first prize confiscated was a ship named the Mount Vernon, Monroe thought it was a providential version of poetic justice. And by the way, he hoped that Benjamin Franklin Beach at the Aurora would see fit to publish, under a pseudonym, of course, some of his confidential communiques from Paris protesting the most outrageous provisions of Jay's treaty. All this from America's official emissary to the French government. A slightly less extreme but infinitely more befuddled example of the same mentality had surfaced inside Washington's cabinet at the very moment he was making the decision to send Jay's treaty to the Senate in August of 1795. The successor to Jefferson as Secretary of State was Edmund Randolph, like Monroe, a second-tier member of the Virginia dynasty, whose principal recommendation for the job was an unblinking loyalty to Washington, but whose chief political habit was to blink incessantly at any decision that demanded clear convictions of his own. Poor Randolph, an otherwise decent man who was clearly in over his head, had granted an interview with the outgoing French minister to the United States, Joseph Fauché, who had then transcribed the high points of the conversation in a dispatch that was subsequently intercepted at sea by a British cruiser. The British were only too willing to forward the dispatch to the American government. The day after Washington read it out loud to the full cabinet, Randolph submitted his resignation. What the Fauché dispatch claimed and what we know on the basis of subsequent scholarship are not synonymous. According to Fauché, Randolph requested a bribe as part of some mysterious scheme in support of the Whiskey Rebellion. Although Randolph was almost certainly innocent of this charge, the whole tenor and tone of Fauché's account revealed Randolph confiding his personal opposition to the entire domestic and foreign policy of the Washington administration, lamenting the ascendance of a financiering class that aimed at the restitution of monarchy decrying the enslavement of American trade to the audacity of England, depicting Randolph himself as the sole voice of the patriotic party within the government and the last hope for bringing a sadly dazed and thoroughly confused President Washington to his senses. Randolph's unfortunate utterances were not truly treasonable, as he spent the remainder of his life trying vainly and in his foggy style to explain. In truth, he had simply allowed himself to get caught engaging in the same talk that Jefferson was conveying to friends, and Monroe was sputtering out loud to anyone in Paris who would listen. The notion that a diabolical conspiracy of money men and monarchists had seized control of the federal government under Washington's very nose was so widespread within Virginia's political elite that they had lost all perspective on how conspiratorial their own words sounded to those denied the vision. And so, when Washington sat down to draft his farewell address, three salient features rose up out of the immediate political terrain to command his attention. First, he needed to demonstrate that, while poised for retirement, he was still very much in charge, that those rumors of creeping senility and routinized ineptitude were demonstrably wrong. Second, he wanted to carve out a middle course and do so in a moderate tone that together pushed his most ardent critics to the fringes of the ongoing debate 
where their shrill accusations, loaded language, and throbbing moral certainty could languish in the obscurity they deserved. Third, the all-time master of exits wanted to make his final departure from the public stage the occasion for explaining his own version of what the American Revolution meant. Above all, it meant hanging together as a united people, much as the Continental Army had hung together once before, so that those who were making foreign policy into a divisive device in domestic politics, all in the name of America's revolutionary principles, were themselves inadvertently subverting the very cause they claimed to champion. He was stepping forward into the battle one final time, planting his standard squarely in the center of the field, inviting the troops to rally around him rather than wander off in romantic cavalry charges at the periphery, assuring them by his example that if they could only hold the position he defined, they would again prevail. The manner in which the farewell address was actually composed, as it turned out, served as a nearly perfect illustration of its central message, the need to subordinate narrow interests to the larger cause. Much ink has been spilled by several generations of scholars in an effort to determine who wrote the bulk of the words that eventually found their way into print and then into the history books. Like a false scent, the authorship question has propelled historians down labyrinthine trails of evidence in quest of the real and true author. Meanwhile, the object of the hunt sits squarely in the middle of the evidentiary trail, so obvious that it is ignored. Namely, the creation of the farewell address was an inherently collaborative process. Some of the words were Madison's, most of the words were Hamilton's, all the ideas were Washington's. The drafting and editing of the farewell address in effect became a metaphor for the kind of collective effort Washington was urging on the American people as a whole. The story had its start four years earlier, in May of 1792, when Washington approached Madison to help him compose a valedictory address. At the time, fully convinced that he would step down after one term, Washington had chosen Madison because his two most trusted cabinet members, Hamilton and Jefferson, were too closely associated with the party disputes he wanted to condemn. Madison made extensive notes on the basis of three conversations with Washington, then drafted a document that employed the president's own language for many key passages. A spirit of party in the government was becoming a fresh source of difficulty. We are all children of the same country. The nation's essential interests are the same. Its diversities arising from climate and from soil will naturally form a mutual relation of parts and serve as the formulation for an affectionate and permanent union. It was Madison who first proposed that the farewell address not be delivered as a speech to Congress, but that it be printed in the newspapers as a direct address to the people who are your only constituents. After Washington listened to the unanimous advice of all his cabinet officers and reluctantly agreed to serve a second term, he tucked away Madison's draft for another day. That day arrived exactly four years later. On May 15, 1796, Washington sent Hamilton the first draft of a retirement address, no amount of persuasion could change his mind this time, that would announce his departure from public life. The first section of this document reproduced Madison's draft of 1792, which was highly ironic because Madison had become the primary leader of the Republican opposition to Washington's policies in the Congress and was therefore a rather dramatic example of the party spirit that his former words had warned against. The Federalists referred to Madison as the general of the opposition, calling Jefferson, his mentor secluded at Monticello, the generalissimo. Washington included the earlier Madison draft for two reasons. First, it expressed in clear and forceful language a major point he still wanted to make about subordinating sectional and ideological differences to larger national purposes, all the more resonant because drafted by someone who seemed to have forgotten the lesson. And second, its inclusion publicized the fact that he had wanted to retire four years ago, 
so his current decision was really the culmination of a long-standing preference. This latter point was extremely important to Washington. His most virulent critics were currently claiming that his support for the unpopular Jay's Treaty made him unelectable in 1796. So his decision to retire was not truly a voluntary act, but a forced recognition of the political realities. Hamilton tried to reassure him that his sensitivities on this score were excessive, that if he did choose to run for a third term, he would win in a walk. And Hamilton was surely correct. But Washington wanted not a shred of doubt to remain that his decision to step aside was wholly voluntary. This was both a matter of personal pride and a crucial political precedent. By including the Madison Draft of 1792, he advertised his reluctance to serve even his second term, thereby enhancing the credibility of his voluntary rejection of a third. As Washington put it, it may contribute to blunt, if it does not turn aside, some of the shafts among which conviction of fallen popularity and despair of being re-elected, which will be leveled at me with dexterity and keenness. The second section of this first draft that Washington sent to Hamilton focused on the foreign policy issues that had dominated his second term. He was fully aware that Hamilton had supported Jay's treaty. He had even recommended that Hamilton consult Jay before putting pen to paper. But he also wanted Hamilton to know that none of his or Jay's pro-English prejudices should seep into his draft of the document. It should emphasize American neutrality and promote the true and permanent interests of the country. Washington's views, not Hamilton's, must prevail. Hamilton would be the draftsman, but Washington must be the author. I am anxious always to compare the opinions of those in whom I confide with one another, Washington explained, and these again without being bound by them with my own, that I may extract all the good I can. Hamilton required no elaborate instructions on the procedure. It was the same process Washington had developed with his staff as commander-in-chief of the Continental Army, then implemented with his cabinet as president. Hamilton had played the same role in both contexts. All major decisions were collective occasions in which advisors, like spokes on a wheel, made contributions, usually in written form. But in the end, the final decision, to include the final choice of words, came together at the center, which was always Washington. Hamilton also realized that he was being asked to write for posterity as much as the present. It has been my object to render this act importantly and lastingly useful, he confided to Washington, and avoid all just cause of present exception, to embrace such reflections and sentiments as will wear well, progress in approbation with time, and redound to future reputation. He devoted a full two months to revising Washington's draft, amplifying Madison's earlier account of the need to rise above party differences and rally behind the elected representatives of the national government. On July 30th, he sent the fruits of his labors to Washington, who found the Hamilton draft exceedingly just and just such as ought to be inculcated. His only reservation related to length. All the columns of a large gazette would scarcely, I conceive, contain the present draft, Washington noted, adding at the end, I may be mistaken. He was. Hamilton was less sure he had done the best job possible, and immediately began work on a wholly new draft, which he submitted to Washington two weeks later. But Washington liked the earlier draft better. Over the next month, edited versions of that draft passed back and forth several times, with Washington pressing Hamilton for clarifications, deleting certain passages, adding others. I shall expunge all that is marked in the paper as unimportant, he wrote on August 25th, and as you perceive some marginal notes written with a pencil, I pray you to give the sentiments mature consideration. If Hamilton saw fit to make additional revisions on his own, he should let them be so clearly interlined, erased, or referred to in the margins that no mistake may happen. Washington wanted no last-minute changes smuggled in without his approval. Even when the final draft was ready for the printer in September, 
He made changes in 174 out of 1,086 lines in his own hand, and reviewed the punctuation throughout. A final scan, so the printer observed firsthand, in which he was very minute. It seems fair to conclude that what we call Washington's farewell address is not misnamed. What was Hamilton's contribution? Chiefly to assure that the elaboration of Washington's ideas occurred within a rhetorical framework that maintained a stately and dignified tone throughout, and to sustain a palpable cogency and sense of proportion in developing Washington's argument, which itself embodied the self-assurance so central to his major theme about the nation itself. Hamilton had nearly perfect pitch for Washington's language. Having begun his public career drafting letters and memoranda for Washington's signature as a staff officer during the war, he was therefore well practiced in subordinating his own inclinations and style to Washington's larger purposes. In the farewell address, the result is nearly seamless. When combined with the collaborative character of the drafting process, it becomes virtually impossible to tell where one voice ends and another begins. But Hamilton was also such a virtuoso performer in his own right, unmatched within the revolutionary generation for his capacity to deliver powerful prose on a tight deadline, that there are moments in the farewell address when his own distinctive voice breaks through. For example, while Washington agreed with Hamilton's version of what the constitutional settlement of 1787 and 1788 meant, only Hamilton could have put it this way. This government, the offspring of our own choice, uninfluenced and unawed, adopted upon full investigation and mature deliberation, completely free in its principles, in the distribution of its powers, uniting security with energy, and containing within itself a provision for its own amendment, has a just claim to your confidence and support. The very idea of the power and right of the people to establish government presupposes the duty of every individual to obey the established government. Or, on the question of America's national interest and the foreign policy it dictated, again, the idea is pure Washington, but expressed in language that flowed in Hamiltonian cadences. The great role of conduct for us in regard to foreign nations is in extending our commercial relations to have with them as little political connection as possible. Europe has a set of primary interests which to us have none or a very remote relation. Hence, she must be engaged in frequent controversies, the causes of which are essentially foreign to our concerns. Tis our true policy to steer clear of permanent alliances with any portion of the foreign world. Tis folly for one nation to look for disinterested favors from another. There can be no greater error than to expect or calculate upon real favors from nation to nation. Tis an illusion which experience must cure, which a just pride ought to discard. When Hamilton showed a late draft of this passage to John Jay for his commentary, Jay expressed admiration for the style, but slight discomfort with the argument. It occurs to me, he wrote to Washington, that it may not be perfectly prudent to say that we can never expect favors from a nation. For that assertion seems to imply that nations always are, or always ought to be, moved only by interested motives. Jay's suggestion came too late, the farewell address was already in the hands of the printer, but would have made no difference. Washington meant exactly what Hamilton had said. Jay's views of prospective English beneficence, like Jefferson's views of French solidarity with America, were only seductive pieces of sentimentality juvenile illusions in the real world of international relations. Beyond the tight cogency and felicitous cadences, Hamilton's major contribution was to save Washington from his own personal sentiments. In his May draft, Washington had included the following paragraph near the start. I did not seek the office with which you have honored me, and now possess the gray hairs of a man who has, excepting the interval between the close of the Revolutionary War and the organization of the new government, either in a civil or military character, spent five and forty years, all the prime of his life, in serving his country. 
may he be suffered to pass quietly to the grave, and that his errors, however numerous if they are not criminal, may be consigned to the tomb of oblivion, as he himself will soon be to the mansion of retirement. Hamilton eliminated the references to gray hairs, prime of his life, and errors, however numerous. He also altered the wounded tone of the passage by placing it at the end rather than at the beginning of the farewell address, where it seemed less like a somewhat pathetic cri de coeur than a dignified personal testimonial. Washington recognized the improvement, congratulating Hamilton for rendering him with less egotism, meaning the Hamilton draft covered the wounds or at least prevented the president from displaying them too conspicuously. Hamilton's exquisite sense of affinity for Washington's mentality failed him only once. Though the failure, and therefore what is in effect the missing section of the farewell address, opens a more expansive window into the national vision that Washington was trying to project. During the drafting process in the summer of 1796, Washington kept urging Hamilton to insert a separate section on the creation of a national university in the capital city now being constructed on the Potomac. Hamilton resisted the recommendation, arguing quite plausibly that such a specific proposal was inappropriate for an address designed to operate at a higher altitude. It was, he suggested, the kind of proposal better made in the final message to Congress in the fall. But Washington kept insisting that he wanted the idea to be a featured element in the farewell address. But to be candid, he explained, I much question whether a recommendation of this measure to the legislature will have a better effect now than formerly. It may skew indeed my sense of its importance, and that it is a sufficient inducement with me to bring the matter before the public in some shape or another at the closing scenes of my political exit to set the people ruminating on the importance of the measure. Hamilton eventually relented, though only grudgingly. At the last moment, he inserted a brief two-sentence paragraph rather awkwardly near the middle of the farewell address, calling for institutions for the general diffusion of knowledge, and urging quite harmlessly that public opinion should be enlightened. Washington wasn't satisfied with the result, but decided to let the matter drop. In so doing, however, he let Hamilton know that something was being lost that his hopes for a national university linked up to something larger. In the general juvenile period of life, when friendships are formed and habits established that will stick by one, he explained, the youth or young men from different parts of the United States would be assembled together and would by degrees discover that there was not just cause for those jealousies and prejudices which one part of the Union had imbibed against another part. What? But the mixing of people from different parts of the United States during the war rubbed off these impressions. A century in the ordinary intercourse would not have accomplished what the Seven Years' Association in Arms did. Here was a characteristically Washingtonian insight. Rooted in his experience during the war years, simultaneously simple but essential, projecting developments into the future on the basis of patterns that were still congealing and that only now, in retrospect, seem so obvious. Like his misguided obsession with those Potomac canals, his campaign for a national university in the capital city never bore fruit. But both failed projects were also visionary projections linked to larger expectations. In the case of the National University, it was the recognition that the United States was still very much a nation in the making, because its population was still a people in the making. Time, indeed a considerable stretch of time, would be required to allow the bonding together of this large, widely dispersed and diverse population. But institutions devoted to focusing the national purposes, again like the Continental Army during the war, could accelerate time and move America past that vulnerable and problematic phase of its development when fragmentation, perhaps civil war, was still a distinct possibility. Throughout the farewell address, Washington had been exhorting Americans to think of themselves as a collective unit with a common destiny. 
To our ears, it sounds so obvious because we occupy the future location that Washington envisioned. But his exhortations toward national unity were less descriptions than anticipations, less reminders of the way we were than predictions of what we could become. Indeed, the act of exhorting was designed to enhance the prospect by talking about it as if it were a foregone conclusion, which Washington most assuredly knew it was not. In the end, the farewell address was primarily a great prophecy, accompanied by advice about how to make it come true. It was also, at least implicitly, a justification for the strong executive leadership Washington had provided in the 1790s, and that his critics had stigmatized as a monarchy. Without a Republican king at the start, he was saying, the new quasi-nation called the United States— would never have enjoyed the opportunity to achieve its long-run destiny. It would have expired in the short run. In a sense, Washington was defending his presidency as an essential exception to full-blooded Republican principles. Down the road, when the common experience of conquering the continent and the sheer passage of time had bound the American people together into a more cohesive whole, the more voluntaristic habits at the core of Republican mentality could express themselves fully. For now, however, the center needed to hold. That meant a vigorous federal government with sufficient powers to coerce the citizenry to pay taxes and obey the laws. Veterans of the Continental Army, like Hamilton and John Marshall, fully understood this essential point. Intriguingly, the two chieftains of the Republican opposition, Jefferson and Madison, had never served in the Army. They obviously did not understand. How could this emerging nation manage its way through this first post-Washington phase of its development? In the farewell address, Washington offered his general answer. Think of yourself as a single nation. Subordinate your regional and political differences to your common identity as Americans. Regard the federal government that represents your collective interest as an ally rather than an enemy as us, if you will, rather than them. In his eighth and final message to Congress, delivered the following December, Washington provided a more specific directive. His Republican critics had described Jay's treaty as a pact with the devil that was certain to produce domestic and diplomatic catastrophe. Upon scanning the horizon for the last time, however, Washington saw serenity setting in. Treaties with the hostile Indian tribes on the southern and western frontiers were being negotiated. The British were removing their troops from posts in the west in accord with Jay's treaty. Thanks primarily to the resumption of trade with Great Britain, the American economy was humming along quite nicely, with revenues from the increased trade reducing the national debt faster than had been anticipated. The only dark spot on the political horizon was France whose cruisers were intercepting American shipping in the West Indies. Washington counseled patience with what would soon be called this quasi-war with the French Republic, predicting, correctly as it turned out, that a spirit of justice, candor, and friendship will eventually ensure success. Confidence, he seemed to be saying, is a self-fulfilling prophecy, all the more so when the confidence was justified. Even more specifically, Washington suggested that his departure from the national scene would require the enlargement, not the diminution, of the powers of the federal government in order to compensate for his absence. He recommended that Congress undertake a whole new wave of federal initiatives, a new program to encourage domestic manufacturers, a similar program to subsidize agricultural improvements, the creation of a national university, his old hobby horse, and a national military academy, an expanded navy to protect American shipping in the Mediterranean and the Caribbean, increased compensation for federal officials in order to ensure that public service was not dependent on private wealth. It was the most expansive presidential program for enlarged federal power until John Quincy Adams proposed a similar vision in his inaugural address of 1825. 
It was the tradition that the Whig Party of Henry Clay and the Republican Party of Abraham Lincoln sustained in the 19th century and that the Democratic Party of Andrew Jackson rejected. In the more immediate context of 1796, Washington seemed to be saying that the departure of America's only Republican king necessitated the creation of centering forces institutionalized at the federal level to maintain the focusing functions he had performed personally. Finally, who were these American people being bonded together? If Washington wished the national government to be regarded as us rather than them, how did he define the us? He addressed his remarks in the farewell address to his friends and fellow citizens. While he undoubtedly thought this description cast a wide and inclusive net that pulled in residents from all the regions or sections of the United States, it did not include all inhabitants. The core of the audience he saw in his mind's eye consisted of those adult white males who owned sufficient property to qualify for the vote. Strictly speaking, such men were the only citizens. He told Hamilton that his farewell address was aimed especially at the yeomanry of the country, which meant ordinary farmers working small plots of land and living in households. This brought women and children into the picture, not as full-blooded citizens, to be sure, but as part of the American people whose political identity was subsumed within the family and conveyed by the male heads of household. They were secondary citizens, but unquestionably Americans. Landless, rural residents and impoverished city dwellers lay outside the picture. Though they, more likely their descendants, could work their way into the American citizenry over time. If only potentially and prospectively, they were included. The largest unmentioned and presumably excluded constituency was the black population, about 90% of which was enslaved. Washington said nothing whatsoever about slavery in his farewell address, sustaining the silence that the Congress had adopted as its official posture early in his presidency. Silence, of course, can speak volumes, and in Washington's case, the unspoken message was that a moratorium had been declared on this most controversial topic, which more than any other issue possessed the potential to destroy the fragile union that he saw as his life's work and chief political legacy. Since the primary purpose of the farewell address was to affirm that legacy and foster the promotion of his national vision, the last thing Washington wanted to mention was the one subject that presented the most palpable threat to the entire enterprise. Like Madison in 1790, he wanted slavery off the American political agenda. Unlike Madison, however, and unlike most of his fellow Virginians, there is a reason to believe that he thought the moratorium on slavery as a political problem should lapse in 1808, when the Constitution permitted the slave trade to end. His silence on the slavery question was strategic. Believing as he did that slavery was a cancer on the body politic of America that could not at present be removed without killing the patient. The intriguing question is whether Washington could project an American future after slavery that included the African-American population as prospective members of the American citizenry. For almost all the leading members of the Virginia dynasty, the answer was clear and negative. Even those like Jefferson and Madison, who looked forward to the eventual end of slavery, also presumed that all freed blacks must be transported elsewhere. Washington never endorsed that conclusion. Nor did he ever embrace the racial arguments for black inferiority that Jefferson advanced in Notes on the State of Virginia. He tended to regard the condition of the black population as a product of nurture rather than nature. That is, he saw slavery as the culprit, preventing the development of diligence and responsibility that would emerge gradually and naturally after emancipation. By 1796, he had begun to draft his last will and testament, in which he eventually made elaborate provisions to assure that all his slaves would be freed upon the death of his wife. He also made even more elaborate provisions to guarantee that Mount Vernon would be sold off in pieces 
part of the proceeds used to support his freed slaves and their children for several decades into the future. His action on this score, as usual, spoke louder than his words, for they suggested an obligation beyond the grave to assist his former slaves in the transition to freedom within the borders of the United States. Whether he could conjure up a vision of blacks and whites living together in harmony at some unspecified time in the future remains unclear. But he was truly rare within the political elite of Virginia in leaving this question open. He could and did imagine the inclusion of Native Americans. Late in August of 1796, at the same time he was making final revisions on his farewell address, Washington wrote his Address to the Cherokee Nation. From a strictly legal point of view, each of the various Indian tribes east of the Mississippi was already a nation, or an indigenous quasi-nation within the expanding borders of the United States. Therein, of course, lay the chief problem, and the makings for an apparently inevitable tragedy. For in Washington's projection, the westward flow of the American population would prove relentless and unstoppable. I also have thought much on this subject. Washington declared to the Cherokees, and anxiously wished that the various Indian tribes, as well as their neighbors, the white people, might enjoy in abundance all the good things which make life comfortable and happy. I have considered how this could be done, and have discovered but one path that would lead them to that desirable solution. In this path I wish all the Indian nations to walk. The one path Washington identified required the Indians to recognize that contesting the expansion of the white population was suicidal. The only realistic solution required the Indians to accept the inevitable, abandon their hunter-gatherer economies, which required huge tracts of land to work effectively, embrace farming as their preferred mode of life, and gradually, over several generations, allow themselves to be assimilated into the larger American nation. Washington acknowledged that he was asking a lot, that this path may seem a little difficult to enter, because it meant subduing their understandable urge to resist and sacrificing many of their most distinctive and cherished tribal values. As he prepared for his own retirement, in effect he was encouraging the Indian tribes to retire from their way of life as Indians. What I have recommended to you, he wrote somewhat plaintively, I am myself going to do. After a few moons are past, I shall leave the great town and retire to my farm. There I shall attend to the means of increasing my cattle, sheep, and other useful animals. If the Indians would follow his example, the peaceful coexistence of Indians and whites could follow naturally, and their gradual merger into a single American people would occur within the arc of the next century. Whatever moral deficiencies and cultural condescensions a modern-day American audience might find in Washington's advice, two salient points are clear. First, it was in keeping with his relentless realism about the limited choices that history offered. And second, it projected Indians into the mix of peoples called Americans. Reactions to the farewell address fell into the familiar grooves. The overwhelming public response was tearfully exuberant, regretting the departure of America's political centerpiece for the last quarter century, but embracing his message, as one member of the cabinet put it, as a transcript of the general expression of the people of the United States. Meanwhile, the Republican press denounced his warnings about political divisions at home and diplomatic involvement abroad as the loathings of a sick mind. In the Aurora, Benjamin Franklin Bates reprinted the old charge that Washington had been a traitor who conspired with the English government during the war. This man had a celebrity in a certain way, Washington remarked concerning Bates, for his calumnies are to be exceeded only by his impudence, and both stand unrivaled. One of his last acts as president was to place on file in the State Department his rejoinder to Bates's accusations, which historians have long since discovered were based on forged English documents. He left office in March of 1797 
with the resounding cheers of his huge army of supporters and the howls of that much smaller pack of critics echoing in his ears. Passing through Alexandria on his way to Mount Vernon, he stopped to deliver a speech in which he reiterated his allegiance to the principles articulated in the farewell address. Clouds may and doubtless often will in the vicissitudes of events hover over our political concerns, he announced, but a steady adherence to these principles will not only dispel but render our prospects the brighter by such temporary obscurities. He remained supremely confident that he was right to the very end. Though the temporary obscurities being spewed out by the Republican press, France was America's international ally and the national government its domestic enemy, produced fits of private despair and periodic flare-ups of the famous Washington temper. Even ensconced under his vine and fig tree in retirement, he continued to subscribe to ten newspapers. More than any great leader in American history before or since, he was accustomed to getting his way, and equally accustomed to having history prove him right. But his final two and a half years at Mount Vernon were beclouded by the incessant apprehension that his final advice to the country would be ignored, and his legacy, and with it his own place in history, abandoned. Part of his problem was a function of location. Mount Vernon, of course, lay within the borders of Virginia, and Virginia had become the homeland of the Republican opposition, which was dedicated to overturning the foreign policy and the entire edifice of national sovereignty that Washington stood for. In effect, Mount Vernon became an enclave within enemy territory, surrounded by neighbors committed to a Virginia writ large version of the American Republic. Washington, once the supreme Virginian, had in their eyes gone over to the other side. Once the all-purpose solution, Washington was now the still potent problem, a kind of Trojan horse planted squarely in the Virginia fortress. The fact that he devoted so much of his remaining time and energy to overseeing the construction of the new capital city on the Potomac, it was a foregone conclusion that it would be named after him, only confirmed their worst fears. For that city and the name it was destined to carry symbolized the conspiracy that threatened, so Jefferson and his followers thought, all that Virginia stood for. Washington, for his part, obliged his Virginia critics by urging his step-grandson to attend Harvard in order to escape the provincial versions of learning currently ascendant in the Old Dominion. Increasingly, he seemed to think of his home state in the same vein as the Indian tribes in his letter to the Cherokees. The destiny of the American nation was pointing one way, and if the tribal chieftains of Virginia chose to oppose that direction, so be it. But they were aligning themselves on the wrong side of history. The end came on December 14, 1799. The previous day, when it became clear that the combination of pneumonia and the bleeding and blistering remedies of his physicians could produce but one conclusion, Washington ordered the doctors to cease their barbarisms and permit him to die in peace. I am just going, he apprised those around his bed. Have me decently buried and do not let my body be put into the vault in less than three days after I am dead. Do you understand me? Though he had no illusions of his own immortality, he apparently feared being buried alive, perhaps believing that was really what had happened with Jesus. His last words were, "'Tis well." Self-sufficient as always, his last act was to feel his own pulse at the moment he expired. This ends Disc 7, Founding Brothers, Disc 8. Chapter 5. The Collaborators As a result of Washington's Olympian status, the infant American Republic had managed to avoid a contested presidential election prior to 1796. Exactly how such an event should proceed without tearing the country apart was still very much a matter of speculation and improvisation. Although some semblance of the routinized mechanisms for political parties had begun to congeal during the debate over Jay's treaty, 
Nothing remotely resembling the organized campaign structure of modern political parties yet existed. The method of choosing electors to that odd inspiration called the Electoral College varied from state to state. And the very notion that a candidate should openly solicit votes violated the principled presumption that such behavior itself represented a confession of unworthiness for national office. While a clear political distinction between Federalists and Republicans had emerged during Washington's second term, and fervent editorialists were blazing away as partisans from both sides in the popular press. Party labels and issue-oriented platforms were less important than a prospective candidate's revolutionary credentials. Memories of the spirit of 76 were still warm 20 years later. And the chief qualification for the presidency remained a matter of one's historic role in the creation of American independence between 1776 and 1789. Only those leaders who had stepped forward at the national level to promote the great cause when its success was still perilous and problematic were eligible. An exhaustive list of prospects would have included between 20 and 30 names, with Samuel Adams, Alexander Hamilton, Patrick Henry, and James Madison enjoying spirited support. But the four names topping everyone's list would have been almost unanimous. George Washington, Benjamin Franklin, John Adams, and Thomas Jefferson. By 1796, of course, Washington had done his duty. Franklin was dead and gone. That left Adams and Jefferson as the obvious options. And by the spring of 1796, it had become a foregone conclusion that the choice was between them. They were an incongruous pair, but everyone seemed to argue that history had made them into a pair. The incongruities leaped out for all to see. Adams, the short, stout, candid-to-a-fault New Englander. Jefferson, the tall, slender, elegantly elusive Virginian. Adams, the highly combustible, ever-combative, mile-a-minute talker whose favorite form of conversation was an argument. Jefferson, the always cool and self-contained enigma, who regarded debate and argument as violations of the natural harmonies he heard inside his own head. The list could go on. The Yankee and the Cavalier, the Orator and the Writer, the Bulldog and the Greyhound. They were the odd couple of the American Revolution. And it was the Revolution that had brought them together. They had worked side by side in the Continental Congress, first as staunch opponents of reconciliation with England, then as members of the committee to draft the Declaration of Independence. In 1784, they were reunited in Paris, where Jefferson became an unofficial member of the Adams family, and as Abigail Adams put it, the only person with whom my companion could associate with perfect freedom and reserve. The following year, Jefferson visited Adams for several weeks in London, where, as America's two chief ministers in Europe, they endured the humiliation together when George III ostentatiously turned his back on them during a formal ceremony at court. Adams never forgot this scene, nor did he forget the friend who was standing beside him when it happened. There were, to be sure, important political and ideological differences between the two men, differences that became the basis for the opposing sides they took in the party wars of the 1790s. But as soulmates who had lived together through some of the most formative events of the revolutionary era and of their own lives, Adams and Jefferson bonded at a personal and emotional level that defied their merely philosophical differences. They were charter members of the band of brothers who had shared the agonies and ecstasies of 1776 as colleagues no subsequent disagreement could shake this elemental affinity. They knew, trusted, even loved each other for reasons that required no explanation. The two major contestants for the presidency in 1796, then, not only possessed impeccable revolutionary credentials, they had also earned their fame as a team. Within the revolutionary generation, several competing examples of fortuitous cooperation and collaboration had helped to make history happen. Washington and Hamilton during the war, and then again during Washington's second term. Hamilton and Madison on the Federalist Papers. 
Madison and Jefferson in orchestrating the Republican opposition to Hamilton's financial program and then Jay's treaty. But in part because it seemed so seminal and symbolic of sectional cooperation, the Adams-Jefferson tandem stood out as the greatest collaboration of them all. Choosing between them seemed like choosing between the head and the heart of the American Revolution. If revolutionary credentials were the major criteria, Adams was virtually unbeatable. His career, indeed his entire life, was made by the American Revolution, and he in turn had made American independence his life's project. Perhaps Franklin and Hamilton could claim to have come from further back in the pack, but Adams was another one of those American characters who would have languished in obscurity if born in England or Europe. Instead, he was born in Braintree, 12 miles south of Boston, in 1735, the son of a farmer and shoemaker, who sent Adams to Harvard in the hope he might become a minister. For a decade after graduating from college, he probed his soul for signs of a divine calling, while earning his keep as a country school teacher and then apprentice lawyer. In the mid-1760s, two crucial events determined his fate. First, in 1764, he married Abigail Smith and created with her a partnership of remarkable equity and intimacy. Second, in 1765, he stepped forward to help lead the opposition against the Stamp Act and eventually against every aspect of British policy toward the American colonies. American independence became his ministerial calling, a mission he pursued with all the compressed energy of a latter-day Puritan pastor whose congregation was the American people. Bedeviled by doubts about himself, but never about his cause, Adams and his cousin Samuel had become the most conspicuous opponents of British authority in New England by the time the Continental Congress convened in 1774. In the debates within the Continental Congress, John Adams gained fame as the Atlas of Independence, for renouncing any reconciliation with England, and for his pamphlet, Thoughts on Government, which became the guidebook for several state constitutions. While other delegates in the Congress kept searching for ways to avoid a break with England, Adams insisted the revolution had already begun. He successfully lobbied for Washington to head the Continental Army, and personally selected Jefferson to draft the Declaration of Independence, two strategic decisions designed to assure Virginia's support for the cause. For over a year, he served as chair of the Board of War and Ordnance, playing the role of Secretary of War during the most tense and uncertain phase of the fighting. In 1777, the Congress chose him to join Franklin in Paris to negotiate the alliance with France. He returned home for a few months in 1779, just long enough to draft almost single-handedly the Massachusetts Constitution. Then it was back to Paris to work on the peace treaty ending the war, an experience that generated his lifelong enmity toward Franklin, who found him insufferably austere and obsessively diligent. Adams thought Franklin naive about French motives, which were anti-English but not pro-American, and besotted with his own inflated reputation as the ultimate American in Paris. Until 1788, he remained in Europe, first working with Jefferson for legal recognition of the new American nation, as well as for loans from Dutch bankers in Amsterdam, then as America's first minister to the court of St. James in London, where he confirmed his everlasting conviction that England cares no more for us than for the Seminole Indians. His absence from the Constitutional Convention was regretted by all. Along with Madison, he was regarded as America's most sophisticated student of government. He used his spare time in London to toss off three volumes of political philosophy, entitled Defense of the Constitution of the United States, which emphasized the advantages of a strong executive, a bicameral legislature, and the principle of checks and balances. He returned to America in time to be elected the first vice president of the United States, which most observers, including Adams himself, interpreted as a popular mandate on his historical contribution to independence. In the American pantheon, with Franklin on his deathbed, he ranked second only to Washington himself. 
His reputation then fell victim to two nearly calamitous setbacks, one beyond his control and the other the product of his personal flair for perversity. On the former score, Adams had the misfortune to become the first occupant of what he described as the most insignificant office that ever the invention of man contrived or his imagination conceived. Subsequent occupants of the vice presidential office have lengthened the list of semi-humorous complaints about inhabiting a prestigious political prison, for example, not worth a bucket full of spit. But Adams originated the jokes because he was the first prominent American statesman to experience the paradox of being a proverbial heartbeat away from maximum power while languishing in the political version of a cul-de-sac. According to the Constitution, the vice president had two duties. To remain available if the president died, fell ill, or was removed from office, and to serve as president pro tem of the Senate, casting a vote only to break a tie. During his eight years in office, Adams cast more tie-breaking votes, at least 31 and perhaps as many as 38, than any subsequent vice president in American history, in part because the small size of the Senate made ties more frequent. But after Adams's initial fling at participating in the debates, the members of the Senate decided that the vice president was not permitted to speak. It is, to be sure, a punishment to hear other men talk five hours every day, Adams wrote to Abigail, and not be at liberty to talk at all myself, especially as more than half I hear appears to me very young, inconsiderate, and inexperienced. It was a monumental irony. The man famous as the indefatigable orator of independence in the Continental Congress was obliged to remain silent in the legislative councils of the new government. My office, Adams complained, is too great a restraint upon such a son of liberty. The great volcano of American political debate was required to confine himself to purely private eruptions. These occurred sporadically in his personal correspondence with Abigail, who remained ensconced at home in Quincy, Massachusetts, and with old revolutionary comrades like Benjamin Rush. Adams deeply resented being marooned and muted in the Senate, like an old war horse with several charges left in him, now put out to pasture while crucial battles about the direction of the Republic raged around him. And Adams being Adams, his bitterness found colorful and painfully self-defeating expression in his tirades about the injustice of it all. The history of our revolution will be one continued lie from one end to the other, he wrote Rush in 1790. The essence of the whole will be that Dr. Franklin's electric rod smote the earth and outsprang General Washington, that Franklin electrified him with his rod, and thenceforward these two conducted all the policy, negotiations, legislatures, and war. As Adams saw it, he had been prepared, by both experience and training, to perform a central role in the unfolding drama of winning and securing the American Revolution. Instead, he was relegated to the sidelines as a marginal player, while Johnny-come-latelys like Hamilton and Madison occupied center stage. To make matters worse, his duties in the Senate removed him from the deliberations of the Cabinet. Washington seldom consulted him on policy questions, apparently believing that the vice presidency was a legislative office based in the Senate. Therefore, to include Adams in executive decisions violated the constitutional doctrine of separation of powers. When asked by friends about his isolation from the presidential councils, Adams half-heartedly endorsed the same constitutional explanation. The executive authority is so wholly out of my sphere, he observed, and it is so delicate a thing for me to meddle in that, I avoid it as much as possible. He desperately wanted to be consulted, but he was too proud to push himself forward. He steadfastly supported all the major initiatives of the Washington administration, including Hamilton's financial plan, the suppression of the Whiskey Rebellion, the proclamation of neutrality, and Jay's treaty, though he had almost no influence on their formulation and some private reservations about Hamilton's ties with bankers and speculators. It was difficult to think of the ever-combative, highly combustible champion of the American Revolution as extraneous and invisible, but that is what the vice presidency had made him. Adams deserved an assist for making himself into a marginal figure, 
because of remarks he made during the first session of the Senate, before it was decided that the vice president couldn't participate in debates. The issue concerned a minor matter of etiquette. How should the president be addressed by members of Congress? While hardly an earth-shaking question, it had symbolic significance because of the obsessive American suspicion of monarchy, which haunted all conversations about the powers of the presidency under the recently ratified Constitution. Anyone who favored a strong executive was vulnerable to the charge of being a quasi-monarchist and therefore a traitor to the Republican principles of the American Revolution. Adams was so confident in his own revolutionary credentials that he regarded himself as immune to such charges. But when he lectured the Senate on the need for elaborate trappings of authority and proposed that President Washington be addressed as His Majesty or His Highness, his remarks became the butt of several barbed jokes, including the suggestion that he had been seized by nobilimania during his long sojourn in England and might prefer to be addressed as his rotundity or the Duke of Braintree. Jefferson threw up his hands at the sheer stupidity of Adams's proposals, calling them the most superlatively ridiculous thing I ever heard of. Adams tried to laugh himself out of the monarchical morass, claiming that he simply wanted to assure that the executive branch of the government enjoyed a fighting chance against the awesome powers of the legislature. The little fishes will eat up the great one, he joked, unless the great one should devour all the little ones. If all formal titles were to be stigmatized, he wrote to Benjamin Rush, then perhaps Rush's children should start addressing their father as Ben. Mostly, however, Adams stewed and simmered and tried to defend himself. Ever the political pugilist who felt obliged to answer every bell, Adams refused to back away from his belief that the new American government needed a strong executive presence. In a series of 31 essays printed in the Gazette of the United States and subsequently published as Discourses on Davila, he argued that all stable governments required what he called a monarchical principle, meaning a singular figure empowered to embody the will of the nation and to protect the ordinary citizenry from the inevitable accumulation of power by the more wealthy and well-born. In most European states, he went on to argue, it was probably necessary for the monarchy to remain hereditary for the foreseeable future, in order to permit a more gradual transition to full-blown Republican principles. Such statements seemed almost designed to invite misunderstanding, which is precisely what they did. For the rest of his life, Adams lived under a cloud of suspicion that he wished to restore hereditary monarchy in America, and that once installed in the presidency, he fully intended to declare himself king for life and his son John Quincy his successor. He could argue till doomsday that such claims were preposterous, which they were, and which he did, but Adams had tied a tin can labeled monarchist to his own tail which then rattled through ages and pages of the history books. Since Washington had no children of his own, the father of his country was almost certainly sterile, he was less vulnerable to charges of hereditary aspirations. Intriguingly, of the first six presidents, only Adams had a male heir. If Washington became the quasi-monarchical president who could be trusted, Adams became the closet monarchist who couldn't. The Davila essays, in fact, became the basis for the first serious rift in his friendship with Jefferson. The publisher of the American edition of Tom Paine's The Rights of Man printed what we would now call a blurb for the book, a quote from Jefferson, who had presumed that his remarks would be anonymous. Jefferson mentioned in passing the political heresies of Davila, which everyone knew to be written by Adams. Adams was outraged, claiming that Jefferson, of all people, should know that he had not converted to monarchy while in Europe. Jefferson expressed his regrets, explaining to Washington, I am afraid the indiscretion of a printer has compromised me with a friend, Mr. Adams, for whom, as one of the most honest and disinterested men alive, I have a cordial esteem. A somewhat touchy correspondence then ensued in which Jefferson attempted to remind Adams that their much-valued friendship did not depend on complete agreement about forms of government. 
Adams, clearly hurt, responded in his typically aggressive style. I know not what your idea is of the best form of government. You and I never had a serious conversation together that I can recollect concerning the nature of government. The very transient hints that have passed between us have been jocular and superficial, without ever coming to any explanation. Having scored his points, Adams then retreated to safer ground. The friendship that has subsisted for fifteen years between us without the slightest interruption, and until this occasion without the slightest suspicion, ever has been and still is very dear to my heart. It was still dear to Jefferson as well, so much so that he preferred to misrepresent his emerging conviction that Adams had allowed himself to be taken up by the monarchical Federalists, and was, albeit inadvertently, lending his enormous prestige to the growing conspiracy against the revolutionary principles that the Adams-Jefferson team had done so much to create. That, at least, was what he was saying and writing to others. To Adams, on the other hand, he claimed that his remarks on the Davila essays had been misconstrued, that he was actually not referring to any writing that I might suppose to be yours. This was patently untrue, but a justifiable distortion in the Jeffersonian scheme of things, because motivated by an authentic urge to sustain the friendship. The Adams style was to confront, shout, rant, and then to embrace. The Jefferson style was to evade, maintain pretenses, then convince himself that all was well. For a time, the meshing of these two diametrically different styles worked. Adams and Jefferson maintained cordial relations throughout most of Washington's first term. Even though it was clear for all to see that they stood on opposite sides of the chasm that was opening up between Federalists and Republicans. It helped that Adams was muzzled and largely ignored in the vice presidency, and that Jefferson, though covertly advising Madison on how best to counter Hamilton's financial program, was simultaneously and officially a member of the Washington administration. In 1793, Jefferson accompanied Adams for his induction into the American Philosophical Society. Adams commented to Abigail, We are still upon terms, meaning that the friendship endured, but just barely. Jefferson's enthusiasm for the French Revolution, despite its wild and bloody excesses, pushed Adams over the edge. The notion that the cascading events in France bore any relation to the American Revolution struck Adams as outright lunacy. Danton, Robespierre, and Marat, etc., are furies, he wrote to John Quincy in 1793. Dragon's teeth have been sown in France and will come up as monsters. He began to describe Jefferson as a dangerous dreamer, who, like many of his fellow Virginians, was so deeply in debt to British creditors that his judgment of European affairs was tinged with a virulent form of Anglophobia that rendered him incapable of a detached assessment of America's interests abroad. He needed to get out from under his debts and proportion his style and life to his revenue. As it was, Jefferson had become a man poisoned by ambition and his temper embittered against the Constitution and the administration. By the time Jefferson stepped down as Secretary of State, late in 1793, only faint traces of the famous friendship lingered like nostalgic reminiscences in the Adams memory. I have so long been in the habit of thinking well of his abilities and general good dispositions, Adams confided to Abigail, that I cannot but feel some regret at this event, Jefferson's retirement. But his want of candor, his obstinate prejudices against all forms of government power, his real partiality in spite of all his pretensions— have so nearly reconciled me to it that I will not weep. His mind is now poisoned with passion, prejudice, and faction. As a veteran Jefferson watcher, Adams offered a skeptical assessment of his former friend's decision to leave public life. Jefferson thinks by this step to get a reputation of an humble, modest, meek man wholly without ambition or vanity, he explained to John Quincy. He may even have deceived himself into this belief, but if a prospect opens— the world will see and he will feel that he is as ambitious as Oliver Cromwell, though no soldier. In a sense, Adams was saying that he understood the psychological forces driving Jefferson's escape to Monticello better than Jefferson himself. 
He already sensed, in a way that Jefferson's elaborate denial mechanisms didn't permit into his own interior conversations, that Jefferson's retirement was temporary, and the two old colleagues would soon be vying for the presidency. The great collaboration was destined to become the great competition. The most savvy Jefferson watcher of all time, at least over the full stretch of their respective careers, was James Madison. While in the Adams partnership Jefferson was the younger man, he was senior to Madison. While he tended to defer to Adams on the basis of age and political experience, Jefferson dominated his relationship with Madison for the same reasons. The collaboration had begun in Virginia during the Revolution and had then congealed during the 1780s, when Jefferson was in Paris and Madison became his most trusted source of information about political events back home, most especially the drafting and ratification of the Constitution, which turned out to be Madison's most singularly creative moment and the only occasion when he acted independently of Jefferson's influence. Although the trust between them had grown close to unconditional by the 1790s, when they assumed joint leadership of the Republican opposition to Federalist domestic and foreign policies, their partnership lacked the dramatic character of the Adams-Jefferson collaboration, which seemed to symbolize the creative tension between New England and Virginia and the fusion of ideological and temperamental opposites in a common cause. Madison was temperamentally the opposite of Jefferson, less sweeping in his intellectual style, more careful and precise, the prose to Jefferson's poetry. But because he instinctively subordinated his agenda to Jefferson's will, there were never the revealing clashes that gave the Adams-Jefferson dialogue its dynamic dimension. If the seams in the Adams-Jefferson collaboration were the source of its magic, the Jefferson-Madison alliance was seamless, and therefore less magical than smoothly and silently effective. Whereas Adams and Jefferson had come together as Americans, first in 1776 as early advocates of independence from Great Britain, then in the 1780s as America's two chief ministers in Europe, Jefferson and Madison had bonded as Virginians, dedicated to assuring the triumph of Virginia's interests within the national government. While perhaps a more provincial cause, it had all the advantages of a more concerted and tightly focused political agenda in which each man played a clearly defined role. Jefferson was the grand strategist, Madison the agile tactician. I shall always receive your commands with pleasure, Madison wrote to Jefferson in 1794, and shall continue to drop you a line as occasions turn up. Jefferson had recently ensconced himself at Monticello, relishing his retirement, and Madison was returning to the political wars in Philadelphia. Madison's message signaled the resumption of what can be considered the most successful political partnership in American history. And though Jefferson didn't know it, indeed made a point of denying it to himself, it also signaled the start of his campaign for the presidency. Jefferson's letters during this reclusive phase avoided politics altogether, emphasizing instead his designs for a refurbished Monticello, his crop rotation system, a somewhat bizarre proposal to transfer the University of Geneva to Virginia, and the ideal process for making manure. His letters to Madison also featured the Monticellan Jefferson, the statesman turned farmer, sequestered in my remote canton, Politics on occasion crept into the dialogue, much like an exotic plant growing amid descriptions of vetch as the ideal rotation crop. Madison's letters, on the other hand, were full of political news from the capital. Hamilton's treacheries and alleged cooking of the books in the Treasury Department, Washington's ominous overreaction to the Whiskey Rebellion, the groundswell of opposition to Jay's treaty, with many of the letters written in code, to foil snoopers at the post office. Madison was quietly orchestrating the Republican campaign on behalf of Jefferson to succeed Washington. In October of 1795, Aaron Burr visited Monticello, presumably to discuss the delivery of New York's electoral votes, probably as a condition for his own place on the ticket as vice president. Other Republican operatives, like John Beckley, the Speaker of the House, 
were focusing on the political factions in Pennsylvania, another key state. On the other side, Federalist editors and polemicists, encountering this mounting campaign on Jefferson's behalf, began to generate anti-Jefferson propaganda. He had suffered humiliation as governor of Virginia when he fled before British troops. He was an inveterate Francophile. He was an intellectual dreamer, more fit to be a professor in a college, president of a philosophical society, but certainly not the first magistrate of a great nation. While all this was going on around him, Jefferson professed complete ignorance of his candidacy. He would have been perfectly capable of swearing on the Bible that none of these initiatives came from him. Madison managed the particulars silently and surreptitiously. He understood, indeed it was a crucial aspect of the collaboration, that Jefferson's eventual re-entry into the political arena depended upon sustaining the fiction in his mentor's own mind that it would never happen. Jefferson required what we would call deniability, not just for public purposes, but also for his own private serenity. In the Jefferson-Madison collaboration, Madison was not just responsible for handling the messy particulars. He was also accountable for shielding his chief from the political ambitions throbbing away in his own soul. As late as the summer of 1796, when Washington's retirement was a foregone conclusion and Jefferson's candidacy for the presidency was common knowledge throughout the country, Jefferson claimed to be completely oblivious to the campaign on his behalf. Madison spent four months at Montpelier, only a few miles from Monticello, but never visited Jefferson, for fear of being forced into a conversation that might upset Jefferson's denial mechanisms. I have not seen Jefferson, he wrote Monroe in code, and have thought it best to present him no opportunity of protesting to his friend against being embarked on this contest. Jefferson thus became perhaps the last person in America to recognize that he was running for the presidency against his old friend from Massachusetts. Meanwhile, up in Quincy, that very friend was also dancing a minuet with his own political ambitions. Adams's partner in the dance was Abigail, whose political instincts rivaled Madison's legendary skills, and whose knowledge of her husband's emotional makeup surpassed all competitors. She had always been his ultimate confidant, the person he could trust with his self-doubts, vanities, and overflowing opinions. Now, however, with Jefferson gone over to the other side and their former friendship reduced to polite and nervously evasive exchanges, Abigail became his chief and, in most respects, his sole collaborator. One reason Adams fled from Philadelphia for nine months each year, apart from the oppressive summer heat, the annual yellow fever epidemics, and the fact he despised his job, was that he needed to be with her. Ironically, we can only know what they were saying to each other while together from the letters they wrote when apart. During the months Congress was in session, they wrote each other two or three times every week. Much of the correspondence was playfully personal. No man, even if he is sixty years of age, ought to have more than three months at a time from his family, Abigail complained soon after he departed for Philadelphia. Oh, that I had a bosom to lean my head upon, Adams replied. But how dare you hint or lisp a word about sixty years of age? If I were near, I would soon convince you that I am not above forty. Just as often, however, Adams also used the correspondence to unburden himself of opinions that his muzzled status in the Senate prevented him from sharing publicly. The quality of oratory in the Senate, he complained, was far below the standards of the Continental Congress though he was intrigued by the fluid, nonchalant style of Aaron Burr, whom he described as fat as a duck and as ruddy as a roost cock. He was lonely for his wife's company and political advice. I want to sit and converse with you about our debates every evening. I sit here alone and brood over political probabilities and conjectures. Abigail heard him out about the doomed course of the French Revolution, but was somewhat more sanguine. I ruminate upon France as I lie awake many hours before light, she wrote, 
My present thought is that their virtuous army will give them a government in time in spite of all their conventions, but of what nature it will be, it is hard to say. Abigail responded harshly to Republican critics of Jay's treaty, calling them mindless Jacobins and party creatures. Adams concurred, though he also thought the affection for England that the ultras or high Federalists seemed to harbor was just as misguided as the Republican love affair with France. I wish that misfortune and adversity could soften the temper and humiliate the insolence of John Bull, but he is not yet sufficiently humble. If I mistake not, it is the destiny of America one day to beat down his pride. But the irksome task will not soon, I hope, be forced upon us. Like Washington, he saw Jay's treaty as a shrewd, if bittersweet, bargain designed to postpone war with England for perhaps a generation. In the meantime, he hoped that England and France would bleed each other to death. As for George III, the mad idiot will never recover. But as in the old revolutionary days, his idiocy is our salvation. When Adams offered a harsh appraisal of Washington's lack of formal education and knowledge of the classics, Abigail chided him. Washington was the only man apart from her husband capable of detachment, and ought not be carped at behind his back. If anyone else had corrected him so directly, Adams would have gone into his Vesuvial mode. Coming from Abigail, however, the political advice was welcomed. Send more, Adams pleaded. There is more good thoughts, fine strokes, and mother wit in them than I hear in the Senate in the whole week. Abigail dismissed such praise as pure flattery. What a jumble are my letters, politics, domestic occurrences, farming anecdotes. Pray light your cigars with them. Instead, he savored and saved them all. Then there was the touchy question of the presidency. At some unspoken level, Adams knew, which meant that Abigail also knew, that he considered the office his revolutionary right. No one else, save perhaps Jefferson, could match his record of service to the cause of independence. Why else had he been willing to languish in the shadow of the vice presidency for those godforsaken years, if not to use it as a stepping stone to the prize itself? Like Jefferson, indeed like any self-respecting statesman of the era, save perhaps Burr, Adams had no intention of campaigning for the office. Burr did and acted on it. I am determined to be a silent spectator of the silly and wicked game, Adams explained to Abigail, and to enjoy it as a comedy, a farce, or as a gymnastic exhibition at Sadler's Wells. Then he added a candid afterthought. Yet I don't know how I should live without it. That was the Adams pattern. First, to deny his political ambitions, much like Jefferson. Then, to confront them, feel guilty about them, fidget over them. Then, grudgingly admit they were part of who he was. Washington's successor would inherit a devilish load and be very apt to stagger and stumble. Who, in his right mind, would want the job? Moreover, he wasn't cut out for all the ceremonial obligations. I hate speeches, messages, addresses and answers, proclamations, and such affected studied contraband things, he wrote sulkily to Abigail. I hate levees and drawing rooms. I hate to speak to a thousand people to whom I have nothing to say. Then, again, the revealing afterthought. Yet all this I can do. Abigail aligned her responses to fit alongside her husband's own internal odyssey toward the inevitable. Yes, the presidency was a thankless job, a most unpleasant seat, full of thorns, briars, thistles, murmuring, fault-finding, calumny, obloquy. But, her version of the Adam's internal ricochet, the hand of providence ought to be attended to, and what is designed, cheerfully submitted to. Did this mean she could live with his candidacy and would consent to live with him if he won the election? Abigail refused to answer that question until the late winter of 1796. My ambition leads me not to be first in Rome, she observed somewhat coyly. Her only political ambition was to reign in the heart of my husband. That is my throne, and there I aspire to be absolute. On the other hand, if he was elected to the presidency, it would be a flattering and glorious reward for his lifetime of public service 
and he would obviously need a wife to hover about you, to bind up your temples, to mix your bark and pour out your coffee. Adams was ecstatic. Hi, ho, oh dear, I am most tenderly your forever friend. With her at his side, he had no real need for a cabinet. Now that his personal demons were out in the open and Abigail was on board, the collaboration moved into high gear. In March and April of 1796, the Adams team began to assess electoral projections on a state-by-state -state basis. He worried that New England might not rally to his candidacy. She was confident it would go solidly for him. She was right. Reports from New York and Pennsylvania suggested a strong surge for Jefferson, who was clearly the main threat. Adams foresaw a very close electoral vote, perhaps even a tie with Jefferson, which would then throw the election into the House of Representatives. Or suppose Jefferson finished a close second and therefore became vice president. Until passage of the Twelfth Amendment, electors voted for two candidates, not one ticket of two. Might this not create a dangerous crisis in public affairs by placing the president and vice president in opposite boxes? Abigail thought such speculations were too hypothetical to worry about. Here, events proved her wrong. Moreover, she still had a soft spot in her heart for Jefferson and believed him fully capable of joining the Adams team. Though wrong in politics, though formerly an advocate of Tom Paine's rights of man, and though frequently mistaken in men and measures, I do not think him an insincere or corruptible man. And all this fretful conjuring about prospective mishaps and crises, she scolded, was unbecoming a man who would be first magistrate of the nation. In a recent dream, Abigail reported, she was riding in a coach when suddenly several large cannonballs were flying toward her. All burst in the air before reaching her coach, the pieces of metal falling harmlessly in the middle distance. This was a clear sign. Stop worrying. The voters and the gods were on their side. Events proved Abigail half right. The electoral vote split along sectional lines, Adams carrying New England and Jefferson the South. As the results trickled in from different states in December, Adams threw several tantrums that required Abigail to nurse him back to composure. The Federalist ticket featured Adams and Thomas Pinckney of South Carolina as a tandem. Behind-the-scenes maneuverings by Hamilton threatened to propel Pinckney past Adams, though Hamilton claimed that his chief goal was to knock Jefferson out altogether. For a while, when it appeared that Pinckney might actually win and Adams come in second, the sage of Quincy exploded. Pinckney was a nobody. The humiliation of serving under him was more than he could bear. He would resign the vice presidency if he finished in second place. On December 30th, however, when results from Virginia and South Carolina revealed that Adams had captured one electoral vote in each of these southern states, Adams ceased erupting and started celebrating. John Adams never felt more serene in his life, he wrote Abigail. It was a razor-thin victory, but he had prevailed over Jefferson 71 to 68, with Pinckney a close third and Burr, Jefferson's running mate, far back in the pack. Jefferson's posture throughout the drawn-out counting of the electoral votes remained a combination of studied indifference and calculated obliviousness. Quite obviously, he realized he was a candidate. Madison was relaying state-by-state -state assessments to Monticello, which were also being reported in the local press. Although Jefferson claimed to be too busy with his renovations at Monticello and his crop rotation scheme to notice such things, some hidden portion of his mind was surely paying close attention, since he predicted that Adams would win by three electoral votes, the precise result, two months before it became official. On December 28th, he wrote a congratulatory letter to Adams, regretting the various little incidents that have happened or been contrived to separate us, and disavowing any desire to have been thrust into the presidential election in the first place. I have no ambition to govern men, he explained. It is a painful and thankless task. 
He also went out of his way to squelch rumors that he might resent serving under his old friend and more recent opponent. I can particularly have no feelings which would revolt at a secondary position to Mr. Adams. I am his junior in life, was his junior in Congress, his junior in the diplomatic line, his junior lately in our civil government. Up in Quincy, Abigail reiterated her abiding sense that Jefferson could be trusted to recover his earlier intimacy with her husband. You know, she confided to Adams, my friendship for that gentleman has lived through his faults and errors, to which I have not been blind. I believe he remains our friend. Over the course of the next few weeks, Adams and Jefferson developed two equally cogent but wholly incompatible political strategies in response to their somewhat awkward reunion as a political pair. Both strategies began with the realistic recognition that whoever succeeded Washington as president was likely to face massive problems. In part because of the deep political divisions over foreign policy that had haunted his second term. Mostly because Washington was destiny's choice as the greatest American of the age, and therefore inherently irreplaceable. From that common starting point, they then devised diametrically different courses of action. The core feature of the Adams strategy was to bring Jefferson into his confidence and his counsels. In effect, to create a bipartisan administration in which Jefferson enjoyed the kind of access and influence that Adams himself had been denied as vice president in the Washington administration. Adams began to leak his thoughts along these lines in private conversations that he knew would find their way back to Jefferson. And they did. My friends inform me that Mr. A. speaks of me with great friendship, Jefferson observed, and with satisfaction in the prospect of administering the government in concurrence with me. Adams was suggesting that the old collaboration of 1776 be recovered and revived. If no single leader could hope to fill the huge vacuum created by Washington's departure, perhaps the reconstituted team of Adams and Jefferson which had performed so brilliantly in previous political assignments, might enjoy at least a fighting chance of sustaining the legacy of national leadership that Washington had established. Abigail supported the initiative. Indeed, it might very well have been her idea in the first place, convinced as she was that the political split between Jefferson and her husband hadn't destroyed the mutual affection and trust that had built up over the previous twenty years of friendship. Trust was crucial. On almost all the disputes over domestic and foreign policy in the 1790s, Adams and Jefferson had found themselves on different sides. And each man had made brutally harsh assessments of the other, rooted in their quite different convictions about the proper course the American Revolution should take. Adams was distinctive, however, for his tendency to regard even serious political and ideological differences as eminently negotiable once elemental bonds of personal trust and affection were established. In the Adams scheme, intimacy trumped ideology. Several of Adams's closest friends, Samuel Adams, Elbridge Gerry, Benjamin Rush, Mercy Otis Warren, were ardent Republicans but still retained his confidence. He was especially predisposed to forgive or ignore political differences when the other person had been one of the band of brothers in 1776. He harbored, as Fisher Ames described it, a strong revolutionary taint in his mind, and admires the character, principles, and means which that revolutionary system seems to legitimate, and holds cheap any reputation that was not then founded and topped off. By this standard, Jefferson was a more reliable colleague than staunch Federalists who had been reluctant or merely peripheral participants in the climactic phase of the revolutionary drama. His, Jefferson's talents, I know very well, Adams wrote to Gary in a letter he knew would find its way to Monticello, and have ever believed in his honor, integrity, his love of country, and his friends. Because nothing like the full-blooded machinery of a modern political party system existed— Adams conveyed his tentative scheme for a bipartisan initiative informally through letters and conversations sure to be picked up by the press. That was how Jefferson learned that Adams was contemplating a truly bold response to the most glaring problem facing his presidency. Namely, to send a delegation to France analogous to Jay's mission to England, 
this time to negotiate a treaty designed to avert war with the other great European power. What's more, Adams let it be known that he was considering either Jefferson or Madison to head the delegation, in effect including the leadership of the Republican Party in the shaping of foreign policy. When Madison got wind of this rumor, he couldn't believe it. It has got into the newspapers that an envoy extraordinary was to go to France, he wrote to Jefferson, and that I was to be that person. I have no reason to suppose a shadow of truth in the former part of the story, and the latter is pure fiction. But the rumor was true. Abigail endorsed the initiative. Again, the idea might have originated with her, though the communication within the Adams marriage was so seamless and overlapping that primacy is impossible to fix. When the trial balloon floated past several dedicated Federalists, they couldn't believe it either, since it seemed to them like willfully dragging the Trojan horse into the Federalist fortress. Adams heard about the Federalist reaction and told Abigail that if it persisted he would threaten to resign the office and let Jefferson lead them to peace, wealth, and power if he will. He was sure, in any event, that a bipartisan effort maximized the prospects for a truly neutral American foreign policy, which was what Washington had attempted and the vast majority of Americans wanted. We will have neither John Bull nor Louis Baboon, he joked to Abigail. His response to those partisans of both parties who disagreed was one defiant word. Silence. Jefferson was the master of silence, especially when he disagreed. But the early letters and leaks out of Monticello indicated that he was in fact disposed to agree and consider a bipartisan political alliance grounded in the personal trust of the once great collaboration. He reiterated his claim, simultaneously sincere and misleading, that he had been embarrassed to learn that he had become a candidate for the presidency. I never in my life exchanged a word with any person on the subject, he noted, till I found my name brought forward generally in competition with that of Mr. Adams. In fact, he claimed to feel quite awkward being pitted against a man whom he regarded much like an older brother, and one with a superior claim to the office based on seniority and experience. Few will believe the true dispositions of my mind, he told his son-in-law. It is not the less true, however, that I do sincerely wish to be second on the vote rather than first. When a dispute over the electoral vote in Vermont threatened to produce a tie in the final tally and throw the election into the House of Representatives, Jefferson let out the word that he would defer to Adams so as to prevent the phenomenon of a pseudo-president at so early a day. His posture seemed the model of graciousness and elegant accommodation. This was not a mere facade, but it was only the top layer of Jefferson's thinking. A level below the surface, he, much like Adams, was preoccupied with the long shadow of George Washington. Mixing his metaphors in uncharacteristic fashion, he confided to Madison his deeper reasons for embracing the Adams victory. The president, Washington, is fortunate to get off just as the bubble is bursting, leaving others to hold the bag. Yet, as his departure will mark the moment when the difficulties begin to work, you will see that they will be ascribed to the new administration, and that he will have his usual good fortune of repaying credit from the good acts of others, and leaving to them that of others. He was certain that no man will bring out of that office the reputation which carries him into it. While strolling around the grounds of Monticello with a French visitor, he expanded on his strategic sense of the intractable political realities. In the present situation of the United States, divided as they are between two parties which mutually accuse each other of perfidy and treason, this exalted station, the presidency, is surrounded with dangerous rocks, and the most eminent abilities will not be sufficient to steer clear of them all. Whereas Washington had been able to levitate above the partisan factions, the next president of the United States will only be the president of a party. There was no safe middle ground, only a no-man's land, destined to be raked by the crossfire from both sides. From Jefferson's perspective, then, Adams was essentially proposing that the two men join forces and stand back-to-back -back in the killing zone. To his credit, 
Jefferson's first instinct was to accept the invitation. After congratulating Adams on his electoral triumph, assuring him that I never one single moment expected a different issue, Jefferson warned him of the partisan bickering that his administration would have to negotiate. Since the days on which you signed the Treaty of Paris, Jefferson noted ominously, our horizon was never so overcast. He would be pleased and honored, however, to play a constructive role in moving the nation past this difficult moment and to recover the old patriot spirit of 76, when we were working for our independence. He closed with a vague promise to renew the old partnership. Adams would have been overjoyed to receive such a message, Given the stilted language of their most recent and rather contrived correspondence, it seemed to meet him more than halfway. But the letter was never sent. Instead, Jefferson decided to pass it to Madison in order to assure its propriety. Madison produced six reasons why Jefferson's gesture of support might create unacceptable political risks. The last, and most significant, was the clincher. Considering the probability that Mr. A's course of administration may force an opposition to it from the Republican quarter, and the general uncertainty of the posture our affairs may take, there may be real embarrassments from giving written possession to him of the degree of compliment and confidence which your personal delicacy and friendship have suggested. In short, Jefferson must choose between his affection for Adams, which was palpable and widely known, and his leadership of the Republican Party. If registering a nostalgic sentiment of affinity was Jefferson's main intention, Madison suggested that could be done by leaking part of the message to mutual friends. In fact, Madison had already handled that piece of diplomacy by sending such words to Benjamin Rush, who would presumably pass them along to Adams and did. But Jefferson must not permit himself to be drawn into the policy-making process of the Adams administration, lest it compromise his role as leader of the Republican opposition. When Madison offered tactical advice of this sort, Jefferson almost always listened. Nevertheless, he wanted Madison to know that it came at a price. Mr. A. and myself were cordial friends from the beginning of the Revolution, he explained. The deviation from that line of politics on which we had been united has not made me less sensible of the rectitude of his heart, and I wished him to know this. That said, and duly recorded on one portion of his soul, Jefferson concurred that a diplomatic leak of that message satisfied his conscience. As to my participating in the administration, Jefferson then observed, if by that he meant the executive cabinet, both duty and inclination will shut that door to me. By duty, Jefferson meant his obligation to orchestrate the opposition to Adams's presidency. By inclination, he meant his personal aversion to the kind of controversy and policy debate inside the cabinet that Adams seemed to be proposing. I cannot have a wish, Jefferson concluded, to descend daily into the arena like a gladiator to suffer martyrdom in every conflict. Instead of acknowledging that he was choosing loyalty to party over loyalty to Adams, for Jefferson ideology was trumping intimacy, he preferred to cast his decision in personal terms. He simply didn't have the stomach or the stamina to argue the Republican agenda from inside the tent. Though psychologically incapable of seeing himself as a party leader, in truth that was what he had become. It was a personally poignant and politically fateful decision. Adams did not know about it for several weeks. The reports he was receiving from mutual friends emphasized Jefferson's generosity of spirit in defeat. This sounded hopeful. Abigail remained confident that Jefferson could be trusted, that the bipartisan direction was the proper course, and the inclusion of a prominent Republican on the peace delegation to France, probably Madison, was a shrewd move. On the other hand, the Federalists whom Adams chose for his cabinet, he retained Washington's advisers, his biggest blunder, had threatened to resign en masse if Adams tried to implement his bipartisan strategy. In retrospect, this would have been the best thing that could have happened to Adams. How the incoming president would have resolved this impasse if Jefferson had agreed to resume the collaboration is impossible to know. 
As it was, events played out in a rather dramatic face-to-face -face encounter. On March 6, 1797, Adams and Jefferson dined with Washington at the presidential mansion in Philadelphia. Adams learned that Jefferson was unwilling to join the cabinet, and that neither Jefferson nor Madison was willing to be part of the peace delegation to France. Jefferson learned that Adams had been battling his Federalist advisers who opposed a vigorous Jeffersonian presence in the administration. They left the dinner together and walked down Market Street to Fifth, two blocks from the very spot where Jefferson had drafted the words of the Declaration of Independence that Adams had so forcefully defended before the Continental Congress almost 21 years earlier. As Jefferson remembered it later, we took leave, and he never after that said one word to me on the subject, or ever consulted me as to any measure of the government. But of course, Jefferson himself had already decided that he preferred the anomalous role of opposing the administration in which he officially served. A few days later, at his swearing-in ceremony as vice president, Jefferson joked about his rusty recall of parliamentary procedure, a clear sign that he intended to spend his time in the harmless business of monitoring debates in the Senate. After Adams was sworn in as president on March 13th, he reported to Abigail that Washington had murmured under his breath, Aye, I am fairly out and you fairly in. See which of us will be happiest. Predictably, the sight of Washington leaving office attracted the bulk of the commentary in the press. Adams informed Abigail that it was like the sun setting full orbit and another rising, though less splendidly. Observers with a keener historic sense noticed that the first transfer of power at the executive level had gone smoothly, almost routinely. Jefferson was on the road back to Monticello immediately after the inaugural ceremony, setting up the Republican government in exile, waiting for the inevitable catastrophes to befall the presidency of his old friend. As for Adams himself, without Jefferson as a colleague, with a Federalist cabinet filled with men loyal to Hamilton, he was left alone with Abigail, the only collaborator he could truly trust. His call to her mixed abiding love with a sense of desperation. I never wanted your advice and assistance more in my life, he pleaded. The times are critical and dangerous, and I must have you here to assist me. You must leave the farm to the mercy of the winds. I can do nothing without you. This ends Disc 8. Founding Brothers, Disc 9. Looking back over the full sweep of American history, one would be hard-pressed to discover a presidency more dominated by a single foreign policy problem and simultaneously more divided domestically over how to solve it. The Adams presidency, in fact, might be the classic example of the historical truism that inherited circumstances define the parameters within which presidential leadership takes shape, that history shapes presidents rather than vice versa. With all the advantages of hindsight, Jefferson's strategic assessment of 1796 appears more and more prescient. Whoever followed Washington was probably doomed to failure. Beyond the daunting task of following the greatest hero in American history, Adams faced a double dilemma. On the one hand, the country was already waging an undeclared war against French privateers in the Atlantic and Caribbean. The salient policy question was clear. Should the United States declare war on France or seek a diplomatic solution? Adams chose the latter course. Like Washington, he was committed to American neutrality at almost any cost. He coupled this commitment with a build-up of the Navy, which would enable the United States to fight a defensive war if negotiations with France broke down. In retrospect, this was the proper and indeed the only realistic policy. But successful negotiations required a French government sufficiently stable and adequately impressed with American power to bargain seriously. Neither of these conditions was present during Adams's term as president. Until the emergence of Napoleon as dictator, the French government, eventually called the Directory, 
was a misnamed coalition of ever-shifting political factions inherently incapable of either coherence or direction. What's more, from the French perspective, and the same could be said about the English perspective as well, the infant American Republic was at most a minor distraction, more often an utter irrelevancy, within the larger Anglo-French competition for primacy on the continent. In short, at the international level, the fundamental conditions essential for resolving the central problem of the Adams presidency did not exist. The problem was inherently insoluble. On the other hand, and to make a bad situation even worse, the ongoing debate between Federalists and Republicans had degenerated into ideological warfare. Each side sincerely saw the other as traitors to the core principles of the American Revolution. The political consensus that had held together during Washington's first term and had then begun to fragment into Federalist and Republican camps over the Whiskey Rebellion and Jay's Treaty broke down completely in 1797. Jefferson spoke for many of the participants caught up in this intensely partisan and nearly scatological political culture when he described it as a fundamental loss of trust between former friends. Men who have been intimate all their lives, he observed, cross the street to avoid meeting, and turn their heads another way, lest they should be obliged to touch hats. He first used the phrase, a wall of separation, which would later become famous as his description of the proper relation between church and state. Here, however, describing the political and ideological division between Federalists and Republicans. Politics and party hatreds destroy the happiness of every being here, he reported to his daughter. They seem like salamanders to consider fire as their element. Jefferson's interpretation of the escalating party warfare was richly ironic, since he had contributed to the breakdown of personal trust, and the complete disavowal of bipartisan cooperation by rejecting Adams's offer to renew the old partnership. But Jefferson was fairly typical in this regard, lamenting the chasm between long-standing colleagues while building up the barricades from his side of the divide. Federalists and Republicans alike accused their opponents of narrow-minded partisanship, never conceding or apparently even realizing that their own behavior also fit the party label they affixed to their enemies. The very idea of a legitimate opposition did not yet exist in the political culture of the 1790s, and the evolution of political parties was proceeding in an environment that continued to regard the word party as an epithet. In effect, the leadership of the revolutionary generation lacked a vocabulary adequate to describe the politics they were inventing. And the language they inherited framed the genuine political differences and divisions in terms that only exacerbated their non-negotiable character. Much like Jefferson, Adams regarded the impasse as a breakdown of mutual trust. "'You can witness for me,' he wrote to John Quincy concerning Jefferson's opposition." How loath I have been to give him up! It is with much reluctance that I am obliged to look upon him as a man whose mind is warped by prejudice. However wise and scientific as a philosopher, as a politician he is a child and the dupe of the party. At the domestic level, then, Adams inherited a supercharged political atmosphere every bit as ominous and intractable as the tangle on the international scene. It was a truly unprecedented situation in several senses. His vice president was in fact the leader of the opposition party. His cabinet was loyal to the memory of Washington, which several members regarded as embodied now in the person of Alexander Hamilton, who was officially retired from the government altogether. Political parties were congealing into doctrinaire ideological camps, but neither side possessed the verbal or mental capacity to regard the other as anything but treasonable. And finally, the core conviction of the entire experiment in Republican government, namely that all domestic and foreign policies derived their authority from public opinion, conferred a novel level of influence to the press, which had yet to develop any established rules of conduct or standards for distinguishing rumors from reliable reporting. 
It was a recipe for political chaos that even the indomitable Washington would have been hard-pressed to control. No one else, including Adams, stood much of a chance at all. If hindsight permits this realistic rendering of the historical conditions, which in turn defined the limited parameters within which the policies of the Adams presidency took shape, it also requires us to notice that none of the major players possessed the kind of clairvoyance required to comprehend what history had in store for them. They believed they were making history, not the other way around. In effect, the political institutions and the very authority of the federal government were too new and ill-formed to cope effectively with the foreign and domestic challenges facing the new nation. What happened as a result was highly improvisational and deeply personal. Adams virtually ignored his cabinet, most of whom were more loyal to Hamilton anyway, and fell back to his family for advice, which in practice made Abigail his unofficial one-woman staff. Jefferson resumed his partnership with Madison, the roles now reversed, with Jefferson assuming active command of the Republican opposition from the seat of government in Philadelphia, and Madison dispensing his political wisdom from retirement at Montpelier. While the official center of government remained in the executive and congressional offices at Philadelphia, the truly effective centers of power were located in two political partnerships based on personal trust. Having failed to revive the great collaboration of the Revolutionary Era, Adams and Jefferson went their separate ways with different intimates. There was an almost tribal character to the Adams collaboration. Adams himself, while vastly experienced as a statesman and diplomat, had no experience whatsoever as an executive. He had never served as a governor, as Jefferson had, or as a military commander, as Washington had. And he regarded the role of party leader of the Federalists as not just unbecoming but utterly incompatible with his responsibilities as president, which were to transcend party squabbles in the Washington mode and reach decisions like a patriot king whose sole concern was the long-term public interest. As a result, the notion that he was supposed to manage the political factions in the Congress or in his cabinet never even occurred to him. Instead, he would rely on his own judgment and on the advice of his family and trusted friends. This explains two of his earliest and most controversial decisions. First, he insisted on including Elbridge Gerry in the peace delegations to France. Gerry was a kind of New England version of Benjamin Rush, a lovable gadfly with close personal ties to the Adams family, but with ideological convictions that floated in unpredictable patterns over the entire political landscape. The most recent breezes had carried him into the Republican camp as a staunch defender of the French Revolution, which was the chief reason Abigail thought that Gary had a kink in his head. Adams himself warned Gary not to confuse what was happening in France with the American Revolution. The French are no more capable of a republican government, he insisted, than a snowball can exist a whole week in the streets of Philadelphia under a burning sun. Despite Abigail's reservations, Adams wanted Gary on the peace delegation to demonstrate his bipartisan principles, and also to assure that he would receive candid reports from a trusted friend. Second, he appointed John Quincy as American minister to Prussia. His son objected, protesting that the appointment would surely be criticized as an act of nepotism and would fuel charges that Adams was grooming an heir for the presidency. "'Your reasons will not bear examination,' Adams retorted. "'It is the worst founded opinion I ever knew you to conceive.' This was vintage Adams' bravado, shouting his denial at political advice he knew to be sound, refusing to listen because it was patently political and merely self-protective." Mostly, he wanted John Quincy located in one of the diplomatic capitals of Europe as his own personal listening post. I wish you to continue your practice of writing freely to me, he wrote, then added, and more cautiously to the office of state. He would be his own secretary of state, and trust his son's quite impressive knowledge of European affairs more than official reports. 
Both of these decisions paid dividends the following year. When the prospects for an outright declaration of war against France looked virtually certain, the ever agile and forever unscrupulous Talleyrand, foreign minister of France, had refused to receive the American peace delegation, and had then sent three of his operatives to demand a bribe of fifty thousand pounds sterling as the prerequisite for any further negotiations. When Adams received word of this outrageous ultimatum, he ordered the delegation to return home. But he also withheld the official dispatches describing the bribery scheme from the Congress and the public. Abigail described this decision as a very painful thing, because the president could not play his strongest card. But Adams knew that popular reaction to what became known as the X Y Z affair after the three French operatives would be virulently patriotic and intensely belligerent. By delaying publication of the dispatches, he bought time. And during that time, Gary, always the maverick, had opted to remain in Paris to confer unofficially with French diplomats about averting the looming war. His reports home counseled patience, based on the growing recognition within the Directory that the bribery demand had been a terrible miscalculation. John Quincy's network of European sources also urged enlightened procrastination. Despite considerable pressure from the Federalists in Congress and mounting war fever in the wake of the X Y Z revelations, Adams held out hope for reconciliation based primarily on these reports. Abigail was his chief domestic minister without portfolio. In a very real sense, Adams didn't have a domestic policy. Indeed, believed that paying any attention to the shifting currents of public opinion and the raging party battles in the press. Violated his proper posture as president, which was to remain oblivious to such swings in the national mood. Abigail tended to reinforce this belief in executive independence. Jefferson, she explained, was like a willow who bent with every political breeze. Her husband, on the other hand, was like an oak. He may be torn up by the roots; he may break, but he will never bend. Nevertheless, she followed the highly partisan exchanges in the Republican newspapers and provided her husband with regular reports on the machinations and accusations of the opposition. When an editorial in the Aurora described Adams as old, garrulous, bald, blind, and crippled, she joked that she alone possessed the intimate knowledge to testify about his physical condition. Popular reaction to the X Y Z affair. Generated a surge of hostility toward French supporters in America, and Abigail noted with pleasure the appearance of William Cobbett's anti-Jefferson editorials in Porcupine's Gazette, where Jefferson was described as head of the Frenchified faction in this country, and a leading member of the American Directory. She relished reporting the Fourth of July toast: "John Adams, may he like Samson slay thousands of Frenchmen with the jawbone of Jefferson." She passed along gossip circulating in the streets of Philadelphia about plans to mount pro-French demonstrations, allegedly orchestrated by the grandest of all grand villains, that traitor to his country, the infernal scoundrel Jefferson. She predicted that the Republican leaders will take ultimately a station in the public's estimation like that of the Tories in our Revolution. Although we can never know for sure. There is considerable evidence that Abigail played a decisive role in persuading Adams to support passage of those four pieces of legislation known collectively as the Alien and Sedition Acts. These infamous statutes, unquestionably the biggest blunder of his presidency, were designed to deport or disenfranchise foreign-born residents, mostly Frenchmen, who were disposed to support the Republican Party. And to make it a crime to publish any false, scandalous, and malicious writing or writings against the government of the United States, Adams went to his grave claiming that these laws never enjoyed his support, that their chief sponsors were Federalist extremists in the Congress, and that he had signed them grudgingly and reluctantly. All this was true enough, but sign them he did. Despite his own reservations and against the advice of moderate Federalists like John Marshall, even Hamilton, who eventually went along too, was at best lukewarm and fearful of the precedent set by the Sedition Act. 
Abigail, on the other hand, felt no compunctions. Nothing will have an effect until Congress passes a sedition bill, she wrote her sister in the spring of 1798, which would then permit the wrath of the public to fall upon the Republican editor's devoted heads. In any other country, Bache and all his papers would have been seized long ago. Her love for her husband and her protective sense as chief guardian of his presidency pushed her beyond any doubts. She even urged that the Alien Act be used to remove Albert Gallatin, the Swiss-born leader of the Republican Party in the House of Representatives. Gallatin, she observed, that specious, subtle, spare Cassius, that imported foreigner, was guilty of treasonable behavior by delivering speeches or introducing amendments that obstruct their cause and prevent their reaching their goals. Gallatin, along with all the henchmen in the Jefferson camp, should be regarded as traitors to their country. Ultimately, of course, Adams himself must bear the responsibility for signing into law the blatantly partisan legislation that has subsequently haunted his historic reputation. But if, as he forever insisted, the Alien and Sedition Acts never enjoyed his enthusiastic support, Abigail's unequivocal endorsement of the legislation almost surely tilted the decision toward the affirmative. To put it somewhat differently, if she had been opposed, it's difficult to imagine Adams taking the action he did. It is the one instance when the commingling of their convictions and the very intimacy of their partnership led him astray. Ironically, the most significant, and in the long run most successful, decision of the Adams presidency occurred when Abigail was recovering from a bout with rheumatic fever back in Quincy, and the Federalists who opposed the policy attributed it to her absence. This was Adams's apparently impulsive decision, announced on February 18, 1799, to send another peace delegation to France. Theodore Sedgwick, a Federalist leader in the Congress, claimed to be thunderstruck and summed up the reaction of his Federalist colleagues. Had the foulest heart and the ablest head in the world been permitted to select the most ruinous measure, perhaps it would have been precisely the one which had been adopted. Timothy Pickering, the disloyal Secretary of State whom Adams had come to despise, also described himself as thunderstruck and offered a perceptive reading of Adams's motives. It was done without any consultation with any member of the government and for a reason truly remarkable, because he knew we should all be opposed to the measure. Abigail herself reported that all the bedrock Federalist enclaves of New England were taken by surprise. The whole community were like a flock of frightened pigeons. Nobody had their story ready. The stories circulating in the Philadelphia press suggested that Adams had acted impulsively because his politically savvy wife had not been available to talk him out of it. For the preceding two months he had, in fact, complained in public and private that he was no good as a solitudinarian, and that he wanted my talkative wife. Abigail had noted an editorial in Porcupine's Gazette regretting her absence. I suppose, she wrote her husband, they will want somebody to keep you warm. The announcement of the new peace initiative then gave added credibility to the charge that, without Abigail, Adams had lost either his balance or his mind. Adams joked about these stories. They ought to gratify your vanity, he wrote Abigail, enough to cure you and bring you here. For her part, Abigail returned the joke, but with a clear signal of support. This was pretty saucy, but the old woman can tell them they are mistaken, for she considers the measure a master stroke of policy. This has pretty much been the verdict of history. For the delegation Adams appointed eventually negotiated a diplomatic end to the quasi-war with France. Adams's decision became the first substantive implementation of Washington's message in the farewell address, as well as a precedent for American isolation from European wars, one that would influence American foreign policy for over a century. In the immediate context of the party wars then raging, however, Adams's unilateral action was politically suicidal. He has sustained the whole force of an unpopular measure, Abigail observed, 
which he knew would shower down upon his head a torrent of invective. As he expected, he has been abused and calumniated by his enemies, that was to be looked for, but in the house of his friends they have joined loudest in the clamor. What Abigail meant was that Adams had chosen to alienate himself from the mainstream of the Federalist Party, which regarded his policy as pro-French. Indeed, just the kind of decision one might have expected from Jefferson and the Republicans. The editorials in Porcupine's Gazette turned against him. Federalist gossip suggested that their erstwhile leader was mentally unbalanced. Adams, feeling his oats, wrote Abigail that he might now use the Sedition Act to shut down the Federalist press. He was the archetypal illustration of the president without a party. Why did he do it? Three overlapping reasons appear to have converged in Adams's mind and provided decisive direction to a foreign policy that until then had been vacillating between the incompatible agendas of the Federalists and the Republicans. First, his lingering suspicions of Hamilton developed into unbridled distrust and then outright personal hatred. For two years, Hamilton had been issuing directives to Adams's cabinet behind the scenes. Though Adams was vaguely aware of these machinations, he gave them little attention. After all, he never paid much heed to his cabinet anyway. In the summer of 1798, however, Hamilton persuaded his Federalist colleagues in the Congress to authorize the creation of a vastly expanded provisional army, subsequently called the New Army, of between 10,000 and 30,000 soldiers in preparation for the looming outbreak of war with France. Adams had always supported military preparations more as a diplomatic maneuver to impress the French government of American resolve. And he had strongly preferred a naval force, what he called floating batteries and wooden walls. Standing armies struck him as inherently dangerous and expensive items. Regiments are costly articles everywhere, he explained to his Secretary of War, and more so in this country than any other under the sun. What possible rationale could exist for a large American land force, since the conflict with France was occurring on the high seas? At present, he observed, there is no more prospect of seeing a French army here than there is in heaven. Then the whole horrid picture came into focus for Adams. Hamilton intended to make the new army his personal instrument of power. It was a foregone conclusion that Washington would be called out of retirement to head the force, but equally predictable that the aging general would delegate actual command to his former aide-de-camp. Adams suspected that Hamilton, whom he had formerly distrusted and now utterly loathed, saw himself as an American Napoleon, poised to declare martial law and present himself as the available savior. Abigail seconded the assessment, calling Hamilton a second Buonaparte, whose imperialistic designs could only be guessed at. If they had been able to read Hamilton's private correspondence, they would have discovered that his plans were quite grandiose. He hoped to march his conquering army through Virginia, where recalcitrant Republicans would be treated like the Whiskey Rebels, then down through the Louisiana Territory and into Mexico and Peru, liberating all the inhabitants from French and Spanish domination and offering membership in the expanded American Republic. Although Adams had gone along with the Alien and Sedition Acts, the prospect of a Hamilton-led army marching heaven knows where conjured up the demise of Republican government altogether in the classical last act, a military dictatorship. No one recognized this historical pattern more clearly than Adams. No one, not even Jefferson, hated Hamilton more than Adams. Abigail described the decision to resume negotiations with France as a masterstroke of policy, because it averted a French war and removed the rationale for Hamilton's army at one fell swoop. Second, the reports Adams was receiving from John Quincy in Prussia, based on his network of contacts in Paris and Amsterdam, provided fresh evidence that Talleyrand was now eager for peace with the United States. In January of 1799, Adams's second son, Thomas Boylston, returned from Europe with additional dispatches from John Quincy. 
indicating that Talleyrand would not only receive an American peace delegation, but would also be open to a consideration of compensation for American shipping losses over the past three years. However impulsive Adams's February decision might have appeared to outsiders, it was really the culmination of considerable deliberation. Based on diplomatic advice from his most trusted and strategically located confidant, who also happened to be his son. Third and finally, Adams derived deep personal satisfaction from singular acts of principle that defied the agendas of both political parties. The fact that the decision to send the delegation rendered him unpopular. That it struck most observers as an act of political suicide only confirmed for him that it must be right. The office of the presidency, as he saw it, was designed to levitate above the party squabbles and transcend partisan versions of the national interest. Even more palpably, the fullest expression of his best energies always occurred when the long-term public interest, as he understood it, clashed with the political imperatives of the moment. The trademark Adams style might be described as enlightened perversity, which actually sought out occasions to display, often in conspicuous fashion, his capacity for self-sacrifice. He had defended the British troops accused of the Boston Massacre, insisted upon American independence in the Continental Congress a full year before it was fashionable. Argued for a more exalted conception of the presidency, despite charges of monarchical tendencies, it was all part of the Adams pattern, an iconoclastic and contrarian temperament that relished alienation. John Quincy and then great grandson Henry Adams exhibited the same pattern over the next century, suggesting that the predilections resided in the bloodstream. The political conditions confronting the presidency in 1798 were tailor-made to call forth his excessive version of virtue. Though Abigail was with him all the way, for Adams himself, it was the supreme collaboration with his own private demons and doubts, his personal declaration of independence. All the domestic and international challenges facing the Adams presidency. Looked entirely different to Jefferson and Madison. Once they decided to reject Adams's overture and set themselves up as the leaders of the Republican opposition, they closed ranks around their own heartfelt convictions and interpreted the several crises confronting him as opportunities to undermine the Federalist Party, which they sincerely regarded as an organized conspiracy against the true meaning of the American Revolution. As to do nothing and to gain time is everything with us, Jefferson wrote to Madison. The very intractability of the French question and the sharp divisions within the Federalist camp between the Hamiltonians and what Jefferson called the Adamites worked to their political advantage. In order for the Republican agenda to win, the Federalist agenda needed to fail. Although Adams never fit comfortably into either party category, and eventually acted decisively to alienate himself from both sides, as the elected leader of the Federalists, he became the unavoidable target of the organized Republican opposition. Madison had never shared Jefferson's personal affection for Adams, so it was easier for him to take the lead in stigmatizing Adams's motives and character. There never was, perhaps, a greater contrast between two characters than between those of the present president and of his predecessor. The one cold, considerate, and cautious; the other headlong and kindled into flame by every spark that lights on his passions. The one ever scrutinizing into the public opinion and ready to follow where he could not lead it; the other insulting it by the most adverse sentiments and pursuits. Washington, a hero in the field, yet overweighing every danger in the cabinet; Adams, without a single pretension to the character of a soldier, a perfect Quixote as a statesman; the former chief magistrate pursuing peace everywhere with sincerity, though mistaking the means; the latter taking as much pains to get into war as the former took to keep out of it. The latter point became an article of faith within the Jefferson-Madison collaboration, namely. That Adams actually wanted war with France, he was declared Madison, 
the only obstacle to accommodation and the real cause of war if war takes place. Jefferson and Madison even managed to persuade themselves that Adams had concocted the entire XYZ affair to mobilize popular support for a declaration of war. Talleyrand, they told each other, was neither so stupid nor so dishonorable to attempt bribery of the American peace delegation. Adams had orchestrated a libel on the French government as part of his swindling experiment. Instead of regarding Adams's decision to delay release of the dispatches exposing the bribery demands as a prudent and statesmanlike effort to avoid a public outcry for war, Madison insisted it was timed to produce maximum damage. The credit given to Mr. Adams for a spirit of conciliation toward France is wonderful, Madison observed caustically, meaning that it was wholly undeserved. When Jefferson half-heartedly suggested that his old friend had once been a man of revolutionary principles, Madison retorted, Every answer he gives to his addresses unmasks more and more his true principles. The abolition of royalty was, it seems, not one of his revolutionary principles. Whether he always made this profession is best known to those who knew him in the year 1776. Jefferson, in effect, needed to liberate himself from nostalgic memories. Adams was a traitor. Although he certainly knew better, Jefferson went along. He reported gossip in the corridors of Congress to the effect that Adams had been heard to declare that such was his want of confidence in the faith of France that were they ever to agree to a treaty ever so favorable, he should think it his duty to reject it. Adams was, in fact, at that very moment listening to Gary's pleadings for a renewal of the peace effort. Another rumor circulating in the streets of Philadelphia caught Jefferson's ear. Washington had leaked the news that he opposed Adams's foreign policy. The exact opposite was true. Washington was endorsing the Adams Initiative as the effective implementation of his own long-standing commitment to American neutrality. Yet another rumor had it that Adams was working behind the scenes to scuttle the plans for moving the capital to the Potomac also untrue. And then, when the president announced his unexpected decision to send a new American peace delegation to France in February of 1799, Jefferson apprised Madison that this event of events had been forced upon Adams. Jefferson had reliable evidence that Talleyrand had threatened to leak news of his previous peace initiative, thereby requiring Adams to reciprocate. Mark that I state this as conjecture, Jefferson told Madison, but founded on workings and indications which have been under our eyes, all contrived. If the primary function of the collaboration within the Adams family was to insulate and eventually isolate Adams from the ideological warfare raging between both political parties, the primary function of the collaboration between Jefferson and Madison was to generate mutual reinforcement for their uncompromising assault on the presidency, frequently at the expense of even the most rudimentary version of factual accuracy. In their minds, the political stakes were enormous. The threat posed by the Federalists put the entire Republican experiment at risk. The battle was to the death, and taking prisoners was not permitted. They convinced themselves that Adams was the enemy. And then all the evidence fell in place around that rock-ribbed, if highly questionable, conviction. Jefferson's nearly Herculean powers of self-denial also helped keep the cause pure, at least in the privacy of his own mind. In 1798, he commissioned James Callender, a notorious scandal-monger who had recently broken the story on Hamilton's adulterous affair with Maria Reynolds, to write a libelous attack on Adams. In The Prospect Before Us, Callender delivered the goods, describing Adams as a hoary-headed incendiary who was equally determined on war with France and on declaring himself president for life, with John Quincy lurking in the background as his successor. When confronted with the charge that, despite his position as vice president, he had paid Callender to write diatribes against the president, Jefferson claimed to know nothing about it. Callender subsequently published Jefferson's incriminating letters, proving his complicity, 
and Jefferson seemed genuinely surprised at the revelation, suggesting that for him the deepest secrets were not the ones he kept from his enemies, but the ones he kept from himself. When Congress began the debates over the Sedition Act in the spring of 1798, Jefferson's first fear was that it was aimed pointedly at him. He complained to James Monroe that my name is running through all the city as detected in criminal correspondence with the French directory. Editorials in Federalist newspapers accused him of passing information to the French government through pro-French agents in America and meeting routinely with Benjamin Franklin Bache, editor of the Aurora, the chief vehicle for the opposition. Jefferson privately acknowledged to Madison that these accusations were essentially true. Even though he was the second-ranking member of the Adams administration, he was, as the Federalist leadership in the House described him, the very life and soul of the opposition. Jefferson defended himself by claiming that his consultations with Bache were not clandestine meetings. He had met with Bache many times, true enough, but he was not, as the Federalists charged, closeted with him. More basically, Jefferson simply didn't regard his behavior as seditious or treasonable. Indeed, it was the Federalist government, though duly elected, that was guilty of treason. Here was the core of the problem. Jefferson genuinely believed, and Madison reinforced the belief, that the Federalists had captured the government from the American people. Despite its electoral mandate, the programs and policies the Federalists were implementing at the national level, an expansive agenda for the federal government, a version of neutrality that aligned the United States more with England than France, represented a repudiation of the spirit of 76. The passage of the Alien and Sedition Acts, then the creation of the new army, only confirmed that the Federalist agenda violated the central tenets of the American Revolution. Conjuring up memories of Parliament's restrictions on the colonial press and British troops quartered in the major colonial cities. How could opposition to such measures be treasonable now when they had been the legitimate expressions of American dissent back then? The legal guidelines that might permit a clear answer to that question had not yet congealed. By modern standards, Jefferson's active role in promoting anti-Adams propaganda and his complicity in leaking information to pro-French enthusiasts like Bache were impeachable offenses that verged on treason. But then Hamilton had been guilty of similar indiscretions with pro-English advocates during the Jay's Treaty negotiations. And his conduct in providing clandestine instructions to Adams's cabinet undermined the constitutional authority of the executive branch in ways that would have landed him in jail in modern times. Only ten years after the passage and ratification of the Constitution, however, what were treasonable or seditious acts remained blurry and more problematic judgments without the historical sanction that only experience could provide. Lacking a consensus on what the American Revolution had intended and what the Constitution had settled, Federalists and Republicans alike were afloat in a sea of mutual accusations and partisan interpretations. The center could not hold because it did not exist. The capstone of the Jefferson-Madison collaboration occurred at this volatile political moment, namely their joint authorship of the Kentucky and Virginia Resolutions. Jefferson visited Madison at Montpelier on July 2nd and 3rd to discuss their response to the Sedition Act, which passed the Senate the following day. The Federalists, ironically, thought it was the perfect way to celebrate the 4th of July. They agreed to launch a pamphlet campaign against what Jefferson called the Reign of Witches. Working alone at Monticello, Jefferson composed what became known as the Kentucky Resolutions in August and September. His core argument was that the Sedition Act was unconstitutional because it violated the natural rights of the citizens of each state to control their own domestic affairs. Moreover, each state has a natural right in cases not within the compact, that is, in all cases not specified as under federal jurisdiction in the Constitution, to nullify of their own authority all assumptions of power by others within their limits. 
Here was the classic states' rights position, topped off by the sweeping claim that federal laws could be nullified by the states, which then had a legitimate right to secede, what Jefferson called scission, if the federal Congress or courts defied their decision. If the Sedition Act was a serious threat to civil liberties, Jefferson's response was an equally serious threat to the sovereignty of the national government and the survival of the Union. Fortunately for Jefferson, the leadership of the Kentucky legislature decided to delete the sections of his draft endorsing nullification, presumably because such open defiance of federal law seemed excessive and unnecessarily risky. Madison's more judicious arguments, published as the Virginia Resolutions, were circulating in the national press and achieving the same goal, condemning the Sedition Act, but without recourse to nullification. In fact, the Virginia Resolutions described the Alien and Sedition Acts as alarming infractions of the Constitution that violated the free speech guarantees of the First Amendment. Instead of challenging the authority of the federal government, Madison invoked the protections afforded by that very government, implicitly suggesting that the federal courts and not the individual states were the ultimate arbiters of the Constitution. Whereas Jefferson's line of thought led logically to the compact theory of the Constitution, eventually embraced by the Confederacy in 1861, Madison's arguments led toward the modern doctrine of judicial review, and constitutional guarantees for free speech and freedom of the press. When Madison wrote or spoke on constitutional questions, Jefferson always deferred. To Republican confidants in Virginia, he reiterated his conviction that the true principles of our federal compact left the states sovereign over all domestic policy. If Congress failed to rescind the Sedition Act, we should sever ourselves from that union we so much value rather than give up the rights of self-government which we have reserved. After a personal visit from Madison in September of 1799, however, Jefferson agreed to soften his stance on secession, not only in deference to his judgment, as he put it, but because we should never think of separation but for respected and enormous violations or, as he had previously written in the Declaration of Independence, after a long train of abuses. Madison's prudent and silent intervention rescued Jefferson from the secessionist implications of his revolutionary principles and artfully concealed the huge discrepancy between their respective views of the Constitution. The imperatives of their collaboration, plus the need to present a united front against the Federalists, took precedence over their incompatible notions of where sovereignty resided in the American Republic. There are only a few universal laws of political life, but one of them guided the Republicans during the last year of the Adams presidency. Namely, never interfere when your enemies are busily engaged in flagrant acts of self-destruction. As soon as the Federalists launched their prosecutions of Republican editors and writers under the Sedition Act, a total of 18 indictments were filed, it became clear that the prosecutions were generally regarded as persecutions. Most of the defendants became local heroes and public martyrs. Madison quickly concluded that our public malady may work its own cure meaning that the spectacle of Federalist lawyers descending upon the Republican opposition with such blatantly partisan accusations only served to create converts to the cause they were attempting to silence. The threatened prosecution of aliens also backfired on the Federalists, when Irish immigrants in New York and Germans in Pennsylvania, formerly staunch supporters of the Adams administration, went over to the Republicans in droves. What Jefferson had described as the reign of witches even began to assume the shape of a political comedy, in which the joke was on the Federalists. In New Jersey, for example, when a drunken Republican editor was charged with making a ribald reference to the president's posterior, the jury returned a not-guilty verdict, on the grounds that truth was a legitimate defense. There was even room for irony. It was while James Callender was serving his sentence for libel in a Richmond jail 
that he first heard rumors of Jefferson's sexual liaison with a mulatto slave named Sally Hemings. He subsequently published the story after deciding that Jefferson had failed to pay him adequately for his hatchet job on Adams. But this delectable morsel of scandal, which was only confirmed as correct beyond any reasonable doubt by DNA studies done in 1998, didn't arrive in time to help Adams in the presidential election of 1800. Indeed, Adams's string of bad luck, or poor timing, call it what you will, persisted to the end. The peace delegation he dispatched to France so single-handedly negotiated a treaty ending the quasi-war, but the good news arrived too late to influence the election. Moreover, the new army, which Adams had opposed and then rendered superfluous, had strained the federal budget to a point that demanded new sources of revenue. Even as the army was being disbanded, much to Adams's credit and relief, the cost of raising it landed on the voting public. Adams had somehow managed to miss the political rewards due him and catch the criticism that properly belonged to others. Abigail's earlier characterization of the Adams-Jefferson competition, the oak versus the willow, proved prophetic. Perhaps the supreme example of Jefferson's greater flexibility occurred on the foreign policy front. Throughout the Adams presidency, Jefferson and his Republican followers had been insisting that the French Revolution was the American Revolution on European soil, and that France was therefore America's major international ally. But when Napoleon overturned the French Republic and declared himself omnipotent military dictator, again, just as Adams had predicted would happen, Jefferson quickly shifted his position to accommodate the new reality. It is very material for the American people to be made sensible that their own character and situation are materially different from the French, he observed in 1800, and that whatever may be the fate of republicanism there, we are able to preserve it inviolate here. This was precisely the neutral foreign policy that both Washington and Adams had been urging for a decade, and that Jefferson had condemned as a betrayal of the spirit of 76. Jefferson's conversion occurred with such breathtaking speed that hardly anyone noticed how deftly he was discarding the chief weapon the Republicans had wielded against two Federalist administrations. That weapon was unnecessary now, as both Jefferson and Madison understood, because the superior organization of the Republicans at the state level virtually assured their victory in the looming presidential election. Given this formidable array of bad luck, poor timing, and the highly focused political strategy of his Republican enemies, Adams actually did surprisingly well when all the votes were counted. He ran ahead of the Federalist candidates for Congress who were swept from office in a Republican landslide. Outside of New York, he even won more electoral votes than he had in 1796. But thanks in great part to the deft political maneuverings of Aaron Burr, all 12 of New York's electoral votes went to Jefferson. As early as May of 1800, Abigail, the designated vote counter on the Adams team, had predicted that New York will be the balance in the scale, S-C-A-I-L-E, S-K-A-I-L-L, S-C-A-I-L-L. Is it right now? It does not look so. Though she did not know how to spell scale, she knew where the election would be decided. In the final tally, her husband lost to the tandem of Jefferson and Burr, 73 to 65. Though it probably occurred too late to have much, if any, bearing on the results, the most dramatic event of the campaign was provided by Hamilton. In October, he wrote and privately printed a 54-page pamphlet assailing the character of Adams, describing him as an inherently unstable creature, a man driven by vanity and his own perverse version of independence, a pathetic bundle of twitches and tantrums who was unfit for the office of chief magistrate. Adams responded with uncharacteristic calmness to this personal vendetta. "'I am confident,' he observed, that it will do him more harm than me. He was right. 
coming too late to affect many voters, Hamilton's diatribe exposed the deep rift within the Federalist camp for all to see, and suggested to most readers that Hamilton himself was out of his mind. In political terms, the Hamilton pamphlet was fully as fatal, and perhaps suicidal, as his subsequent decision to face Aaron Burr on the plains of Weehawken. His reputation never recovered. The same could be said for the Federalist Party. The Jefferson-Madison collaboration was not just committed to capturing the federal government for the Republicans. As Jefferson put it so graphically, their larger goal was to sink federalism into an abyss from which there shall be no resurrection of it. When Madison declared that the Republican cause was now completely triumphant, he not only meant that they had won control of the presidency and the Congress, but also that the Federalist Party was in complete disarray. Though pockets of Federalist power remained alive in New England for over a decade, as a national movement with the capacity to dominate the debate about America's proper course, it was a spent force. Jefferson had not yet invented the expression, the Revolution of 1800, to describe the Republican ascendancy. Nor had historians translated that term to mean the emergence of a more authentically democratic brand of politics, a translation that Jefferson would have understood dimly, if at all. Jefferson actually thought that his victory represented a recovery rather than a discovery, a renewal of the principles of 76, and a repudiation of the constitutional settlement of 1787 as the Federalists had attempted to define it. But the more historically correct reality was that no one quite knew what the Republican triumph meant in positive terms for the national government. What was clear, however, was that a particular version of politics and political leadership embodied in the Washington and Adams administrations had been successfully opposed and decisively defeated. The Jefferson-Madison collaboration was the politics of the future. The Adams collaboration was the politics of the past. What died was the presumption, so central to Adams's sense of politics and of himself, that there was a long-term collective interest for the Republic that could be divorced from partisanship, indeed rendered immune to politics altogether, and that the duty of an American statesman was to divine that public interest while studiously ignoring, indeed remaining blissfully oblivious to, the partisan pleadings of particular constituencies. After 1800, what Adams had called the monarchical principle was dead in American political culture, along with the kind of towering defiance that both Washington and Adams had harbored toward what might be called the morality of partisanship. That defiance had always depended upon revolutionary credentials, those present at the creation of the Republic could be trusted to act responsibly. And as the memory of the Revolution faded, so did the trust it conferred. Of course, Jefferson could, and decidedly did, claim membership in the Band of Brothers, but his election marked the end of an era. The people had replaced the public as the sovereign source of political wisdom. No leader could credibly claim to be above the fray. As Jefferson had understood from the moment Washington stepped down, the American president must forever after be the head of a political party. Neither member of the Adams team could ever comprehend this historical transition as anything other than an ominous symptom of moral degeneration. Jefferson had a party, Adams observed caustically. Hamilton had a party, but the Commonwealth had none. If the very idea of virtue was no longer an ideal in American politics, then there was no place for him in public life. If the Adams brand of statesmanship was now an anachronism, and it was, then the Adams presidency would serve as a fitting monument to its passing. In February of 1800, Adams signed the Treaty of Montfontaine officially ending hostilities with France. He could leave office in the knowledge that his discredited policies and singular style had worked. As he put it, he had steered the vessel into a peaceable and safe port. 
Rather ironically, the last major duty of the Adams collaboration was to supervise the transition of the federal government to its permanent location on the Potomac. Though the entire archive of the executive branch required only seven packing cases, Abigail resented the physical burdens imposed by this final chore, as well as the cold, cavernous, and still unfinished rooms of the presidential mansion. For several weeks, it wasn't at all clear whether Jefferson would become the next abiding occupant, because the final tally of the electoral vote had produced a tie between him and Burr. Rumors circulated that Adams intended to step down from office in order to permit Jefferson, still his vice president, to succeed him, in an effort to forestall a constitutional crisis. Adams let out the word that Jefferson was clearly the voter's choice and the superior man, that Burr was like a balloon filled with inflammable air. In the end, the crisis passed when, on the 36th ballot, the House voted Jefferson into office. Despite all the accumulated bitterness of the past eight years, and despite the political wounds Jefferson had inflicted over the past four years on the Adams presidency, Abigail insisted that her husband invite their former friend for cake and tea before she departed for Quincy a few weeks before the inauguration ceremony. No record of the conversation exists, though Jefferson had already apprised Madison that he knew the Adamses well enough to expect dispositions liberal and accommodating. On the actual day of the inauguration, however, Jefferson did not have Adams by his side as he rode down a stump-infested Pennsylvania Avenue to the yet unfinished capital. Rather than lend his presence to the occasion, Adams had taken the four o'clock stage out of town that morning in order to rejoin Abigail. He did not exchange another word with Jefferson for twelve years. This ends Disc 9. Founding Brothers, Disc 10. Chapter 6. The Friendship. Adams correctly regarded the 500-mile trek back to Quincy as his final exit from the public stage. Upon arriving home, he noted that his barnyard was full of seaweed, which then prompted a characteristically indiscreet observation. He had made a good exchange, honors and virtues for manure. When a violent storm struck on the day of his return, he took it as a providential sign that trouble was following him into retirement, as he put it, substituting fermentations in the elements for revolutions in the moral, intellectual, and political world. As one who had helped to make those political revolutions happen, he claimed to be completely comfortable in stormy weather. But now, at the advanced age of sixty-six, was it not natural to expect some semblance of serenity? Far removed from all the intrigues, and now out of reach of all the great and little passions that agitate the world, he explained, I hope to enjoy more tranquility than has ever before been my lot. The trouble with Adams was not that storms seemed to follow him, but rather that he carried them inside his soul, wherever he went. Abigail spied him in the field that July of 181, working alongside the hired hands, swinging his sickle and murmuring obscenities at his political opponents. From his letters, we know that Hamilton topped his enemy's list. He called him that bastard brat of a Scotch peddler, who was as ambitious as Bonaparte, though less courageous, and save for me would have involved us in a foreign war with France and a civil war with ourselves. Not far behind Hamilton came his former friend and successor to the presidency. Though the hate for Jefferson was far less, the hurt was more. They had done so much together, struggled together against the odds in 1776, represented America in Europe during the 1780s, risen above their political differences during Washington's administration. But during his own presidency, Adams believed that Jefferson had betrayed him and their friendship. And it was all done so indirectly, so craftily, like a burglar who left no fingerprints. Jefferson was a shadow man, Adams now believed, 
a man whose character was like the great rivers whose bottoms we cannot see and make no noise. When commenting on his other enemies, Adams displayed considerable flair. Tom Paine, for example, came off as the satyr of the age, a mongrel between pig and puppy, begotten by a wild boar on a butch wolf. With Jefferson, however, the colorful epithets and irreverent images did not come so easily. It was difficult to be specific when the core of a man's character was elusiveness. The character of Adams's own complicated feelings toward Jefferson eventually revealed itself through Abigail. The occasion was poignant. In 1804, Jefferson's younger daughter, Maria Jefferson Epps, died from complications during childbirth. Abigail decided to write a letter of consolation, explaining that reasons of various kinds withheld my pen until the powerful feelings of my heart have burst through the restraint. She recalled caring for Maria as a nine-year-old girl just arrived in London. It has been some time that I conceived of any event in this life which would call forth feelings of mutual sympathy, Abigail confided to Jefferson, but the loss of a child overcame all her rational reservations. She wanted Jefferson to know that her heart was with him. Jefferson normally had perfect pitch when interpreting the tone of a letter. But in this instance, he missed Abigail's clear warning signals and read her words as an invitation to resume the friendship with the Adams family. He seized the opportunity to review the long political partnership he had enjoyed with her husband. Their mutual affection accompanied us through long and important scenes, he wrote, and the different conclusions we had drawn from our political reading and reflections were not permitted to lessen mutual esteem. Though they had twice run against each other for the presidency, he insisted that we never stood in one another's way. The political rivalry had never eroded the personal respect between them. There was only one occasion, Jefferson confided, when a decision by Adams struck him as personally unkind. That was his appointment of Federalists to several vacant judgeships during his last weeks as president. These appointments somewhat misleadingly described as the midnight judges, had occurred after the presidential election and therefore denied Jefferson the right to choose his own men. The major offense was the appointment of John Marshall as Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, arguably Adams's most enduring anti-Jeffersonian legacy, in part because of Marshall's magisterial career on the bench and in part because Jefferson and Marshall utterly despised each other. But this one offense, as Jefferson put it, left something for friendship to forgive, so that after brooding it over for some little time I forgave it cordially, and returned to the same state of esteem and respect for Adams which had so long subsisted. Jefferson's letter sent Abigail into a controlled rage. You have been pleased to enter upon some subjects which call for a reply, she began ominously. The very notion that Jefferson should feel himself the injured party with the moral leverage to forgive her husband was a preposterous presumption. Now that Jefferson had raised the issue of political betrayal, he would have to excuse the freedom of this discussion, which has taken off the shackles I should otherwise found myself embarrassed with. The pent-up anger poured out. And now, sir, I freely disclose to you what has severed the bonds of former friendship and placed you in a light very different from what I had once viewed you in. After delivering a spirited defense of her husband's right to make judicial appointments before he left office, Abigail launched a frontal attack on Jefferson's character. Throughout Adams's presidency, she claimed, Jefferson had used his position as vice president to undermine the policies of the very man he had been elected to support. This was bad enough. But the worst offenses occurred during the election of 1800. Jefferson was guilty of the blackest calumny and foulest falsehoods during that bitter campaign. While affecting disinterest and detachment, he was secretly hiring scandalmongers like James Callender to libel Adams with outrageous charges. Adams was mentally deranged. Adams intended to have himself crowned as an American monarch. Adams planned to appoint John Quincy his successor to the presidency. 
This, sir, I considered as a personal injury, Abigail observed, the sword that cut the Gordian knot. It was richly ironic and wholly deserving that the infamous calendar had then turned on Jefferson and accused him of a sexual liaison with Sally Hemings, his household slave. The serpent you cherished and warmed, she noted with satisfaction, bit the hand that nourished him. And so, if there was any forgiving to be done, it would all happen on the Adams side. In the meantime, Jefferson was the one who needed to do some soul-searching. She concluded with one last verbal slap. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. Throughout his extraordinarily vast correspondence, Jefferson never received another letter like this one. He had his detractors, to be sure, but Federalist critics tended to attack him in the public press, which he could and did dismiss as partisan propaganda. Abigail's accusations, on the other hand, were private and personal, came from someone whom he respected as an intimate friend, and went beyond mere matters of political partisanship to questions of honor and trust. His first instinct was to claim that both sides, Republicans and Federalists alike, had engaged in lies and distortions during the election of 1800, and that he had suffered equivalent calumnies and falsehoods along with Adams. This was completely true. He then went on to disclaim that any person who knew either of us could possibly believe that either meddled in that dirty work. In effect, he had no role whatsoever in promoting Calendar's libels against Adams. This was a lie. With those who wish to think amiss of me, Jefferson pleaded, I have learnt to be perfectly indifferent. But with those like Abigail, where I know a mind to be ingenious and need only truth to set it to rights, I cannot be as passive. Abigail was having none of it. As she saw it, Jefferson's denials only offered further evidence of his duplicity. His complicity in behind-the-scenes political plotting was common knowledge. Abigail had initially resisted the obvious because, as she put it, the heart is long, very long, in receiving the convictions that is forced upon it by reason. Even now, she acknowledged, affection still lingers in the bosom, even after esteem has taken its flight. But there was no denying that Jefferson had mortgaged his honor to win an election. His Federalist critics had always accused him of being a man of party rather than principle. Pardon me, sir, if I say, Abigail concluded, that I fear you are. We can be reasonably sure that Abigail was speaking for her husband as well as herself in this brief volley of letters. The Adams team, then, was charging Jefferson with two serious offenses against the unwritten code of political honor purportedly binding on the leadership class of the revolutionary generation. The first offense, which has a quaint and wholly anachronistic sound to our modern ears, was that Jefferson was personally involved in his own campaign for the presidency, and that he conducted that campaign with only one goal in mind, namely, winning the election. This was the essence of the charge that he was a party man. Such behavior became an accepted, even expected, feature of the political landscape during the middle third of the 19th century, and has remained so ever since. Within the context of the revolutionary generation, however, giving one's allegiance to a political party remained illegitimate. It violated the core of virtue and disinterestedness presumed essential for anyone properly equipped to oversee public affairs. Neither Washington nor Adams had ever played a direct role in their own campaigns for office. And even Jefferson, who was the first president to break with that tradition, felt obliged to do so surreptitiously then issue blanket denials when confronted by Abigail. Jefferson, in fact, was on record as making one of the strongest statements of the era against the influence of political parties. He described party allegiance as the last degradation of a free and moral agent, and claimed that if I could not go to heaven but with a party, I would not go there at all. Jefferson's position on political parties like his stance on slavery, 
seem to straddle a rather massive contradiction. In both instances, his posture of public probity, slavery should be ended and political parties were evil agents that corrupted Republican values, was at odds with his personal behavior and political interest. And in both instances, Jefferson managed to convince himself that these apparent contradictions were, well, merely apparent. In the case of his active role behind the scenes during the presidential campaign of 1800, Jefferson sincerely believed that a Federalist victory meant the demise of the spirit of 76. Anything that avoided that horrible outcome ought to be justifiable. He then issued so many denials of his direct involvement in the campaign that he probably came to believe his own lies. That's why Abigail's relentless refusal to accept his personal testimonials on this score struck a nerve. He wasn't accustomed to having his word questioned and his excuses exposed, not even by himself. His second offense was more personal. Namely, he had vilified a man whom he claimed was a long-standing friend. He had sponsored Callender's polemics against the Adams administration, even though he knew them to be gross misrepresentations. Adams had no monarchical ambitions, though he did believe in a strong executive. He did not want war with France, though he did think that American neutrality should take precedence over the Franco-American alliance. Both positions were in accord with Washington's preferred policy. Unlike Washington, however, Adams had political vulnerabilities, which Jefferson exploited for his own political advantage. If the gross distortions had been orchestrated by Madison or any number of lesser political operatives, it would have been bad enough. But for Jefferson himself to have sanctioned the defamation was the essence of betrayal. It was akin to Hamilton's behind-the-scenes slandering of Burr, except in the case of Adams, the slander was more contemptible because essentially untrue. If Adams had been a believer in the Code Duello, which he was not, nor for that matter was Jefferson, this defamation of the Adams character would have presented a prime opportunity for a resolution with pistols on the field of honor. For at the highest level of political life in the early Republic, relationships remained resolutely personal, dependent on mutual trust, and therefore vulnerable to betrayals whenever the public and private overlapped. Although Jefferson probably presumed that Abigail was sharing their correspondence with her husband, Adams himself never saw the letters until several months later. After reading over the exchange, he made this written comment for the record. The whole of this correspondence was begun and conducted without my knowledge or suspicion, and this morning at the desire of Mrs. Adams I read the whole. I have no remarks to make upon it at this time and in this place. A steely silence thereupon settled over the dialogue between Quincy and Monticello for the following eight years. During that time Jefferson was too busy to indulge in retrospective fretting over the loss of a friend. His first term as president would go down as one of the most brilliantly successful in American history, capped off by the Louisiana Purchase in 1803, which effectively doubled the size of the national domain. His second term, on the other hand, proved to be a series of domestic tribulations and foreign policy failures, capped off by the infamous Embargo Act in 1807, which devastated the economy while failing to avert the looming war with England. Adams's assessment of Jefferson's presidency mixed fair-minded criticism of his policies with prejudicial comments on his character. Mr. Jefferson has reason to reflect upon himself. How he will get rid of his remorse in retirement, I know not. He must know that he leaves the government infinitely worse than he found it, and that from his own error or ignorance." I wish his telescopes and mathematical instruments, however, may secure his felicity. But if I have not mismeasured his ambition, the sword will cut away the scabbard. I have no resentment against him, although he has honored and salaried almost every villain he could find who had been an enemy to me. Despite his brave posturings of nonchalance and indifference, 
Adams was, in fact, obsessed with Jefferson's growing reputation as one of the major figures of the age. As Adams remembered it, Jefferson had played a decidedly minor role in the Continental Congress. While he, John Adams, was delivering the fiery speeches that eventually moved their reluctant colleagues to make the decisive break with England, Jefferson lingered in the background like a shy schoolboy, so subdued that during the whole time I sat with him in Congress, I never heard him utter three sentences together. Now, however, because of the annual celebrations on July 4th, the symbolic significance of the Declaration of Independence was looming larger in the public memory. Blotting out the messier but more historically correct version of the story, transforming Jefferson from a secondary character to a star player in the drama. Was there ever a coup de théâtre, Adams complained, that had so great an effect as Jefferson's penmanship of the Declaration of Independence? Jefferson was an elegant stylist, to be sure, which was one of the main reasons that he, John Adams, had selected him to draft the famous document in the first place. But he was not a mover and shaker, only a draftsman. The words he wrote were merely the lyrical expression of ideas that had been bandied about in the Congress and the various colonial legislatures for years. Adams had actually led the debate in the Congress that produced its passage. As Jefferson sat silently and sullenly while the delegates revised his language, what was really just a theatrical sideshow was now being enshrined in memory as the defining moment in the revolutionary drama. Jefferson ran away with the stage effect, Adams lamented, and all the glory of it. Adams was not the kind of man to suffer in silence. His jealousy of Jefferson was palpable and his throbbing vanity became patently obvious as he relived the contested moments from the past in the privacy of his own memory, then reported on his admittedly self-serving findings to trusted confidants like Benjamin Rush. For the simple truth was that the aging sage of Quincy had nothing else to do. Jefferson had the all-consuming duties of the presidency, then two major retirement projects— the completion of his architectural renovations of Monticello, and the creation of the University of Virginia. But the sole project for Adams lay within himself. His focus, indeed his obsession, was the interior architecture of his own remembrances, the construction of an Adams version of American history, a spacious room of his own within the American pantheon. He was doing what we would now call therapy, thrashing about inside himself in endless debate with his internal demons while seated by the fireside in what he self-mockingly called my throne, twitching in and out of control as he attempted to compose his autobiography, which turned into a series of salvos at his political enemies. Hamilton, no surprise, was the chief target, and ended literally in mid-sentence, when he realized that it was all catharsis and no coherence. Outraging his old friend Mercy Otis Warren with embarrassing tantrums because her three-volume History of the American Revolution in 1805 failed to make him the major player in the story. Warren responded in kind, I am so much at a loss for the meaning of your paragraphs, and the rambling manner in which your angry and undigested letters are written, she explained, that I scarcely know where to begin my remarks. Warren concluded with a scathing diagnosis of the Adams' correspondence with her as a scattered series of verbal impulses and the most captious, malignant, irrelevant compositions that have ever been seen. Undeterred, he launched another round of his memoirs in the Boston Patriot, designed to set the record straight, an act that quickly gave rise to another cascade of emotional eruptions. Let the jackasses bray or laugh at this, he declared defiantly. I am in a fair way to give my critics and enemies food enough to glut their appetites. I take no notice of their Billingsgate. While drafting the nearly interminable essays for the Patriot, he compared himself to a wild animal who had grabbed the end of a cord with his teeth and was drawn slowly up by pulleys through a storm of squills, crackers, and rockets flashing and blazing around him every moment. 
and although the scorching flames made him groan and mourn and roar, he would not let go. He was, to put it bluntly, driving himself half crazy in frantic but futile attempts at self-vindication. Every effort to redeem his reputation only confirmed what Hamilton had claimed in his infamous pamphlet during the presidential campaign of 1800, namely, that Adams was an inherently erratic character who often lacked control over his own emotional impulses. In 1805, Adams resumed a correspondence with Benjamin Rush, in which he actually seemed to embrace that very conclusion. There have been many times in my life when I have been so agitated in my own mind, Adams confessed, as to have no consideration at all of the light in which my words, actions, and even writings would be considered by others. The few traces that remain of me must, I believe, go down to posterity in much confusion and distraction, as my life has been passed. The correspondence with Rush, which lasted for eight years, permitted Adams to confront his personal demons and exorcise them in a series of remarkable exchanges that, taken together, are the most colorful, playful, and revealing letters he ever wrote. Rush set the terms for what became a high-stakes game of honesty by proposing that they dispense with the usual topics and report to each other on their respective dreams. Adams leaped at the suggestion and declared himself prepared to match his old friend dream for dream. Rush began with a singular dream set in 1790, and focusing on a crazed derelict who was promising a crowd that he could produce rain and sunshine and cause the wind to blow from any quarter he pleased. Rush interpreted this eloquent lunatic as a symbolic figure representing all those political leaders in the infant nation who claimed they could shape public opinion. Adams subsequently countered. I dreamed that I was mounted on a lofty scaffold in the center of a great plain in Versailles, surrounded by an innumerable congregation of five and twenty millions. But the crowd was not comprised of people. Instead, they were all inhabitants of the royal menagerie, including lions, elephants, wildcats, rats, squirrels, whales, sharks, the litany went on for several paragraphs, who then proceeded to tear one another to pieces as he tried to lecture them on the advantages of the unadulterated principles of liberty, equality, and fraternity among all living creatures. At the end of the dream, he was forced to flee the scene with my clothes torn from my back and my skin lacerated from head to foot. As befits a dialogue framed around reports from the subconscious regions, the Adams Rush correspondence tended to emphasize the power of the irrational. Adams recalled a French barber in Boston who used the phrase, a little crack, meaning slightly crazy. I have long thought the philosophers of the 18th century and almost all the men of science and letters crack, and that the sun, moon, and stars send all their lunatics here for confinement. Then, ever playful with Rush, Adams signed off with the following self-deprecating joke. I must tell you that my wife, who took a fancy to read this letter upon my table, bids me tell you that she thinks my head, too, a little crack, and I am half of that mind myself. Adams had a lifelong tendency to view the world out there as a projection of the emotions he felt swirling inside himself. The overriding honesty and intimacy of the correspondence with Rush permitted this projection to express itself without restraint. The question he had posed to others, simultaneously poignant and pathetic, had the authentic ring of a cri de coeur. How is it that I, poor ignorant I, must stand before posterity as differing from all the other great men of the age? In his monthly exchanges with Rush, Adams worked out his answer to that question. There is a Mad Hatter character to the Adams Rush correspondence, as both men swapped stories and shared anecdotes in a kind of Adams and Rush in Wonderland mode. But there was a deadly serious insight buried within the comedy. 
The insight was precocious, anticipating as it did the distinction between history as experienced and history as remembered, most famously depicted in Leo Tolstoy's War and Peace. The core insight, that all seamless historical narratives are latter-day constructions, lies at the center of all postmodern critiques of traditional historical explanations. Under Russia's prodding influence, and in response to his dreamy inspirations, Adams realized that the act of transforming the American Revolution into history placed a premium on selecting events and heroes that fit neatly into a dramatic formula, thereby distorting the more tangled and incoherent experience that participants actually making the history felt at the time. Jefferson's drafting of the Declaration of Independence was a perfect example of such dramatic distortions. The revolution in this romantic rendering became one magical moment of inspiration, leading inexorably to the foregone conclusion of American independence. As Adams remembered it, on the other hand, all the great critical questions about men and measures from 1774 to 1778 were desperately contested and highly problematic occasions, usually decided by the vote of a single state, and that vote was often decided by a single individual. Nothing was clear, inevitable, or even comprehensible to the soldiers in the field at Saratoga, or the statesmen in the corridors at Philadelphia. It was patched and piebald policy then as it is now, ever was, and ever will be, world without end. The real drama of the American Revolution, which was perfectly in accord with Adams's memory as well as with the turbulent conditions of his own soul, was its inherent messiness. This meant recovering the exciting but terrifying sense that all the major players had at the time, namely that they were making it up as they went along, improvising on the edge of catastrophe. Adams derived his authority for a deconstructed version of the American Revolution from his incontestable claim to have been present at the creation. He had been a participant during most, if not all, of the crucial moments from the Stamp Act crisis in 1765 to his own retirement from the presidency in 1801. And he knew all the major players personally. This conferred instant credibility upon his preferred role as designated truth-teller, poised to expose the chaotic reality beneath all uplifting accounts of the Revolution. Support for American independence, for example, was always fragile, and shifted with each victory or defeat in the field, which was often a matter of pure luck. Or the decision to locate the national capital on the Potomac was a backroom deal, involving so many secret bargains and bribes that no one would ever unravel the full story. In the same vein, all the heroic portraits of the great men were romanticized distortions. Franklin, for example, was a superb scientist and masterful prose stylist, to be sure, but also a vacuous political thinker and diplomatic fraud, who spent the bulk of his time in Paris flirting with younger women of the Salon set, Washington was an indisputable American patriarch, but more an actor than a leader, brilliant at striking poses, in a strain of Shakespearean excellence at dramatic exhibitions. He was also poorly read, seldom wrote his own speeches, and according to one member of his cabinet, could not write a sentence without misspelling some word. In general, the Virginians were the chief beneficiaries of all the highly stylized histories, though, as Adams observed, not a lad upon the highlands is more clannish than every Virginian I have ever known. Virginians were also the most adept at employing what Adams called puffers, what we would call spinners or public relations experts. These puffers, Rush, are the only killers of scandal, Adams noted. You and I have never employed them, and therefore scandal has prevailed against us. When Rush somewhat mischievously suggested that Adams himself enjoyed the support of Federalist puffers, specifically mentioning William Cobbett, 
Adams pleaded total ignorance. Now I assure you upon my honor and the faith of the friendship between us that I never saw the face of Cobbett, and that I should not know him if I met him in my porridge dish. This last remark, while vintage Adams Rush banter, also exposed the painfully egotistical motives lurking beneath the entire Adams campaign for a more realistic, non-mythologized version of the American Revolution. While his insistence on a deconstructed history was certainly a precocious intellectual insight, there's also no question that the Adams' urge to discredit the dramatic renderings of the revolutionary era was driven by his own wounded vanity. To put it squarely, such versions of the story failed to provide him with a starring role in the drama. At its nub, his critique of the historical fictions circulating as seductive truths was much like a campaign to smash all the statues because the sculptor had failed to render a satisfactory likeness of yours truly. On the other hand, Adams possessed a congenital affinity for deconstructed interpretations of history, of his own life, indeed of practically everything. It was the way he saw the world. By temperament, he was inherently impulsive, highly combustible, instinctively irreverent. All his major published works on political philosophy, including his Defense of the Constitution of the United States of America and Discourses on Davila, along with his unpublished autobiography, lacked coherent form. They were less books than notebooks, filled with rambling transcriptions of his own internal conversations that ricocheted off one another at unpredictable angles. While his most devoted enemies, chiefly Franklin and Hamilton, claimed that his erratic habits of mind were symptomatic of mental illness, some recent scholarship has suggested the problem was physical, that he might well have been afflicted with hyperthyroidism, or Graves' disease. For our purposes, however, the ultimate cause of the condition is less important than its systemic manifestation which was a congenital inability to separate his thoughts from his feelings about them. This caused him to mistrust all purely rational descriptions of human behavior as incompatible with the more passionate stirrings he felt within his own personality. As he told Rush, Deceive not thyself, there is not an old friar in France, not in Europe, who looks on a blooming young virgin with sang -froid. These same internal stirrings also predisposed him to regard all perfectly symmetrical narratives or stories preaching an obvious moral message and populated by larger-than-life heroes as utter fabrications. Like straight lines in nature, such things did not exist for him. They did, however, for his former friend at Monticello who had spent the bulk of his adult life keeping his head and his heart in separate chambers of his personality. Starting in 1807, Jefferson's name began to come up sporadically in Adams's letters to Rush. Prior to that time, Jefferson had remained a forbidden subject. When asked to comment on his renowned partnership with Jefferson during the early days of the American Revolution, Adams developed a standard statement of denial. You are much mistaken when you say that no man living has so much knowledge of Mr. Jefferson's transactions as myself, Adams insisted. I know but little concerning him. With Rush, however, Adams began to slip Jefferson into their conversation as an example of the kind of enigmatic temperament destined to flourish in the history books. He recalled Jefferson's retirement from the Washington administration in 1793, Quite obviously, a shrewd tactical retreat designed to position Jefferson for his ascent toward the summit of the pyramid, that is, the presidency, but which was described by the Republican press as unambitious, unavaricious, and perfectly disinterested. Somehow, Jefferson was even able to persuade himself that he was beyond temptation and happily ensconced on his mountaintop for the duration. When a man has one of the two greatest parties in a nation interested in representing him to be disinterested, Adams observed with amazement, 
Even those who believe it to be a lie will repeat it so often to one another that at last they will seem to believe it to be true. The same pattern materialized later in the 1790s, when Jefferson embraced two misguided propositions about European affairs. The first was that England was tottering to her fall, that her economy was collapsing, and she must soon be a bankrupt and unable to maintain her naval superiority. The second misguided opinion, still more erroneous and still more fatal, was that France was the wave of the future, that she would establish a free republican government and even a leveling democracy, and that monarchy and nobility would forever be abolished in France, all of which would occur peacefully and bloodlessly. In both instances, events proved Jefferson wrong. In both instances, Adams had disagreed with Jefferson and been proven right. But despite his underestimation of England and his overestimation of France, Jefferson's reputation and popularity soared. I have reason to remember it, Adams recalled, because my opinion of the French Revolution produced a coldness towards me in all my revolutionary friends and an inclination towards Mr. Jefferson which broke out in violent invectives and false imputations upon me, and in flattering panegyrics upon Mr. Jefferson. Once again, Jefferson seemed uniquely equipped to become the chief beneficiary of romanticized versions of history, in part because his own capacity for self-deception permitted him to deny, and with utter sincerity, the vanities and ambitions lurking in his own soul, and in part because the moralistic categories that shaped all his political thinking fit perfectly the romantic formula that history writing seemed to require. The fact that these categories were blatant illusions, for example, the French Revolution was not a European version of the American Revolution, seemed to matter less than the fact that they confirmed a potent and seductive mythology that was more appealing than the messier reality. Through some complex combination of duplicity and disposition, Jefferson had come to embody the will to believe. He wasn't so much living a lie as living a fiction that he had come to believe himself. Adams had come to see himself as the mirror image of Jefferson. Mausoleums, statues, monuments will never be erected to me, he wrote with resignation to Rush. Panegyrical romances will never be written, nor flattering orations spoken to transmit me to posterity in brilliant colors, no, nor in true colors. All but the last I loathe. Facing that unattractive truth took time, a full decade of shouting and pouting, relieved by converting his despair into comedy with Rush. But it also came naturally to Adams whose entire career had been spent preaching the unattractive truths to everybody else. If Jefferson seemed predestined to tell people what they wanted to hear, Adams now acknowledged that his own destiny was just the opposite, to tell them what they needed to know. This was Adams's resigned but bittersweet mood in 1809, when Rush reported his most amazing dream yet. He dreamed that Adams had written a short letter to Jefferson, congratulating him on his recent retirement from public life. Jefferson had then responded to this magnanimous gesture with equivalent graciousness. The two great patriarchs had then engaged in a correspondence over several years in which they candidly acknowledged their mutual mistakes, shared their profound reflections on the meaning of American independence, and recovered their famous friendship. Then the two philosopher kings sunk into the grave nearly at the same time, full of years and rich in the gratitude and praises of their country, and to their numerous merits and honors posterity has added that they were rival friends. Adams responded immediately, A dream again! I have no other objection to your dream but that it is not history. It may be prophecy. Then he offered a satirical account of his relationship with Jefferson, claiming that there has never been the smallest interruption of the personal friendship between Mr. Jefferson that I know of. 
This convenient lie was then followed by a humorous piece of bravado. You should remember that Jefferson was what a boy to me. I was at least ten years older than him in age, and more than twenty years older in politics. I am bold to say I was his preceptor in politics, and taught him everything that was good and solid in his whole political conduct. How could one hold a grudge against a disciple? On the other hand, given Jefferson's junior status, was it not more appropriate for him to initiate the reconciliation? If I should receive a letter from him, Adams concluded tartly, I should not fail to acknowledge and answer it. Jefferson, in short, would have to extend the hand first. That was not going to happen. Rush was simultaneously writing Jefferson, somewhat misleadingly suggesting that Adams had indicated he was now eager for a reconciliation and virtually on his deathbed. I am sure an advance on your side will be a cordial to the heart of Mr. Adams, Rush explained. Tottering over the grave, he now leans wholly upon the shoulders of his old revolutionary friends. But Jefferson would not rise to the bait. Convinced as he was after his earlier exchange with Abigail that he had already made a heroic effort that had been summarily rejected, it was now Adams's turn to attempt a bridging of the gap. That was how it stood for more than two ensuing years, the two sages circling each other, marking off their territory like old dogs, sniffing around the edges of a possible reconciliation, reluctant to close the distance. The distance was reduced in 1811, when Edward Coles, a Jefferson protege, who was attempting, in vain it turned out, to persuade his mentor to assume a more forthright position opposing slavery, visited Adams in Quincy. Adams let it be known that his political disagreements with Jefferson had never killed his affection for the man. I always loved Jefferson, he told Coles, and still love him. When word of this exchange reached Jefferson, as Adams knew it would, Jefferson declared his conversion. This is enough for me, he wrote Rush, adding that he knew Adams to be always an honest man, often a great one, but sometimes incorrect and precipitate in his judgments. This latter caveat rewidened the gap that the earlier statement had seemed to close. The gap became a chasm when Jefferson went on to explain that he had always valued Adams's judgment, with the single exception as to his political opinions a statement roughly equivalent to claiming that the Pope was otherwise infallible, except when he declared himself on matters of faith and morals. On Christmas Day of 1811, Adams apprised Rush that he was fully aware of the benevolent duplicities Rush was performing as intermediary. I perceive plainly, Rush, that you have been teasing Jefferson to write me, as you did me to write him. Adams also knew full well that Rush was sending edited versions of his letters to Jefferson, removing the potentially offensive passages. In the Christmas letter, Adams reviewed the full range of political disagreements with Jefferson, mixing together serious controversies, for example the Alien and Sedition Acts, the French Revolution, the American Navy, with a light-hearted list of personal differences. For example, Adams held levies once a week as president, while Jefferson's entire presidency was a levy. Jefferson thought liberty favored straight hair, while Adams thought curled hair just as Republican as straight. That was the tone Adams wanted to convey to Jefferson. Still feisty and critical of Jefferson's principles and policies, but fully capable of controlling the dialogue with humor and diplomatic nonchalance. The fires still burned, but the great volcano of the revolutionary generation was at last in remission. In the end, it was Adams who made the decisive move. On January 1st, 1812, a short but cordial note went out from Quincy to Monticello, relaying family news and referring to two pieces of homespun coming along by separate packet. Rush was ecstatic as well as fully convinced that he had orchestrated a reconciliation. 
I rejoice in the correspondence which has taken place between you and your old friend Mr. Jefferson, he declared triumphantly to Adams. I consider you and him as the North and South Poles of the American Revolution. Some talked, some wrote, and some fought to promote and establish it. But you and Mr. Jefferson fought for us all. Adams went along with the celebratory mood, hiding his pride behind a mask of jokes and the rather fraudulent pretense that his famous friendship with Jefferson had never really been interrupted. Your dream is out, your prophecy fulfilled. You have worked wonders. You have made peace between powers that were never at enmity. In short, the mighty, defunct potentates of Mount Wollaston and Monticello by your sorceries are again in being. In the same self-consciously jocular style, he soon began to refer to his Quincy estate as Montezillo, which he claimed meant very little mountain, in deference to Jefferson's Monticello, which meant little mountain. He insisted that Rush was making more of the reunion with Jefferson than it deserved. Nothing momentous or historic was at stake. It was only as if one sailor had met a brother sailor after twenty-five years' absence, Adams joked, and had accosted him, How fare you, Jack? Nothing could have been further from the truth. Adams's ever-vibrating vanities were now true enough under some measure of control. But his dismissive posture toward the rupture in the friendship, what breach and what betrayal, was obviously only a bravado pose. Even the start of the correspondence exposed the awkward tensions just below the surface. Jefferson presumed, quite plausibly, that the two pieces of homespun Adams was sending along referred to domestically produced clothing, a nice symbol of the American economic response to the embargo, and a fitting reminder of the good old days when Adams and Jefferson had first joined the movement for American independence. And so Jefferson responded with a lengthy treatise on the merits of domestic manufacturing, and grand memories of the non-importation movement in the 1760s, only to discover that Adams had intended the homespun reference as a metaphor. His gift turned out to be a copy of John Quincy's recent two-volume work, Lectures on Rhetoric and Oratory. Why, then, did Adams take the fateful step, which led to a 14-year exchange of 158 letters? a correspondence that's generally regarded as the intellectual capstone to the achievements of the revolutionary generation and the most impressive correspondence between prominent statesmen in all of American history. The friendship and the mutual trust on which it rested had, in fact, not been recovered by 1812. It took the correspondence to recover the friendship, not the other way around. What then motivated Adams to extend his hand across the gap that existed between Quincy and Monticello, then write more than two letters for every one of Jefferson's? Two overlapping but competing answers come to mind. First, there was a good deal of unfinished business between the two men, a clear recognition on both sides that they had come to fundamentally different conclusions about what the American Revolution meant. Adams believed that Jefferson's version of the story, while misguided, was destined to dominate the history books. The resumption of his correspondence with Jefferson afforded Adams the opportunity to challenge the Jeffersonian version and to do so in the form of a written record virtually certain to become a major historical document of its own. You and I ought not to die, Adams rather poignantly put it in an early letter, before we have explained ourselves to each other. But both men knew they were sending their letters to posterity as much as to each other. Second, the reconciliation and ensuing correspondence permitted Adams to join Jefferson as the co-star of an artfully arranged final act in the revolutionary drama. Adams had spent most of his retirement years denouncing such contrivances as gross distortions of history. But he had also spent those same years marveling at the benefits that accrued to anyone willing to pose for posterity in the mythical mode. 
if he could only control himself, if he could speak the lines that history wanted to hear, if he could fit himself into the heroic mold like a kind of living statue, he might yet win his ticket to immortality. Both Adams and Jefferson knew their roles by heart, especially in its Ciceronian version as a pair of retired patriarchs now beyond ambition and above controversy. The dialogue they sustained from 1812 to 1826 can be read at several levels, but the chief source of its modern appeal derives from its elegiac tone. The image of two American icons, looking back with seasoned serenity at the revolution they have wrought, delivering eloquent soliloquies on all the timeless topics, speaking across their political differences to each other and across the ages to us. If we wished to conjure up a mental picture of this rendition of the dialogue, it would feature Jefferson standing tall and straight in his familiar statuesque posture, his arms folded across his chest as was his custom, while the much shorter Adams paced back and forth around him, jabbing at the air in his nervous and animated style, periodically stopping to grab Jefferson by the lapels to make an irreverent point. This, of course, is the constructed or posed version that ought to provoke our immediate skepticism. In Adams's terms, this is not history but romance. For several reasons, however, this beguiling depiction cannot be summarily dismissed. First of all, the friendship was, in fact, recovered, and the reconciliation realized during the course of the correspondence. The clinching evidence comes late, in 1823, when Jefferson responded to a series of letters that appeared in the newspapers. Adams had written them much earlier and had described Jefferson as a duplicitous political partisan. "'Be assured, my dear sir,' Jefferson wrote Adams, "'that I am incapable of receiving the slightest impression from the effort now made to plant thorns on the pillow of age, worth, and wisdom, and to sow tares between friends who have been such for nearly half a century.' beseeching you then not to suffer your mind to be disquieted by this wicked attempt to poison its peace, and praying you to throw it by. Adams was overjoyed. He insisted that Jefferson's letter be read aloud to his entire extended family at the breakfast table, calling it the best letter that ever was written, just such a letter as I expected, only it was infinitely better expressed." he concluded with an Adams salvo against the peevish and fretful effusions of politicians, then signed off as J.A., in the eighty-ninth year of his age, still too fat to last much longer. Clearly, this was no dramatic contrivance. The old trust had been fully recovered. Second, the improbably symmetrical ending to the dialogue casts an irresistibly dramatic spell over the entire story and the way to tell it. Rush had predicted that the two patriarchs would reconcile, then go to their graves at nearly the same time. But their mutual exit was even more exquisitely timed than Rush had dreamed. No serious novelist would ever dare to make this up. They died within five hours of each other on the fiftieth anniversary to the day and almost to the hour of the official announcement of American independence to the world in 1776. Call it a miracle, an accident, or a case of two powerful personalities willing themselves to expire on schedule and according to script. But it happened. Third, the correspondence can be read as an extended conversation between two gods on Mount Olympus, because both men were determined to project that impression. But whither is senile garrulity leading me? Jefferson asked rhetorically. Into politics, of which I have taken final leave. I have given up newspapers in exchange for Tacitus and Thucydides, for Newton and Euclid, and I find myself much happier." Adams then responded with his own display of classical learning and literary flair. I have read Thucydides and Tacitus so often, and at such distant periods of my life, that elegant, profound, and enchanting as their style, I am weary of them. 
then joked that my senectutal loquacity has more than retaliated your senile garrulity. Many of the most memorable exchanges required no staging or self-conscious posing whatsoever, since there was a host of safe subjects the two sages could engage without risking conflict and that afforded occasions for conspicuous displays of their verbal prowess. They were, after all, two of the most accomplished letter writers of the era, men who had fashioned over long careers at the writing desk distinctive prose styles that expressed their different personalities perfectly. Thus, Jefferson waxed eloquent on the aging process and their mutual intimations of mortality. But our machines have now been running for seventy or eighty years, he observed stoically, and we must expect that, worn as they are, here a pivot, there a wheel, now a pinion, next a spring will be giving way, and however we may tinker with them for a while, all will at length surcease motion." Adams responded in kind, but with a caveat. I am sometimes afraid that my machine will not surcease motion soon enough, for I dread nothing so much as dying at the top, meaning becoming senile and a burden to his family. He then went on to chide Jefferson for talking like an old man. Of all the original signers of the Declaration of Independence, you are the youngest and the most energetic in mind and body and therefore most likely to be the final survivor. Like the last person in the household to retire for the night, it would be Jefferson's responsibility to close up the fireplace and rake the ashes over the coals. Most modern readers come to the correspondence fully aware of Jefferson's proficiency with a pen, and are therefore somewhat surprised to discover that Adams could more than hold his own in the verbal dueling, indeed delivered the most quotable lines. For example, after Jefferson produced a lengthy exegesis on the origins of the Native American population of North America, Adams dismissed all the current theories about the original occupants of the continent. I should as soon suppose that the prodigal son, in a frolic with one of his girls, made a trip to America in one of Mother Carey's eggshells, and left the fruits of their amours here. Or when Jefferson embraced the development of an indigenous American language, arguing that everyday usage is the workshop in which new words are elaborated, rather than the English dictionaries compiled by the likes of Samuel Johnson, Adams went into a colorful tirade. All English dictionaries, he declared, were vestiges of the same British tyranny that the American Revolution destroyed forever. We are no more bound by Johnson's dictionary, he pronounced, than by the canon law of England. By what right did Samuel Johnson deny him, John Adams, the freedom to fashion his own vocabulary? I have as good a right to make a word, he insisted, as that pedant, bigot, cynic, and monk. Speaking of words... The pungency of the Adams prose comes through so impressively in the correspondence, in part because Adams invested himself in the exchange more than Jefferson. He composed more memorable passages because he wrote many more words. When the torrent from Quincy threatened to flood Monticello, he apologized for getting so far out ahead. Jefferson then apologized in return claiming that he received over 1,200 letters a year, all of which required responses. So it was difficult for him to match the Adams' pace. Adams replied that he received only a fraction of that number, but chose not to answer most of them, which allowed him to focus all his allegedly waning energies on Jefferson. Beyond sheer verbal volume, the punch, so evident in the Adams' prose, reflected his more aggressive and confrontational temperament. The Jefferson style was fluid, lyrical, cadenced, and melodious. Words for him were like calming breezes that floated across the pages. The Adams style was excited, jumpy, exclamatory, naughty. Words for him were like weapons, designed to pierce the pages or explode above them in illuminating airbursts. While the Adams style generated a host of memorable epigrammatic flashes, it was the worst possible vehicle for sustaining the diplomatic niceties. 
Jefferson was perfectly capable of remaining on script and in role as Philosopher King to the end. If it had been up to him, the demigod version of the Adams-Jefferson dialogue would have captured its essence and ultimate meaning as a staged performance for posterity. Adams, however, despite all his vows of Ciceronian serenity, was congenitally incapable of staying in character. For him, the only meaningful kind of conversation was an argument, and that, in the end, is what the dialogue with Jefferson became and the best way to understand its historical significance. This ends Disc 10. Founding Brothers, Disc 11. Adams remained on his best behavior for over a year. There were a few brief flurries, chiefly jabs at Jefferson's failure to prepare the nation for the War of 1812, especially his negligence in building up the American Navy, which had always been an Adams hobby horse. Ever diplomatic, Jefferson never quite conceded that Adams had been right about a larger navy, but when the American fleet won some early battles in the war, Jefferson graciously noted that the success of our little navy must be more gratifying to you than to most men, as having been the early and constant advocate of wooden walls. The potentially explosive issues lay buried further back in the past. Both men recognized that touching them placed the newly established reconciliation at risk. The first Adams eruption occurred in June of 1813, followed immediately by a chain reaction of explosions over the ensuing six months. Adams wrote 30 letters, Jefferson 5. The detonating device was publication of a letter Jefferson had written in 1801 to Joseph Priestley the English scientist and renowned critic of Christianity. In that letter, Jefferson had mentioned Adams in passing as a retrograde thinker opposed to all forms of progress, one of the ancients rather than moderns. The sentiment that you have attributed to me in your letter to Dr. Priestley I totally disclaim, Adams protested, and I demand, in the French sense of the word, demand of you the proof. Sensing that Adams was in mid-explosion, Jefferson responded at length. The Priestley letter was a confidential communication that was never meant to trouble the public mind. He then went on to remind Adams that the party wars were still raging back then, that both sides had been guilty of some rather extreme denunciations of the others, and that his real target had been the Federalists, who had defamed his own notions of government as dangerous innovations. Then came the crucial acknowledgment and quasi-apology. Adams had been targeted for criticism because he was the standard-bearer for the Federalist Party. But Jefferson had always realized that Adams didn't fit into the party grooves. I happen to cite it from you, though the whole letter shows I had them only in view. Jefferson explained. In truth, my dear sir, we were far from considering you as the author of all the measures we blamed. They were placed under the protection of your name, but we were satisfied they wanted much of your approbation. Notice the collective we, an inadvertent acknowledgment of the coordinated campaign of the Republican Party. Adams, in effect, happened to be in the line of fire which was really directed at the Hamiltonian wing of the Federalist Party. You would do me great injustice, therefore, Jefferson concluded, by taking to yourself what was intended for men who were your secret as they are now your open enemies. Jefferson's explanation was ingenious. It shifted the blame for the rupture of the friendship onto the Hamiltonians, whom he knew Adams utterly despised then invited Adams to align himself, at least retrospectively, with the Republican side of the debate. The trouble with Adams, of course, was that he was unwilling to align himself with any political party. Indeed, his trademark had always been to embody the virtuous ideal, the Washington quasi-monarchical model of executive leadership and stand above party. The clear, if unspoken, message of Jefferson's letter was that this admirable posture was no longer possible in American politics. 
Adams had gotten himself caught in the crossfire created by the new conditions and the partisan imperatives they generated. Most important, from the point of view of the friendship, Jefferson admitted that his behind-the-scenes criticism of Adams had been a willful misrepresentation. While not really an apology, indeed forces beyond his control had dictated his actions, this was at least a major concession. Adams's immediate impulse was to fire off several illumination rounds designed to expose the inaccuracies in Jefferson's account of the Adams presidency, inaccuracies that Jefferson had already acknowledged. I have no thought in this correspondence but to satisfy you and myself, Adams observed, adding, My reputation has been so much the sport of the public for fifty years, and will be with posterity, that I hoped it a bubble, a gossamer, that idles in the wanton summer air. Jefferson had mentioned the Alien and Sedition Acts as a major source of partisan hatred. As your name is subscribed to that law as vice president, Adams declared, and mine as president, I know not why you are not as responsible for it as I am. Jefferson had used the phrase, the terrorism of the day, to describe the supercharged atmosphere of the late 1790s. Adams launched into a frenzied recollection of the mobs gathered around his house, protesting his decision to send a peace delegation to France. I have no doubt you were fast asleep in philosophical tranquility, Adams noted caustically, when ten thousand people, and perhaps many more, were parading the streets of Philadelphia. What think you of terrorism, Mr. Jefferson? Jefferson had blamed the Federalists for the lion's share of the party mischief. Adams thought the blame was equally shared. Both parties have excited artificial terrors, he concluded, and if I were summoned as a witness to say upon oath, I could not give a more sincere answer than in the vulgar style, put them in a bag and shake them and then see which comes out first. However anachronistic it might seem to Jefferson, he, John Adams, would go to his grave defying party politics. This was the defining moment in the correspondence. In the summer of 1813, the dialogue ceased being a still-life picture of posed patriarchs and became an argument between competing versions of the revolutionary legacy. All the unmentionable subjects were now on the table, because a measure of mutual trust had been recovered. The best bellwether of the Adams psyche was always Abigail, and on July 15, 1813, she appended a note to her husband's letter, her first communication with Jefferson since the lacerating letters she had written him nine years earlier. I have been looking for some time for a space in my good husband's letters to add the regards of an old friend, she now wrote, which are still cherished and preserved through all the changes and vicissitudes which have taken place since we first became acquainted, and will, I trust, remain as long as A. Adams. Abigail's voice, as always, was the surest sign. Jefferson had been forgiven. The friendship, so long in storage, had never completely died. The recovered sense of common affection and trust now made it possible to act on Adams's classic pronouncement, that they ought not die before they had explained themselves to each other. Although Adams tended to set the intellectual agenda in the dialogue that ensued, Jefferson inadvertently provided the larger framework within which the debate played out. He was actually trying to make amends for his unfair characterization of Adams in the priestly letter as one of the ancients. He now wanted to go on record as agreeing with Adams that while the progress of science was indisputable, certain political principles were eternal verities that the ancients understood as well as the moderns. The same political parties which now agitate the U.S. have existed through all time, he observed. And, in fact, the terms of Whig and Tory belong to natural as well as to civil history. They denote the temper and constitution and mind of different individuals. 
Was this Jefferson's roundabout way of suggesting that he and Adams had in effect been acting out a timeless political argument? As the lengthy letter proceeded, it became clear that Jefferson was, in fact, attempting to place his friendship and eventual rivalry with Adams within a broader context, to see it through the more detached lens of history. In the Jeffersonian version of the story, Adams and Jefferson fought shoulder to shoulder against the Tories, served together in Europe as a dynamic team, then returned to serve again in the new national government. And then the classic distinction appeared again. The line of division was again drawn. We broke into two parties, each wishing to give a different direction to the government, the one to strengthen the most popular branch, the other the more permanent branches, and to extend their performance. Here, you and I separated for the first time. And as we had been longer than most in the public theater, and our names were more familiar to our countrymen, the party which considered you as thinking with them placed your name at the head. The other, for the same reason, selected mine. We suffered ourselves, as you so well expressed it, to be the passive subjects of public discussion. And these discussions, whether relating to men, measures, or opinions, were conducted by the parties with an animosity, a bitterness, and an indecency which had never been exceeded. To me, then, it appears that there have been differences of opinion and party differences from the first establishment of governments to the present day, and on the same question which now divides our own country, that these will continue through all future time, that everyone takes his side in favor of the many or the few according to his constitution and the circumstances in which he is placed. Here was the classic Jeffersonian vision, and the beautiful simplicity of its narrative structure makes it even more clear why Adams was absolutely right to admire Jefferson's knack for fitting himself into a storyline with immense appeal to future historians. Jefferson's mind consistently saw the world in terms of clashing dichotomies. Whigs versus Tories, moderns versus ancients, America versus Europe, rural conditions versus urban, whites versus blacks. The list could go on, but it always came down to the forces of light against the forces of darkness, with no room for anything in between. What Adams called a romance was actually a melodrama. And the specific version Jefferson was now offering Adams cast the Federalists in the role of Latter-day Tories, who had betrayed the expansive legacy of the American Revolution. The corrupt guardians of the privileged few aligned defiantly against the Jeffersonian many. But how could this be? Even Jefferson seemed to acknowledge that Adams didn't quite fit into this rigid formula. If your objects and opinions have been misunderstood, Jefferson noted, if the measures and principles of others have been wrongly imputed to you, as I believe they have been, that you should leave an explanation of them would be an act of justice to yourself. In effect, if Adams had a different story to tell, if he saw a different pattern in the historical swirl they had both lived through, he should write out his account and let posterity judge. Adams, of course, had been trying to do just that for over a decade. And, as we have seen, the result had been a bewildering jumble of tortured protestations, endless harangues, and futile displays of wounded pride, all leading to the rather disquieting conclusion that there was no pattern to be discovered, only one invented by fiction writers masquerading as historians. Glimmers of an un-Jeffersonian outline peeked through the cloud of words Adams had spewed out. The neat divisions between Whigs and Tories did not accord with the Adams' sense of the political landscape during the 1770s. Between a third and a half of the American people, he guessed, had been indifferent, and floated with the prevailing tide of the moment. The divisions of the 1790s didn't match up with Jefferson's categories either. 
since those supporting and those opposing a more powerful national government had all been good Whigs. Certainly neither he nor Washington had viewed themselves as traitors to the revolutionary cause. They had regarded their Federalist programs as a fulfillment rather than a betrayal of American independence. Nor did Jefferson's distinction between the few and the many work very well south of the Potomac, except in the ironic sense that only a few Virginians were willing to address the forbidden subject that shaped their lives, their fortunes, and that cast a long shadow over their sacred honor. But glimmerings do not a story make. Jefferson had a story. In the absence of a coherent alternative with equivalently compelling appeal, his story was destined to dominate the history books. Adams sensed that it wasn't the true story, even doubted whether such a thing as a true story existed. But once Jefferson laid it out before him so elegantly in the summer of 1813, Adams at last possessed a target on which to focus his considerable firepower. He was utterly hopeless as a grand designer of narratives, and he knew it. The artifice required to shape a major work of history or philosophy was not in him. But he was a natural contrarian, a born critic, whose fullest energies manifested themselves in the act of doing intellectual isometric exercises against the fixed objects presented by someone else's ideas. Jefferson now became the fixed object against which he strained. The conversational format of the correspondence with Jefferson also suited his temperament perfectly, since it permitted topics to pop up, recede, then appear again episodically, without any pretense of some overall design, the give-and-take rhythms of the dialogue matching nicely the episodic surgings of his own mind. As a result, no neatly arranged rendering of the running argument Adams had with Jefferson after 1813 can do justice to its dynamic character. All one can do is to identify the major points of contention, then impose a thematic order that draws out the deeper implications of the argument, all the while knowing that the coherence that results is itself a construction. The major argument running through the letters throughout 1813 and 1814 concerned their different definitions of social equality and the role of elites in leading and governing the American Republic. Without ever saying so directly, they were talking about themselves and the other prominent members of the revolutionary generation. The argument was prompted by Jefferson's long letter on the few and the many, and his accompanying assertion that the eternal political question had always been whether the power of the people or that of the aristoi should prevail. Even the ever-combative Adams realized that this was heavily mined ground, so he began on an agreeable note. Precisely, he told Jefferson, the distinction between the few and the many was as old as Aristotle and the timeless clash between them was the major reason he believed that the ancients had much to teach the moderns about politics. Having established some common ground, Adams then veered off in a direction that had always gotten him into political trouble, namely the inevitable role that elites play in making history happen. He recalled that it was Jefferson himself who had first encouraged him to write something upon aristocracy, when they were together in London, thirty years earlier. I soon began and have been writing upon that subject ever since. I have been so unfortunate as never to make myself understood. Your Aristoi, he lectured to Jefferson, are the most difficult animals to manage of anything in the whole theory and practice of government. In his defense... Adams had written three volumes of relentless and seemingly endless prose to show that political power invariably rested in the hands of a few prominent individuals and families. Whether it was the feudal barons of medieval France, the landed gentry of Elizabethan England, the merchant class of colonial New England, 
or the great planter families of the Chesapeake, history showed that the many always deferred to the few. Why? I say it is the ordinance of God Almighty in the constitution of human nature and wrought into the fabric of the universe, Adams answered. Philosophers and politicians may nibble and quibble, but they will never get rid of it. Their only resource is to control it. In the Adams formulation, aristocracies were to society as the passions were to the individual personality. Permanent fixtures, susceptible to disciplined containment and artful channeling, but never altogether removable. You may think you can eliminate it, Adams warned, but aristocracy, like waterfowl, dives for ages and rises again with brighter plumage. All the Jeffersonian chants about human equality were delusions that pandered to mankind's urge to believe an impossible dream. Inequalities of mind and body are so established by God Almighty in the constitution of human nature, Adams declared, that no art or policy can ever plane them down to a level. Jefferson's response took the form of two distinctions that together pointed in decidedly more optimistic directions. First, he agreed that there was a natural aristocracy among men, based on virtue and talents. Then there was an artificial or pseudo-aristocracy founded on wealth and birth, without either virtue or talents. Was not the whole point of the Republican experiment they had helped to launch in America to provide for the selection of the natural aristocrats and block the ascendance of the artificial pretenders, thereby separating the wheat from the chaff? And had that in fact not occurred during and after the American Revolution, with the band of brothers he and Adams had come to symbolize being the obvious beneficiaries of the Republican selection process? Second, Jefferson suggested that Adams's description of aristocratic power was appropriate for Europe, where feudal privileges, family titles, and more limited economic opportunities created conditions that sustained class distinctions. In America, on the other hand, there were no feudal barons or family coats of arms, and everyone may have land to labor for himself as he causes. So the endurance of artificial elites was impossible. Jefferson noted somewhat gratuitously that perhaps in New England vestiges of feudalism remained and thereby misled Adams. In Massachusetts and Connecticut there still lingered a traditional reverence for certain families which has rendered the offices of government nearly hereditary in those families. In Virginia, however, laws abolishing primogeniture and entail had been passed during the Revolution. These laws, drawn by myself, laid the axe to the root of the pseudo-aristocracy, Jefferson claimed, thereby clearing the ground for the growth of political institutions based on merit, and an admittedly imperfect form of equality of opportunity. Jefferson concluded on a gracious note. I have thus stated my opinion on a point on which we differ, he observed, not with a view to controversy, for we are too old to change opinions which are the result of a long life in inquiry and reflection, but on the suggestion of a former letter of yours, that we ought not to die before we have explained ourselves to each other. Adams contested both of Jefferson's distinctions. Europe was, to be sure, burdened with aristocratic legacies and gross disparities in wealth that were not present to the same degree in America. But unless one believed that human nature underwent some magical metamorphosis in migrating from Europe to America, or unless one believed that the American Revolution had produced a fundamental transformation in the human personality, the competition for wealth and power would also yield unequal results in America. After all, Adams observed, as long as property exists, it will accumulate in individuals and families. I repeat, so long as the idea and existence of property is admitted and established in society, accumulations of it will be made. The snowball will grow as it rolls. 
Jefferson's version of a classless American society was therefore a pipe dream, because the source of the problem was not European feudalism, but human nature itself. As far as Jefferson's description of Virginia's allegedly egalitarian conditions were concerned, no romance would be more amusing. Here, Adams confined himself to the still-dominant role played by the planter class in the Chesapeake region, not even mentioning the fact that 40% of the population was enslaved, a feudal remnant of awesome and ominous proportions. Finally, Adams apprised Jefferson, "'Your distinction between natural and artificial aristocracy does not appear to me well-founded. One might be able to separate wealth from talent in theory, but in practice and in all societies they were inextricably connected.' The five pillars of aristocracy, he argued, are beauty, wealth, birth, genius, and virtues. Any one of the three first can at any time overbear any one or both of the two last. But it would never come to that anyway, because the qualities Jefferson regarded as artificial and those he regarded as natural were all mixed together inside human nature, then mixed together again within society, in blended patterns that defied Jefferson's neat dissections. In a separate correspondence about the same time with John Taylor, another prominent Virginia planter and political thinker who had also questioned Adams's views on aristocracy, Adams called attention to the irony of the situation. The son of a New England farmer and shoemaker was being accused of aristocratic allegiances by an owner of slaves with vast estates, much of both inherited from his wife's side of the family. If you complain that this is personal, Adams explained to Taylor, I confess it and intend it should be personal, that it might be more striking to you. Though precisely the same situation obtained for Jefferson as well, he owned about 200 slaves and 10,000 acres, a goodly portion inherited from his father-in-law, Adams never confronted him so directly. The closest he came was his running joke about the difference between Monticello and Montezillo. Adams was fully prepared to include Jefferson as a charter member of the natural aristocracy that made and then secured the American Revolution. Along with most of the Virginia dynasty, however, his ascent into the revolutionary elite was not the exclusive function of talent and virtue. What Adams could never quite fathom, and Jefferson understood intuitively, was that the very word aristocracy had become an epithet in the political culture of post-revolutionary America. Even though Adams was surely correct about the disproportionate power exercised by elites throughout history, and even though the revolutionary generation had succeeded in establishing a republican government in large part because a small group of talented statesmen had managed the enterprise throughout its earliest and most vulnerable phases, a republican aristocracy seemed the same contradiction in terms as a republican king. It violated the central premise of the revolutionary legacy namely that the people at large were the sovereign source of all political authority. Therefore, the only kind of political elite permissible was one that repudiated its elite status and claimed to speak for the many rather than the few. The Republicans had been the first to grasp this elemental fact of American political culture in the 1790s. The Federalists, who were no more a social or economic elite than the Republicans, had come to ruin because they never grasped it. Adams could argue till doomsday that the American experiment in republicanism had succeeded because it had managed to harness the energies and talents of its best and brightest citizens, the very band of brothers he and Jefferson supposedly symbolized. But as long as he referred to them as an aristocracy— whether natural or artificial, he seemed to be defying the Republican legacy itself. Another argumentative thread which began in 1815 and then ran throughout the remainder of the correspondence concerned the French Revolution. 
Adams loved to bring the subject up in his correspondence with others, especially Benjamin Rush, because events had tended to vindicate his early apprehensions, which had produced the first fissures in his relationship with Jefferson in the early 1790s, and then became central ingredients in the Republican polemic against Adams in the presidential campaign of 1800. But it was Jefferson who first broached the subject in the correspondence, and he did so in a wholly conciliatory way. Your prophecies prove truer than mine, and yet fell short of the fact, for instead of a million, the destruction of eight or ten millions of human beings has probably been the effect of these convulsions. I did not, in 89, believe they would have lasted so long, nor have cost so much blood. Jefferson went on to acknowledge that Adams's critical perspective on the French Revolution had been a major source of his unpopularity. Now that Napoleon was finally defeated, word of Waterloo had just reached America, and the outcome was perfectly clear. Jefferson graciously observed that Adams was due an apology for the breach of confidence of which you so justly complain, and of which no one has more frequent occasion of fellow feeling than myself. Only someone thoroughly familiar with the political history of the 1790s could recognize what a major concession and personal confession of regret Jefferson was making. Adams caught the message immediately. I know not what to say of your letter, he wrote, but that it is one of the most consolatory I have ever received. For Jefferson was not only admitting that his optimistic assessment of events in revolutionary France had been misguided, he was also conceding that the Republican Party, to include himself, had played politics with the French Revolution in order to undermine the Adams presidency. Jefferson was making amends for what the Adams family had understandably regarded as the singular act of betrayal. He was saying, at last, that he was sorry. Adams suggested that Jefferson had misread the meaning of the French Revolution— sincerely misread it and not just manipulated it for political purposes, because of a faulty way of thinking conveniently conveyed by the new French word ideology. Napoleon had popularized the word which had first been used by the French philosophe Destut de Tracy, whom Jefferson had read and admired enormously. Adams claimed to be fascinated by the new word, upon the common principle of delight in everything we cannot understand. What was an ideology? he asked playfully. Does it mean idiotism? The science of non compos menticism? The science of lunacy? The theory of delirium? As Adams explained it, the French philosophes had invented the word, which became a central part of their utopian style of thinking, and a major tenet in their school of folly. It referred to a set of ideals and hopes, like human perfection or social equality, that philosophers mistakenly believed could be implemented in the world because it existed in their heads. Jefferson himself thought in this French fashion, Adams claimed, confusing the seductive prospects envisioned in his imagination with the more limited possibilities history permitted. Critics of Jefferson's visionary projections, like Adams, were then accused of rejecting the ideals themselves, when in fact they were merely exposing their illusory character. Ideology, then, had provided Jefferson with a politically attractive pro-French platform, which had turned out to have enormous rhetorical advantages, no matter how wrong it proved in reality. Jefferson had thought that France was the wave of the future and England was a relic of the past. I am charmed by the fluency and rapidity of your reasoning, Adams observed, but I doubt your conclusion. England, not France, was destined to become the dominant European power of the 19th century, Adams correctly predicted, though he, like Jefferson, retained a deep suspicion of English designs on America, a permanent legacy of their mutual experience as American revolutionaries. They have been taught from their cradles to despise, scorn, insult, and abuse us, Adams wrote of the English, adding in his most relentlessly realistic mode that Britain will never be our friend till we are her master. 
both Adams and Jefferson, it turned out, were too deeply shaped by the desperate struggle against England to foresee the Anglo-American alliance that flourished throughout the Victorian era and beyond. They both did anticipate, albeit from decidedly different perspectives, the looming sectional crisis between North and South that their own partnership stretched across. I fear there will be greater difficulties to preserve our union, Adams warned, than you and I, our fathers, brothers, disciples, and sons have had to form it. Jefferson concurred, though the subject touched the most explosive issue of all, namely the unmentionable fact of slavery. Even the ever-candid Adams recognized that this was the forbidden topic, the one piece of ground declared off-limits by mutual consent. With one notable exception, the dialogue between Adams and Jefferson, so revealing in its engagement of the conflicting ideas and impulses that shaped the American Revolution, also symbolized the unofficial policy of silence within the revolutionary generation on the most glaring disagreement of all. The exception occurred in 1819, prompted by the debate then raging over passage of the Missouri Compromise. Prior to that time, Adams and Jefferson had not only avoided the subject in their correspondence, they had also independently declared the matter intractable. More than fifty years has it attracted my thoughts and given me much anxiety, Adams confessed in 1817. A folio volume would not contain my lucubrations on this subject, and at the end of it I should leave my reader and myself at a loss what to do with it as at the beginning. For his part, Jefferson kept repeating the avoidance argument he had fashioned in 1805. I have most carefully avoided every public act or manifestation on that subject, he announced, explaining that the abolition of slavery was a task for the next generation, who can follow it up and bear it through to its consummation. Even though the congressional debate over the Missouri question was essentially an argument about the extension of slavery into the territories, the Code of Silence governed the lengthy exchanges in the House of Representatives, which focused exclusively on the constitutional question of federal versus state jurisdiction rather than on the problem of slavery itself. Jefferson, for his part, was outraged that the issue was being discussed at all. But the Missouri question is a breaker, on which we lose the Missouri country by revolt, and what more, God only knows, he complained to Adams. From the Battle of Bunker's Hill to the Treaty of Paris, we never had so ominous a question. Jefferson understood full well that the constitutional argument over federal jurisdiction merely masked the deeper issue at stake, and he said so to Adams. The real question, as seen in the states afflicted with this unfortunate population, is, are our slaves to be presented with freedom and a dagger? For if Congress has a power to regulate the conditions of the inhabitants of states within the states, it will be but another exercise of that power to declare that all shall be free. Are we then to wage another Peloponnesian war to settle the ascendancy between them? That question remains to be seen but not, I hope, by you or me. Surely they will parlay a while and give us time to get out of the way. Adams, usually the more apocalyptic member of the team, in this instance adopted the more sanguine Jeffersonian posture. I hope some good-natured way or other will be found out to untie this very intricate knot, he counseled. With his other correspondence, though not with Jefferson, he was much more forthright. Negro slavery is an evil of colossal magnitude, he wrote to William Tudor, and I am utterly averse to the admission of slavery into the Missouri Territory. What's more, he welcomed the very debate that Jefferson abhorred. We must settle the question of slavery's extension now, he told his daughter-in-law. Otherwise, it will stamp our national character and lay a foundation for calamities, if not disunion. As for the constitutional question, he regarded federal jurisdiction over the Western territories as a clear precedent that had been established, irony of ironies, 
by Jefferson's executive action in the Louisiana Purchase. Over the course of the next four decades, the national debate over slavery and its expansion into the West was often framed as an argument over the intent of the founders. Here were two of the unequivocally original patriarchs, declaring that their respective understandings of the revolution's legacy concerning slavery were fundamentally different. Jefferson's version led directly to the doctrine of popular sovereignty embraced by Stephen Douglas, to the state's rights position of John C. Calhoun, and then the Confederacy. Adams's version led directly to the house-divided position of Abraham Lincoln, the conviction that abolishing slavery was a moral imperative bequeathed by the revolutionary generation to their successors, and the doctrine of federal sovereignty established by the victory of the Union in the Civil War. When it came to slavery, it would seem, there was no singular vision, only contradictory original intentions. The dominant legacy, of course, was avoidance and silence. Jefferson objected so strenuously to the debate over the Missouri question because it violated that legacy. In the gloomiest moments of the Revolutionary War, he wrote in 1820, I never had any apprehensions equal to what I feel from this source. In their last exchange on the topic, Adams suggested that he too would observe the unwritten code and carry his concerns to the grave. Slavery in this country I have seen hanging over it like a black cloud for half a century. I might probably say I had seen armies of Negroes marching and countermarching in the air, shining in armor. I have been so terrified with this phenomenon that I constantly said in former times to the Southern gentlemen, I cannot comprehend this object. I must leave it to you. I will vote for forcing no measure against your judgments. Neither the Revolution nor the Infant Republic could have succeeded without the support of the Southern states. So Adams had deferred to the Virginians to assume leadership of the anti-slavery movement. By 1820, it was abundantly clear that they had failed in this mission, with Jefferson himself the most visible symbol of the failure. But Adams chose to keep his vow of silence, at least with Jefferson, thereby honoring the etiquette of the friendship above his moral reservations, and simultaneously making the dialogue between Quincy and Monticello a final testament to the most problematic legacy of the revolutionary generation. The correspondence lost its argumentative edge and shifted back to an elegiac still-life pattern after 1820. One final flurry occurred in 1819, when a document appeared in the newspapers purportedly drafted by a group of citizens in Mecklenburg County, North Carolina, in May of 1775, and containing language eerily similar to Jefferson's later draft of the Declaration of Independence. Adams called Jefferson's attention to the discovery, noting that he wished he had known about it back then. I would have made the Hall of Congress echo and re-echo with it fifteen months before your Declaration of Independence. Nothing could have been better calculated to activate all of Jefferson's interior antennae, since his primacy as the author of the Declaration was his major claim to everlasting fame. He responded promptly, insisting that this paper is a fabrication, urging Adams to remain skeptical until positive and solemn proof of its authenticity shall be provided. Adams quickly reassured Jefferson that he now believed that the Mecklenburg resolutions are a fiction. Meanwhile, however, he was telling other correspondents quite the opposite. I could as soon believe that the dozen flowers of the hydrangea now before my eyes were the work of chance, he joked, as that the Mecklenburg resolutions and Mr. Jefferson's declaration were not derived one from the other. Adams himself derived great satisfaction from the Mecklenburg incident, not so much because he believed Jefferson was a plagiarist, but because he thought the whole emphasis on one man, one moment, and one document distorted the true story of the American Revolution. 
Even though the Mecklenburg Declaration was subsequently exposed as a forgery, it accurately reflected the Adams' sense that there were multiple venues or theaters where the drama of the movement for independence was playing out, and multiple culminating moments besides July 4, 1776. In his own memoirs, he had selected May 15, 1776 as the most decisive moment, because that was the day the Continental Congress passed a resolution calling for new constitutions in each of the states. Not so coincidentally, Adams had drafted and moved the resolution. In the Adams version, this decision was truly decisive, because it created separate and independent American governments. It also meant that the revolution was a responsible and positive commitment to new forms of political discipline rooted in the experience of the old colonial governments, not just a negative assertion of separation from England and a complete break with the past, as Jefferson's declaration seemed to suggest. According to Adams, the revolution succeeded because of its ties to the past, which meant that in the Jeffersonian sense, it was not really a revolution at all. Though the brief exchange over the Mecklenburg Declaration touched on these significant differences of opinion, the diplomatic imperatives of the dialogue ruled out full disclosure. By 1820, even Adams had stopped firing off his illumination rounds and had adopted the Jeffersonian posture of benign duplicity, preferring to risk hypocrisy rather than the friendship. Though his prose remained pungent, the more dangerous bursts of candor had subsided, especially after Abigail passed away in October of 1818. As she lay in bed dying, Adams remained composed, but told the gathered relatives, I wish I could lay down beside her and die too. Jefferson had always claimed that each generation should not linger beyond its allotted time that one had almost a moral obligation to clear the ground for the next generation by placing oneself beneath it. Now both patriarchs seemed to sense that they had outlived their time. Looking back on life, wrote Jefferson, was like looking over a field of battle. All, all dead, and ourselves left alone amidst a new generation whom we know not and who know not us. The vicissitudes of aging began to crowd out the more controversial topics. Crippled wrists and fingers make writing slow and laborious, Jefferson complained. But while writing to you, I lose the sense of these things in the recollection of ancient times, when youth and health made happiness out of everything. I forget for a while the hoary winter of age when we can think of nothing but how to keep ourselves warm and how to get rid of our heavy hours until the friendly hand of death shall rid us of all at once. Adams agreed that memories of the past were all that was left, and he too preferred to remember only the good ones. I look back with rapture to those golden days when Virginia and Massachusetts lived and acted together like a band of brothers, he recalled, and though the end was near, while I breathe, I shall be your friend. They referred to life in the hereafter not as a chance to see God so much as an opportunity to converse with each other and the other band of brothers. As Jefferson put it, may we meet there again with our ancient colleagues and receive with them the seal of approbation. Adams concurred that the reunion in heaven would permit them to laugh at their human follies and foibles, though he would talk with Franklin only after the great man did proper penance for his sins. Neither man was completely convinced that heaven was anything more than a metaphor. Adams was on record as thinking that the belief in life everlasting was more important than the thing itself. If it would be revealed or demonstrated that there is no future state, he apprised one friend, my advice to every man, woman, and child would be, as our existence would be in our own power, to take opium. Or, as he put it to Jefferson, if we are disappointed, we shall never know it. Each man was hedging his bets on the hereafter by preparing his private papers for posterity. 
the one place where they knew their prospects of immortality were assured. And both men regarded the letters they were writing to each other as the capstone to that final project. There's no question that the emotional bond between the two patriarchs was restored, and the friendship recovered toward the end. They no longer had to pose as partners, or what amounts to the same thing, the posing reflected a deeply felt sense of affinity. In part, the bonding occurred because the correspondence of their twilight years permitted both sages to confront and argue out their different notions of the history they had lived and made together. Jefferson had made his amends and some crucial concessions. Adams had expressed his feisty and passionate objections to the Jeffersonian constructions in one last catharsis. One would like to believe, and there is some basis for the belief, that each man came to recognize in the other the intellectual and temperamental qualities lacking in himself, that they, in effect, completed each other, that only when joined could the pieces of the story of the American Revolution come together to make a whole. But the more mundane truth is that they never faced, and therefore never fully resolved, all their political differences. They simply outlived them. At the start of the correspondence, Adams had felt deep resentment toward Jefferson for the libels he had sponsored during the Adams presidency. By 1823, the whole subject of scandal had become a nostalgic joke. Adams read in the newspapers that Jefferson had compiled a magazine of slips of newspapers and pamphlets vilifying, calumniating, and defaming you. This was an inspired idea that Adams wished he had had first. What a dunce I have been all my days, and what lovers my children and grandchildren were, that none of us have ever thought to make a similar collection." If we had, I am confident I could have produced a more splendid mass than yours. Jefferson regretted to inform Adams that the story was untrue. He had not compiled a collection of the libels against himself. If he had, however, it would not indeed have been a single volume, but an encyclopedia in bulk. They had become living relics. In 1824, the Marquis de Lafayette, the great French champion of American independence, paid a final visit to America. Monticello and Quincy were obligatory stops on his tour. In each location the reunion drew large crowds, in which witnesses claimed they saw two ghosts from a bygone era materializing one final time for the benefit of the present generation. The American sculptor John Henry Brower also visited both sages, who were asked to sit for life masks designed to produce reliable likenesses of their faces and heads, in effect to make realistic icons of the icons. Jefferson found the process, which required pouring successive coats of a hot plaster-like liquid over the head, so uncomfortable that he vowed to bid adieu forever to busts and portraits. His final adieu to Adams conveyed the same strange sense of being regarded as living statues. He entrusted his last letter to his grandson, Thomas Jefferson Randolph, who was traveling to Boston and would make a stop in Quincy. Like other young people, he wishes to be able, in the winter nights of old age, to recount to those around him what he has learnt of the heroic age preceding his birth and which of the Argonauts particularly he was in time to have seen. For most Americans coming of age in the 1820s, the American Revolution had long since been enshrined as a sacred moment in the distant past, when a gallery of heroes had been privileged to see God face to face. It was awkward to realize that a few of them were still alive. But they were. And as the 50th anniversary of Independence Day approached, requests poured into Monticello and Quincy from across the land, asking the patriarchs to share their wisdom and memories about the meaning of it all. Though seriously ill with an intestinal disorder that would eventually prove fatal, Jefferson summoned up the energy for one final spasm of eloquence. For several days he worked over the draft of a letter to the committee responsible for the Independence Day ceremonies in Washington, crossing out and revising the language with as much attention to detail 
as he had given the original declaration. He regretted that his deteriorating health prevented him from attending the ceremonies in person and joining the small band, the remnant of that host of worthies who joined with us on that day. Only three of the original signers survived, Adams, Jefferson, and Charles Carroll of Maryland. Then he offered the Jeffersonian version of what the host of worthies had done. May it be to the world what I believe it will be, to some parts sooner, to others later, but finally to all, the signal of arousing men to burst the chains under which monkish ignorance and superstition had persuaded them to bind themselves, and to assume the blessings and security of self-government. All eyes are opened or opening to the rights of man. The general spread of the light of science has already laid open to every view the palpable truth that the mass of mankind has not been born with saddles on their backs, nor a favored few, booted and spurred, ready to ride them legitimately by the grace of God. These are grounds of hope for others. For ourselves, let the annual return of this day forever refresh our recollection of these rites and an undiminished devotion to them. Here was the vintage Jeffersonian vision. It viewed the American Revolution as an explosion that dislodged America from England, from Europe, from the past itself. The opening shot in a global struggle for liberation from all forms of oppression that was destined to sweep around the world. In this formulation, all forms of authority not originating within the self were stigmatized and placed on the permanent defensive. The American Revolution had not just repudiated the tyranny of the English king and parliament. It had defied all political institutions with coercive powers of any sort, including the kind of national government established by the Federalists in the 1790s. The inspirational rhetoric of the statement was not original. The phrases, saddles on their backs, and a favored few booted and spurred, had been lifted from a famous speech delivered by Colonel Richard Rumbold, a Puritan soldier convicted of treason in 1685, who spoke the words from the gallows. Jefferson owned several copies of English histories that reprinted the Rumbold speech. Perhaps as a dying man like Rumbold, Jefferson thought he had every right to claim a favorite piece of eloquence as his own. But the borrowed rhetoric was only one small feature of a uniquely Jeffersonian message that was inherently rhetorical in character. That is, it framed the issues at a rarefied altitude, where all answers were self-evident and no real choices had to be made. And that was the ultimate source of its beguiling charm. The Jeffersonian vision floated. It functioned at inspirational levels above the bedeviling particularities, like a Big Bang theory of the American Revolution now destined to expand throughout the world, naturally and inevitably, no longer in doubt or in human hands. Adams also received many requests from federal and state committees charged with organizing the celebration of what was being called the Jubilee of Independence. Irreverent to the end, for a time he resisted, insisting that the 4th of July was not really the right date. Indeed, there was no one right date, and the passage of the Declaration of Independence was merely an ornamental occasion bereft of any larger historical significance. When a delegation from Quincy came out to visit him to request words for a toast at the local celebration, he was curt. "'I will give you independence forever,' he replied. When asked to enumerate or explain, he refused. "'Not a word,' he insisted." Eventually, several family friends prodded a few amplifying rewards from the otherwise loquacious patriarch. He conceded that the era of the American Revolution had been a memorable epoch in the annals of the human race, but the jury was still out on its significance. He doubted whether the Republican principles planted by the founding generation would grow in foreign soil. 
Neither Europe nor Latin America were ready for them. Even within the United States, the fate of those principles was still problematic. He warned that America was destined in future history to form the brightest or blackest page, according to the use or the abuse of those political institutions by which they shall in time to come be shaped by the human mind. Asked to pose for posterity, he chose to go out hurling it a challenge. The Adams formulation was precisely the opposite of Jefferson's. It lacked the lyrical eloquence and the floating optimism of the Jeffersonian version because it was grounded in the palpable sense of contingency Adams had internalized over his long career. For Adams, the American Revolution was still an experiment, a sail into uncharted waters that no other ship of state had ever successfully navigated. There were no maps or charts to guide a Republican government claiming to derive its authority and legitimacy from public opinion. That murky source of sovereignty that could be as choppy and unpredictable as waves on the ocean. He had been a member of the crew on this maiden voyage, even taken his turn at the helm. So he knew as well as anyone, better than most, that they had nearly crashed and sunk on several occasions had argued bitterly among themselves throughout the 1790s about the proper course. Jefferson seemed to think that, once unmoored from British docks and unburdened of European baggage, the ship would sail itself into the proverbial sunset. Adams thought he knew better, and he also would go to his grave, believing that a fully empowered federal government on the Federalist model was a fulfillment rather than a betrayal of the course they had set at the start. Without a sanctioned central government to steer the still fragile American Republic, the new crew was certain to founder on that huge rock called slavery, which was lurking dead ahead in the middle distance, and that even Jefferson acknowledged to be a breaker. The more providential Jeffersonian version of the story triumphed in the history books, as Adams knew it would. Helped along by one final act of fate that everyone, then and now, regarded as the unmistakable voice of God. On the evening of July 3rd, 1826, Jefferson fell into a coma. His last discernible words, uttered to the physician and family gathered around the bedside, indicated he was hoping to time his exit in dramatic fashion. Is it the fourth? It was not, but he lingered in a semi-conscious condition until shortly after noon on the magic day. That same morning, Adams collapsed in his favorite reading chair. He lapsed into unconsciousness at almost the exact moment Jefferson died. The end came quickly at about 5.30 that afternoon. He wakened for a brief moment indicated that nothing more should be done to prolong the inevitable, then, with obvious effort, gave a final salute to his old friend with his last words. Thomas Jefferson survives, or, by another account, Thomas Jefferson still lives. Whatever the version, he was wrong for the moment, but right for the ages. The End You've been listening to Founding Brothers by Joseph J. Ellis, narrated by Nelson Runger. During the production of this book at our New York studio, Recorded Books was pleased to speak by phone with Joseph J. Ellis from a studio near his home in Amherst, Massachusetts. You will find that interview on the final cassette or disc. If you've enjoyed this book and this performance, Recorded Books recommends Benjamin Franklin, Diplomat by Benjamin Franklin, narrated by Adrian Cronauer. You'll find a wide selection of titles in the Recorded Books catalog, including bestsellers, mysteries, classics, histories, and more. So to order another Recorded Book, or for a copy of our latest listing, please call us using the toll-free number found on the back of the book. You can order by phone with any major credit card, or by writing to us, or by faxing us. Don't forget to ask about easy 30-day rentals by mail. 
On our website, you can browse the catalog, hear about the latest releases, place orders, or tune into narrator profiles and author interviews. So visit us there at www.recordedbooks.com. And thank you for being a Recorded Books reader. Recorded Books Incorporated presents The Author Talks, a conversation with Joseph J. Ellis. Joseph J. Ellis is the Ford Foundation Professor of History at Mount Holyoke College. Educated at the College of William and Mary and Yale University, he served as a captain in the Army and taught at West Point before coming to Mount Holyoke in 1972. He was dean of the faculty there for ten years. Among his previous books are Passionate Sage, The Character and Legacy of John Adams, and American Sphinx, which won the 1997 National Book Award. During the production of Founding Brothers at our New York studio, Recorded Books was pleased to speak by phone with Joseph J. Ellis from a studio near his home in Amherst, Massachusetts. The following is his conversation with the Author Talks host, Denise Longto. Today from the Manhattan studios of Recorded Books, we're speaking with New York Times best-selling author Joseph Ellis from his hometown of Amherst, Massachusetts. Welcome, Professor Ellis, and thank you for visiting with us today. My pleasure, Denise. Today we'll be talking about your most recent popular history, Founding Brothers. Can you tell our listeners the genesis of the idea for your book? Well, I had written two previous books over the last decade, one on Thomas Jefferson called American Sphinx, and the other on John Adams called Passionate Sage. And um, in some sense, the research that uh, was done for those gave me a good head start on a book about the entire revolutionary generation, and more than that, the kind of relationship that existed between Jefferson and Adams, um, who were quite different folk and uh, different temperaments, kind of odd couple of the American Revolution, what I sometimes call the words and the music of the American Revolution, caused me to think about the way in which the entire revolutionary generation, that incredible group of political leaders, were really very, very different people. And the dynamic interaction among them was the thing I wanted to try to get at in this particular book. And you've done it so successfully. Your book was inspired by a much earlier book in terms of its structural form. Can you tell our listeners about that? Well, in the introduction or preface to Founding Brothers, I say that I was trying to find a way, I was grasping for a way that um, I could write a reasonably brief and succinct book about a sort of massive historical subject and could um, find a way to bring these men alive for modern readership without tripping over the dead bodies of all the scholars that have written about them in the past. I needed to find a model in which less uh, was more. I could be more selective. And the book that, that really was a model in that regard is Lytton Strachey's uh, little classic called Eminent Victorians. Now, in his book, the word eminent is meant to be ironic. He's writing a pretty devastating critique of the great Victorians of 19th century England. Um, my book is uh, not an attempt to uh, kill off all of these men, um, and they are mostly men. Um, Abigail Adams gets into the story in a big way. Um, but it was, uh, it, it was a model that allowed me to be selective, to bring my little bucket into the ocean of material and pull up the specimens that I thought were the most interesting and the most resonant for modern-day American readers. Eminent Victorians was, in its time, an extremely popular book. Your book has been on the New York Times bestsellers list for, I think, 11 weeks now. What do you attribute, aside from your lively writing, to your success, given that the histories of the American Revolution are not often up there with Tom Clancy? That's right. I, I'm really happy. I think it's, it's, uh, it's a surprise to me and, to some extent, to the publisher, Knopp, that the book has has uh, done as well as it has, at least uh, commercially. Um, I think that there, there probably are a couple of reasons. Um, I think that um, a great many American historians, uh, very good ones indeed, uh, have abandoned the general reader and are writing books only to each other, those in the groves of academe. And what it means is that for those of us who, who don't want to do that and who want to both have a scholarly profile but also um, write in a way that makes accessible to a general audience some of the some of the scholarly ideas and the intellectual stuff of American history, that there's not as much competition. In some ways, I'm a beneficiary of that, though I'd like to see more of my colleagues addressing a general audience. I think it also goes to show that there really is an appetite out there, a real craving for um, reasonably accessible American history, um, especially for the founding generation. And I think that to some extent I was also the beneficiary of the November and early December Florida circus uh, the electoral controversy 
um, in which um, a lot of Americans began to ask questions like, well, how did we get this thing called the Electoral College? And why are we making a choice between Gore and Bush when, say, 200 years ago, we were choosing between Jefferson and Adams? And to what extent have, have we really seen a kind of decline in the quality of American political leadership? And, and why is that? And so people with those kind of questions found my book to be interesting. Once you decided the structure of your book, how did you go about researching the material? I'm a person who believes that you need to start writing um, before you really research. And um, I wanted each chapter to be uh, an independent story, if you will. And I wanted to think about the main figures, the main characters in those stories as a kind of repertory company. Um, The main figures are George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, Alexander Hamilton, Benjamin Franklin, James Madison, Aaron Burr, and a quite important supporting role for Abigail Adams. And I wanted to then be able to bring those characters into each of the stories or scenes, sometimes as leading men and sometimes as supporting actors. And so I thought about the structure of the book as acts or scenes which were designed to capture the attention of readers. It it produces an account which is not attempting to be a totally comprehensive history of late 18th century America. It's more episodic, but it's an attempt to land on those moments which raise the most interesting and the most propitious uh, issues, such as, you know, why we have a national capital where it is in Washington, why they didn't end slavery, how political parties were created, why the American foreign policy became isolationist in the late 18th century, those kind of issues. Was it liberating to write in this fashion, taking dramatic highlights and asking those theatrical scenes to serve as a collective image? I'm not sure liberating is the term I'd use. It's, it's to me, the most fulfilling way to try to, there, you know, while in the end I'm not a novelist, I'm a, I'm a nonfiction writer, and someone said, well, why don't you write historical fiction? And I, I said, I don't have enough of an imagination. Um, My imagination must always be tethered to the evidence. I'm a historian and a biographer. Um, And sometimes people say, oh, gosh, Joe, your your writing seems so fluid and so fluent. It must be so easy for you. And, you know, I sit there thinking, well, you know, that paragraph that you found so fluid took me about three days. Um, uh, But I think that the act of um, creating a series of scenes and stories meant that I could write one of them without knowing for sure what the next one was going to be. And in the act of writing the one, um, that one, I began to generate new ideas about the next one. So each, I won't say it was an act of improvisation each time, but it allowed space for me to think about what was going to come next. Oh, so they really had an impact on one another. Right. And the first one I did was the first chapter, well, it's really the second chapter in the book, but it's the first uh, chapter that's a big one, and that's called The Duel. And it's chronologically out of place. The duel happens in 1804, and it's the last really um, moment in, in chronologically in the book's uh, time span. But because of the issues raised by the duel between Hamilton and Burr, I thought it set up the rest of the book because it basically showed the way in which this was a time when character still mattered. And while we were eventually going to become a republic of laws, during this time we still were a, a government of men, and character and virtue were really crucial, and that was the issue that brought Hamilton and Burr to the plains of Weehawken with pistols in their hands. Now, I imagine that you called more pivotal stories concerning these six men's lives than you could use in your book. Right. Did you leave behind any that would constitute another book? Oh, probably there are three or four books that could be written uh, on issues that are not discussed at length in Founding Brothers. Um, I think that um, the way in which uh, slavery is discussed in one chapter on slavery called The Silence This could be a whole book of its own. But I don't think I'm going to go back and write another Founding Brothers Revisited. I think my own pass over this material and over the political culture of this moment, um, I think I've said what I want to say. And if others want to come in and do something like that with different kind of episodes, more more than welcome. But um, I think I've had my say about that issue. Is it true that an Indian nation, I think it was the Iroquois, were responsible or helpful in terms of the notion of democracy? There's been some writing, scholarly writing, on the way in which the confederation of uh, Native American tribes called the Iroquois um, fashioned um, political arrangements amongst and within their tribes that that were early or forerunners of uh, the American Constitution. I think that the sum of scholarly wisdom on this uh, over the last five or ten years has been that that argument has been a bit oversold 
and that um, to try to suggest that the Iroquois provided a model for state or federal constitutions in the United States is, is a bit of a stretch. Now, your book makes our founding fathers our founding brothers. What constituted the fraternity which for so long has been perceived as a paternity? Well, it, it is a paternity as well as a fraternity, though there, as I say, Abigail's in there in a big way. Um, I think the single most important fact that we need to recover is that they saw themselves they saw themselves as a band of brothers, not as a group of founding fathers, but as a band of brothers um, who had come together, um, who were, if you will, present at the creation of what was going to become an American empire, and that it was an extraordinarily improbable set of events that allowed them to succeed. The American Revolution looked so inevitable in retrospect. At the time, it was highly improbable. The chances of this tiny group of 13 colonies defeating the major military and naval power in the world, Great Britain, were, you know, roughly one in 10,000. So when they stepped up to sign the Declaration of Independence and pledged their lives, their fortunes, and their sacred honor, most of them thought they were signing their death warrants. And the fact that they were uh, together at that moment, at that really cru crucial moment, and then this group of people stays together for 30 or 40 years to provide the leadership of the republic. That's what bonds them. In addition, they see each other face to face, break bread with each other, have drinks with each other. They are close physically. Um, that doesn't mean they all like each other. And the, certainly the 1790s is famous for being a kind of raucous and almost scatological time. But it does mean that they had this searing common experience of winning an American Revolution and then founding a new nation, and that bonded them in a way that uh, in really no other event in American history could possibly have done. What other precedents are there in history for this type of a, an event? Well, I think that there might not be any. When you think about the political leadership of other revolutions in modern world history, whether it be in France or whether it be in Russia or whether it be in China, what usually happens in each of those events is the revolutionary leadership successfully wins the revolution, then ends up creating a totalitarian state in which one group of people assumes primacy and kills off, literally, its enemies and establishes uh, a reign of terror. That did not happen in the United States, in part because instead of establishing a set of doctrinal propositions that the new republic was to be founded on, it said we are going to establish a set of propositions about which we can all argue, not all agree, but all argue about. And I think Lincoln said that America was founded on a proposition, and Jefferson wrote it. What I would say is America was founded on an argument about what that proposition means. And the entire late 18th century is a shouting match over how we should interpret the Constitution, what those phrases in the Declaration mean about freedom and equality. And political parties represent a kind of routinization of the argument, one side against the other. Let's talk about how the founding father, excuse me, <laughs> it's so ingrained in my school memory. Well, one of the reasons I want to call them brothers rather than fathers is that fathers distances us from them. Fathers allows them to be those austere icons, those marble uh, figures that don't have any flesh and blood. Brothers allows us to see them, again, as they saw each other, not as demigods, but as real flesh and blood human beings with great flaws as well as with great strengths. Right. Well, let's talk about how the founding brothers themselves talked. They seemed to agree to disagree and worked out their fiery differences. Can you talk about that approach to conflict and why it was successful and compare it to our modes of political discussion today? That's a tough question. Um, I think that they had to reach a basic agreement in 1775-76 that they were all committed to an independent American nation. There couldn't really be any disagreement on that. And if you disagreed on that particular question, you were a Tory, and that meant you were cast into everlasting darkness, and once the revolution was won, um, you had no role to play. But once you then said that the second founding moment was the establishment of an independent American nation, done officially by the Constitution in 1787-88. The Constitution establishes the framework for an argument about a whole slew of things. Where is, where is power located? At the state level or the federal level? The, uh, the official answer, it's neither. It's with the people. But what in heaven's name does that mean? Who are the people? Which people? And it goes beyond that to say, which is your highest priority? Is it freedom or is it equality? And if it's equality, what kind of equality? Those are arguments which continue to be with us. And, I mean, even in the most recent presidential election, arguments about affirmative action, arguments about whether welfare programs should be returned completely to the states, foreign policy arguments about whether we should play a significant role in the world or withdraw to a greater extent and only intervene in the most uh, rare occurrences, all those are echoes of debates that were begun in the 1780s and 90s. Do we debate in the same way? Have we lost the art of debate or discourse, which is at the heart of a democracy? I think that the... Uh, the crush of media attention 
the intense and uh, everlasting focus uh, that the media offers on every private act as well as every public act of any kind of political figure mean that our ongoing debates now are less deep, less interesting. I think that, for example, if you said to either Jefferson or Adams, and most especially Washington, if you said, you're going to have to run a political campaign that's going to last two years and uh, make yourself available every hour of the day to the press and raise millions of dollars of money to pay for the, the TV ads, none of them would run. The culture of the modern campaign is incompatible with the kind of personal integrity that they thought was at the core of their own uh, talent. And also content was never ignored. I mean, it was not sound bites. It seems that content is so often ignored for sort of advertisements in a way. Right. I mean, they didn't have to talk in a 20-second uh, soundbite format. I mean, when Washington uh, writes his farewell address, it's a, you know, you assign that in college today and students say, man, I can't pay attention for as long as it takes me to read that. Well, every American that was literate back then, and that was roughly 80 percent of them, read that and thought that that was... Um, that that was something that they all were supposed to read. People would get up and give speeches that would last for two to three hours in the Congress, and the gallery was packed. People's attention spans were longer um, in, in, in the late 18th century. Now, your last chapter concerns Adams and Jefferson's correspondence later in life as they looked back at the Republic and their role in its formative years. If Jefferson and Adams were to come back today and begin an email correspondence about the Republic as it now stands, what might that dialogue consist of? I think that uh, the good card-carrying historian's answer to that question is going to be, well, you can't bring them back alive into this moment and retain the mentality that they had back in 1826, which is when they died, um, that trying to bring these people forward into a, a moment like now is like trying to plant cut flowers. It's very, very difficult. That said, I think that historians who claim that we can't talk about the 18th century values as related to our 21st century values. People who think that the past is a distant country that we go to visit, but we can't really interact with that past now here in the present. I don't think they're being historians so much as antiquarians. I mean, I think the dialogue between then and now is what we are, as historians, supposed to be trying to, to give integrity to. So I have some obligation to try to answer the question. And um, I think that... Um, both Jefferson and Adams would be struck by the materialism of our culture, the consumer culture. The malls would especially uh, upset Adams, who would see that as a kind of creeping or, in fact, an avalanche of uh, sinful habits that will sap the eventual strength uh, of the American economy and of the American character. They, they saw, and they both of them uh, recognized that the strength of the American nation depended upon the in some ways, the austere virtue of, of its citizens and the level of affluence present today is probably something they couldn't even fathom. That said, I think they would not be at all surprised to see the United States as the dominant hegemonic power in the world. They both knew that they were founding an empire that was destined, if it could succeed at the start, to go down in history as one of the major players. And I don't think that the underlying issues in a, a national campaign, once translated for them a bit, would be so alien to them. I think that the debate about federal versus state power is something that they would understand completely. And the role of bipartisanship or partisanship is something they both experienced. And when, if you brought them back to review the most recent presidential election, the one that, that eventually uh, led to a Supreme Court decision in behalf of uh, Mr. Bush, they would say, I think, look, you think that this is a huge trauma. This is nothing compared to what we faced. Um, this did not put the republic at risk. The events that we lived through and oversaw, um, each of them, if we failed, would have meant the death of the nation state. This was, a, in some sense, we've succeeded. And one wag said that the American Constitution is a document designed by geniuses to be eventually um, interpreted by idiots. And uh, I don't mean to suggest either Mr. Gore or Mr. Bush is an idiot, but I'm saying that they set up a system that doesn't require greatness at the top to survive any longer. Well, that was a great answer. Can you talk about the idea of political honor? and what that meant to the Founding Brothers. The matter of honor can, you know, you can begin to sound like some sort of um, quaint and archaic Victorian if you start talking about it in positive terms these days. But I think that one of the points I'm trying to make in my book is that honor still mattered in the late 18th century in a big way because the institutions that were established uh, in the 1780s and 90s by the political generation we call the Founding Brothers were still new. They hadn't taken root the nation state that we take for granted, called the United States, was still an embryonic nation. Most European commentators felt 
that it was going to dissolve into a series of regional sovereignties. There had never been a republic over this span of ground ever before in world history. So that the leadership of this new state needed to be a leadership that could be trusted, that could be trusted to do what was in the public interest, not just in their own personal or private interest. And so acting in the public interest, being capable of virtue, and Washington is the most important embodiment of that kind of virtue, is absolutely crucial in this early stage of the nation's history. And they valued it and wrote about it, looking back to the Roman Republic, to Cicero, and to the ways in which the Roman Republic eventually was destroyed by a lack of virtue. And so that they had models in their minds, and I'm suggesting as a historian, that without that commitment to honor and virtue, it's very unlikely that the American Republic would have survived. And is it important today? Well, I think we we give uh, a great deal of lip service to the principle of honor and virtue. And I think that certain candidates in the campaign, like, say, Senator McCain, um, committed acts that were, would be regarded as virtuous by our 18th century predecessors. I mean, advocating uh, campaign finance reform in the face of his own party uh, and a Congress that really uh, is opposed to it and insisting on that as a, as a basic premise and trying to remove that source of corruption from the political process, that would have been a virtuous act in the 18th or the 20th century. So it's not dead and gone, but I think that the display of virtue as it occurred in the late 18th century often leads to political defeat. After all, in the end, McCain didn't win. John Adams' most uh, virtuous act, probably, was to insist that we not go to war against uh, France or England in the late 1790s. Because he took that position and it was unpopular, he was defeated. Virtuous acts are often unpopular at the time. They're interested back then in what's in the public interest, not the popular interest. And the public interest is the long-term interest of the republic. When you do that as a modern politician, when you act in the long-term interest, you often end up not getting reelected. And now there's the third interest, the private interest, now that we're in corporate America. Well, I mean, I think that that would not have been unrecognizable to 18th century figures. Jefferson and Madison both were highly critical of New England merchants and the role that they had on the shaping of the Federalist policies in the 1790s. So even back then, they didn't have PACs. They didn't have lobbyists in quite the same sense of the term. But the uh, Republican Party, that is Jefferson's party, believed that most of Hamilton's financial plan was uh, very much under the influence of investment bankers. Today we frequently have a tarnished view of politicians, not as leaders or as visionaries or, or in the public interest. Can you talk about that? There's a you know, wonderful quotation it... from Henry Adams, who was the great-grandson of John Adams um, and the grandson of uh, John Quincy. Um, and John and John Quincy were the first father-son presidents before Mr. And, uh, George W. And, and George Bush. But Henry Adams, writing in the 1870s, said, you know, if you look at the history of the American presidency in a kind of panoramic way, you've got to conclude that Charles Darwin got it exactly backwards, Um, namely that we are in a kind of descent instead of an ascent, and that the political leadership at the beginning of the republic is, uh, is much more lustrous than anything now. And I think that a lot of people who read Founding Brothers would would second that conclusion, looking at the political leadership of the United States at the dawn of the 21st century. I'm not sure that's completely fair to either Mr. Or to Mr. Bush, let's say, the, the current president. Um, I mean, because what we're doing is comparing um, late 18th century figures who have now become icons and who are on Mount Rushmore and who have statues to them uh, on the Tidal Basin or in the Mall against uh, people who, who knows? I mean, it's possible 200 years from now that, that George W. Bush might have a statue to him in Washington. That said, in the end, uh, Joe Ellis thinks that the level of, of talent and the level of uh, public virtue that was displayed at the beginning, we shall not see their likes again. In some sense, that was a single moment that can never be repeated because of the pressures and the critical issues that were being faced. The crisis forced greatness to the top. Um, and in American history, when we do face really serious crises, let's say the Civil War or the Depression, The political culture does tend to toss up people who respond to that crisis and become great. Abraham Lincoln and Franklin Delano Roosevelt are usually listed as two of the three greatest presidents in American history, along with George Washington. So it's a political culture which doesn't usually need greatness and doesn't usually get it. We're in a moment like that now. But when and if crisis emerges or appears, it's capable of throwing up to the top people who respond to the crisis and become great. Did any of our founding brothers have a motivation, however small, for power and or money? Power over money. Um, I think that all of them had a 
craving for power and for a place in the history books. I think that it's no accident that Thomas Jefferson started saving all of his letters in 1778, and John Adams wrote to Abigail in 1776 that start buying big leather folio volumes to save all my correspondence. They were aware of the fact that they were present at a propitious moment, present at the creation. In some sense, towards the end of their careers, when Adams and Jefferson are corresponding with each other in those marvelous exchanges between 1812 and 1826, they're writing to us as much as they are to each other. They're aware of the fact that we're going to be sitting here talking about them 200 years later. And it's their craving for a place in history and for the capacity to exercise power at this incredibly critical moment that distinguishes them all. But in terms of seeking money, Adams said that those who really seek money are just after a cheaper form of currency. The highest form of currency is real fame, and fame can only be achieved by acting in the public interest, not just building up your own bank account. It must have been thrilling to read their letters. Well, their letters are the basis of the book. And, I mean, I'm a historian who thinks that reading the correspondence of these people is like one of the most thrilling things that you can do. And we also ought to call attention to the fact that most of these projects that have saved their correspondence and are currently publishing them in modern editions, uh, you know, those are, those are the projects that have made the book I've written possible. It, it, just take the Adams correspondence. Um, uh, is, uh, if you put it on microfilm and stretched it out, it would go six miles. Um, it's an incredible correspondence. And when Jefferson got up every day of the, uh, of the week, even in retirement, he went to his writing desk at 5.30 in the morning and wrote until 9 o'clock. And in one year, he counted up the number of letters he wrote, and he wrote 1,021 letters. I'm afraid that email might very well prevent subsequent historians from recovering what is being said and done now, because cyberspace goes away. Not to mention the content. Well, I'm worried about the way in which email makes all of us express ourselves in language that is less deliberate and less precise and, in the end, less interesting. And hardly courteous. <laughs> Sometimes that, too. <laughs> People don't say dear anymore or hello. Yeah, they, Jefferson and Adams always address themselves in letters, my dear sir. Yeah. Now, can you talk about Abigail Adams? Was her relationship as a political partner of her husband unique to the times, and are there any contemporary examples today? I think Abigail Adams was a unique person. I mean, in other words, there were no other women who exercised the same level of power in the national level that she did. I think there were other educated women who were capable of it. I think that Mercy Otis Warren in Massachusetts and Theodosia Burr, the daughter of Aaron Burr, highly educated, extremely intelligent, very uh, well-informed women, but that Abigail was the one who, by virtue of her marriage to John, both in foreign policy in France and England and then back as vice president and president in the United States, had the opportunity to actually shape policy. And I think that the two other first ladies in subsequent American history that resemble her are Franklin Roosevelt's wife, Eleanor, and Hillary Clinton. Before there was Hillary, there was Abigail. And in fact, I think that Abigail's influence on John Adams was greater than uh, Eleanor's on Roosevelt or Hillary's on Bill Clinton. And I think that Abigail Adams was Adams's one woman cabinet. He didn't listen to anybody else but her on many occasions. And not always uh, to his advantage, I'm afraid. I mean, I think we can we can't blame the Alien and Sedition Acts on Abigail Adams, but she argued strenuously with her husband that he should sign those, those pieces of legislation, even though he had serious doubts about it. But she was a force. And again, we've got the correspondence between them that shows what kind of relationship they had. And it was really a partnership marriage in which political issues blended neatly and, and seamlessly, really, with the discussion of how to raise children and their mutual affection towards one another. She was lucky to have escaped the sharks of the press. They didn't completely leave her alone, though they tended to focus on her husband, and she was like a lioness protecting her, her lair. Whenever the press came after John, um, in her private correspondence, she went after them. That's one of the reasons she favored the Sedition Act. She wanted to get a lot of these newspaper editors who were attacking her husband thrown in jail. Now, your book does a fair job of creating a collective impact of six men's lives. Of those six men... Was one the greater leader, and did one leave a greater legacy than the other? I think that um, the thrust of the uh, book that I've just written is to say that that's an inappropriate question, although I'll try to answer it anyway, because what I'm suggesting is that what makes this generation great and so abidingly significant is that it functioned as a collective, that no single individual could have successfully done what, what they did as a group. And there's a kind of we we're familiar with the doctrine of checks and balances in the Constitution. There is a kind of ideological and characterological checks and balances within the personalities of the revolutionary generation as they complement, check, collide, and collude with one another. That said, each of them brought specific strengths, and if there was any one of them who was truly indispensable, 
without whom the project could have probably not succeeded. It's the obvious choice. It's George Washington. Without Washington, it's entirely possible that no matter who else was there, that this experiment would have failed at the very start. After Washington, I think if you ask the founding generation itself to rate its members, the person who would have ended up second might surprise it would be Franklin. Franklin was regarded as second only to Washington in terms of his wisdom, in terms of his, uh, if you, and if you were to take a photograph of any significant moment from the American Revolution all the way up to the foundation of the, of the government, Franklin would be in almost every picture. Uh, if you asked me who would have the highest SATs, it would be Alexander Hamilton. If you asked me who is the most colorful, who is the most candid, who is the most insightful into human nature, I would say it's Adams. If you were to ask me who is the great rhetorician, who has the sort of most seductive vision for America and its future, that's got to be Thomas Jefferson. And if you ask me who is the person who uh, managed the details so capably, the tactician, if God were in the details, it would be James Madison who would greet him upon arrival. So each of them brought a, a special set of talents and skills. I'm trying to succinctly summarize them, but I'm suggesting it's the dynamic uh, collective as a whole that succeeds. And the equality among them. Yes, I mean, I think that if by equality we mean that they took each other seriously. And, um, I mean, well, think about this. You know, Alexander Hamilton was born as a bastard, literally, in uh, the Caribbean and was an orphan. And Thomas Jefferson was born on a plantation with 200 slaves. Um, Washington himself had a substantial plantation um, that, and inherited um, about 300 slaves. So that there's not social and economic or background equality. What makes them equal is they were present at the creation together, and their revolutionary credentials is what they regarded as the most important thing. Have you ever wanted to run for office or work in an advisorial capacity in politics? I've not given it any serious thought. Um, I think that um, I wouldn't be willing to have my own personal life put through the kind of scrutiny that public figures nowadays have to. I mean, I probably couldn't withstand it. I'm sure your life is impeccable. Well, I don't think it is, I'm afraid. <laughs> and, but I, I, I do enjoy trying to connect the past to ongoing things up here in the present and playing a role not uh, as, a, as an office holder or even as a, an advisor to people at the national level, but as a person who helps the American public think about the relationship between what we're doing here at this moment in time and, and how and what way it can be informed by precedents in the past. I have a revolutionary question for you. Is capitalism poised or does it have the potential to take over or to uproot democracy? In the end, I think that capitalism and democracy go together and that in some sense you can't have one without the other, that they, that doesn't mean that they are completely compatible at all times, but it means that the basic principle underlying political democracy and economic capitalism is a belief in the sovereignty of the individual and, that, and the highest priority being given to the free expression of that individual's energies and opinions. And those are the two central principles that this revolutionary generation established and it is the – now, the, the democratic principle also suggests that equality is a, a competing value with freedom, and capitalism tends to produce not equality but inequality. Um, that's why in the 20th century we get the New Deal to keep trying to level out the playing field. But the argument between those principles of equality and freedom is in some sense the American argument. And so we're, they're hoisted together, they're, they're fused at the hip – and they're going to keep being together. And right now, they have together made the United States the unquestioned political, economic, military, and cultural power in the world. As long as we keep some sense of virtue. As long as we keep some sense of virtue. And these guys back there in the past are people that you can go back and find out what it really meant. Well, I'm going to ask you just a couple of questions about your life as a writer now, if that's all right. Okay. And one is, what has been the happiest result of your having written this book and its success? A feeling that other people who read it appreciate what I'm trying to do and get fulfilled and want to learn more about American history. The notion that, though I would like to believe that I'm a scholar who has his scholarly I's dotted and T's crossed, that, that I'm writing to a group of educated Americans who are really hungry to learn about the American past, and the success of the book suggests that I'm not totally deluded in thinking that. Has the success changed your life in any substantial way? I've tried not to have that happen, no. I mean, I still drive my 10-year-old to school every morning in the same 12-year-old car, and I still go to teach students at Mount Holyoke College four days a week. Uh, I'm old enough now to, uh, I think, have some ballast about this, and um, I do enjoy the opportunity that the book is, has created to speak in public venues and to appear in various 
um, television or radio programs and comment, though at times it creates a flurry of requests that are difficult to handle as politely as I'd like. And you are very polite to record at books, I might add. Oh, thank you. Has there been any interest in doing something with a PBS station with it, for instance? I think that there are several uh, groups that are uh, bidding on the book for the film rights. Um, thus far, we haven't made a decision about that. I'm not even sure I can imagine or foresee how you could make this into a successful feature film, but there was a series that ran on History Channel called Founding Fathers, and they, they did ads for that program, which will repeat soon again, I believe. And the ads, they, they selected pictures which were pretty much the same ones I picked for my book, and a lot of people thought that the ads for this program were ads for my book, and I think I benefited from that a great deal. Would you like to write full-time? Um, I would like to write full-time for a time and then go back to teaching and then write full-time and go back to teaching. I'd like the interplay of isolation and then interaction with people. And in fact, the classes that I teach are often opportunities for me to rehearse and to try out ideas. The, the Adams-Jefferson correspondence, I've taught that several times at Mount Holyoke College and at Amherst. And often I'm trying out phrases and, and ideas in classroom situations that eventually find their way onto the, the printed page. Are you a Southerner by birth? I'm from Virginia. Um, I believe that's a Southerner. And um, my wife is actually from Mississippi. That, that really makes us a Southern family. Um, and if you get me on the phone with folk from Virginia, I can start talking even more Southern every day. <laughs> but no, most of the time, I've lost at least most of my accent um, and have been in New England now for over 30 years. And you write your books with a pen. Is that true? That's right. It's not a quill pen, though I might move to that just to be contrary. Um, um, it, and it's not a dip pen. Um, I think that some writers that I know use a, a, a bottle of ink and a dip pen. It's a I use a medium uh, roller ball black ink pen. Uh, I cannot compose on a computer. There's something about the, and I don't necessarily regard that as a, as a sign of my strength or of my talent. I, I wish I could, but there's something about writing and the tactile expression of the, the words on the paper and the cadences and the fluidity of, of muscle movement with the hand is connected to the flow of the words in my head. And what are you working on today or right now? Right now I'm talking to you and I'm sitting around waiting for an epiphany. Um, <laughs> uh, I'm laying fallow until I talk to my editor at Canop, who's the salt of the earth, Ash Green, and, and uh, I've said, Ash, you and I need to sit down and have lunch. I've got about three or four ideas um, and you and I need to decide which of them is the is the right one by the time the Red Sox open at Fenway on April 1st. And um, That's a good deadline. And it's, a, it's a close enough, but enough to give me a little bit of space. I don't want to rest on my laurels too long. I think that I need to be uh, involved in a kind of day-by-day -day, uh, fashion in a major project, or else I begin to drive my wife and kids crazy. And it will be about the American Revolution, your field of expertise? It's possible that it won't. I, I'm thinking that I, I, I could do something that, that goes back there again, and, and I'm thinking about Franklin as a figure that I haven't written about and who's in some sense, as I've said, one of the most interesting, if not the most interesting of them all. Um, but I'm also thinking of a book called The Summer of 65, 1965, and the way in which the militarization of the Vietnam War, the welfare bill, the health care bill, uh, the civil rights bill all happened at the same moment. And, uh, and how that cacophony of things came about. Well, that would be fascinating. It would. It's a little threatening to me because it's not history in the full sense of the term as Joe Ellis has come to understand it. And, um, and it's, it's a moment that I remember myself uh, as, a, as a live human being who was facing uh, military service at that time. And I think that as a result, it's, it's, uh, it would be a different course for me. You'd have living sources. I would go interview people. Right. And I've, I've done that once before. I, in, uh, about, some time ago, I wrote a book about modern West Point called School for Soldiers in conjunction with another author called Robert Moore. And we interviewed about 130 people for that book. Um, so it's not totally alien to me. But um, in some sense, my own heart and soul was back there in the late 18th century. And, and I, I, on the one hand, I don't want to abandon that heart and soul. On the other hand, I don't want to keep repeating myself. Well, maybe it will inform 1965. Maybe so. Well, I'd like to thank you for visiting with us today, Professor Ellis. It was a great pleasure. My pleasure, Denise. And we look forward to your next book in print and in audio. Thank you so much. Thank you, too, to our listeners for joining us today. For Recorded Books, this is Denise Longto. You've been listening to The Author Talks, a conversation with Joseph J. Ellis. Recorded Books is pleased to offer an unabridged recording of Founding Brothers, narrated by Nelson Runger. You'll find a wide selection of titles on cassette and CD in the Recorded Books catalog, so call us toll-free by using the telephone number found on this package. 
On our website, you can browse the catalog, hear about the latest releases, place orders, or tune into narrator profiles and other author interviews, so visit us there at www.recordedbooks.com. And thank you for being a Recorded Books reader.